This video is brought to you by BoardGamePrices.com. Find the best prices for board games at BoardGamePrices.com. Hello and welcome to Seven Wonders Duel in about three minutes. It is a game for two players. There is no official solo mode. Playing time is around 30 minutes. It is a relatively simple game. In ancient times, two civilizations are locked in competition to determine whose legacy will be the greatest. Will you raise the pyramids? Or will your nation be crushed by your opponent's scientific genius or military might? Players alternate turns picking available cards and playing them. These cards represent industry, manufacturing, trade, civil buildings, science, warfare, and most importantly, the seven wonders of the world. The game is won by the civilization with the most points at the end of the game. These come from a variety of sources, but are represented on cards by the laurel symbol. You can also win immediately if your civilization has enough pairs of matching science symbols, or if you advance the military track all the way to the end. Competitive. The two players are competing civilizations, and only one can win. Engine Builder. You will need to select cards that work well together in order to win the game. Point Salad. There are many different ways to score points in this game. Player Turn. The game is played in three ages, and the cards are set up in a specific order for each age. This is the layout of cards for age one. On your turn, you will select one of the available cards to play. You must pay the cost shown on the left-hand side of the card in order to play it. You gain the benefits shown at the top of the card. For example, this card costs one gold to play, and gains you one wood resource, which could be used to play this card. Resources like wood, clay and glass are permanent upgrades to your empire and are not expended when used. Some cards will have symbols on them. That means that at a later age, if you select a card with that symbol, you may play it without paying its costs. If you're short of resources to play a card, you can pay gold to cover the shortfall. But if your opponent has that resource in their empire, the costs will increase dramatically. You can also select a card and discard it. That gains you two gold plus one gold per gold building in your empire. In order to build a wonder, you must pay its cost as shown, but you must also take a card from the display and place it under the wonder. Military cards advance the military track, which is worth victory points and may harm your opponent's economy. If you ever gain two science cards with the same symbol, you gain one of the science tokens and its associated benefits. Once you have picked your card, you flip over any uncovered cards so they may be selected. Players alternate play of cards until the age ends. They then proceed to the next age, concluding the game at the end of age three. Why would you like this game? It's a very fast-paced dueling game with next to no luck, and it's an incredibly good niche for a game to be in. It's in a very small box, so it can be taken all over the place, and the play area is small and set up is pretty painless, so it makes for a great filler or travel game. The layout system for the game is interesting and makes for some good decisions about whether or not you uncover a card. And the theme is very easy for people to identify with and associate it with the mechanics of the game. The single best thing about the game is the playtime. It's hard to pack more game into 30 minutes than Seven Wonders Jewel does. However, sometimes the game can feel a little on rails, especially if players are short on money and are being forced to discard cards for cash. And multiple plays with the same player can lead to a feeling of sameness in the game, as the card sets don't change much between each play. For a game that is also great two-player, but is even more portable, I recommend Mintworks. And if you like the ideas of Seven Wonders Duel or want a multiplayer game, pick up the original Seven Wonders. Hello and welcome to Seven Wonders in about three minutes. It is a game for three to seven players. There is no official solo mode. Playing time is around 30 to 60 minutes. It is a relatively simple game. Across the ancient world, there are many great wonders under construction. The Pyramids, the Colossus, and of course, Halicarnassus B. The civilizations are interconnected and trade with each other, sharing knowledge and goods, as well as insults and war. You will build infrastructure, science, and the weapons of war. But most importantly, you will construct your wonder and use its unique abilities to become the greatest civilization of the ancient world. This game is won by the civilization with the most points at the end of the game. These come from a variety of sources, but are represented on cards by the laurels. Competitive. The players are all competing civilizations and only one can be the greatest. Card drafting. Each turn you will have a hand of cards, you will select one and pass the rest on to another player. Point salad. There are many different ways to score points in this game. Player turn. At the start of the game, you will be assigned a wonder. Each of them is unique and has its own advantages and power. Each wonder has an A and a B side, and the B sides are slightly more complex to use. The game is played in three ages, and each age uses a different deck of cards. Each player is dealt seven cards from the age deck, and at this point it is almost mandatory to complain that your hand of cards either has no good ones or that they are all good. You then select one card to play and hand the cards you did not pick to the next player along. As the age goes on, the hand of cards you receive will get progressively smaller. To play a card, you must pay the cost shown on the left-hand side of the card. 
you gain the benefits shown at the top of the card. For example, this card costs one gold to play and gains you one stone or one wood resource. Resources like wood, clay and glass are permanent upgrades to your empire and are not expended when used. Some cards will have the name of another card on them. That means that in a later age, if you select that card, you may play it without paying its costs. If you are short of resources, you can pay gold to cover the shortfall, but only if the players to your left or right have that resource and they get the money you spend. You can also select the card and discard it for three coins. Wonders are built in stages, and each stage must be built in order. You must have the resources and place one card from your hand under the wonder to show it is built. At the end of each age, you get seven new cards, and the player you hand the cards to changes direction. The game ends at the end of the third age. Why would you like this game? Seven Wonders is a modern classic and one of the most owned modern board games, and for good reason. It's simple enough that most people can pick it up and play, while being deep enough that it feels rewarding when you win. The card drafting mechanic is great and causes a lot of agonizing and painful decisions. There is also a good amount of interaction with the players to your left and right as you wage wars with them, trade with them, and try to keep good cards away from them. The single best thing about this game is that it scales very well to the number of players. As almost all actions are simultaneous, a seven player game takes not much longer than a three player one. However, it is quite hard to keep track of the scores during the game and sometimes you can be really surprised by who the winner turns out to be. And that can be off-putting to some players. Also, if you make poor decisions in age one, it can really leave you struggling for the whole game. If you like card drafting, but want a bigger and deeper game, I recommend playing Terraforming Mars with the optional card drafting rules. And if you like the ideas of Seven Wonders, but want a two-player game, I recommend Seven Wonders Duel. Hello and welcome to the 51st State Master Set in around three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 60 to 90 minutes. It is a moderately mm. complex game. In the aftermath of the apocalypse, humanity attempts to rise from the ashes of North America. 30 years after the war ended, you are one of the new powers trying to create a domain within the ruins. You must trade, build, and conquer your way to becoming the 51st state. The winner is the state with the most points at the end of the game. The game ends the turn one player reaches 25 victory points. But the person who triggered the end might not always be the winner. Points are gained by upgrading buildings and using special actions. If a card has a star on it like this, it's part of your path to victory. Competitive. Each player represents one competing fledgling state. Card drafting. Players draft cards from an open pool. Engine building. Your state must work efficiently and effectively. Player turn. Deal out a number of cards face up equal to the players plus one. The first player picks one card and so on. Then repeat that process, but the players pick in reverse order. Players then gain production based on their faction's defaults, deals they have, and any production cards. The main resources are iron, guns, fuel, and bricks, with ammo being a wildcard resource. Players then alternate taking actions until they all pass. The main way to interact with cards in this game are contacts, which come in three colors. You must spend a number of contacts equal to a card's distance to use it. Blue contacts allow you to make a deal. Flip the card over and slot it under the deal space at the top of your state. You gain that resource and will gain it every turn from now on. Grey contacts allow you to build. Add the card to your state and gain the benefits listed. If it is a production card, gain that production immediately. Red contacts allow you to blow something up. Gain the spoil shown on the card and add the card face down to your state. This is some empty land you can develop later. Developing requires brick or a development token and allows you to upgrade a region and score a victory point. The region must either be a ruin or share one location type in common in order to be upgraded. For the most part, production regions produce resources, features give bonuses, and action regions allow you to score victory points. You can also spend two workers to get one of these connection cards for bonus contacts, take actions from your state sheet, and attack other players' buildings with red contacts, but that requires a lot of contacts. Why would you like this game? It's a pretty straightforward engine builder with a simple card-based core game system. It's easy to learn, but there is certainly some depth there. The cards look nice and the resource tokens are very, very nifty. There's also two expansion packs in the master set that add extra cards that can change up the game. It also has an excellent and funny English language rulebook. The single best thing about this game is the multi-use card system. While there's quite a lot of information on each card, it works really well and gives you a lot of options during the game. However, it is one of those engine builders that ends just as soon as you feel like the game is gearing up. The theme works, and while the art is solid, the whole setting feels very much 
typical post-apocalypse. If the mechanics of this game sound great, but you are not sold on the theme, I recommend Imperial Settlers. The game uses the same core engine, but has a lighter, brighter theme and art. And if cards, factions, and the post-apocalypse sound great, I recommend Arctic Scavengers. Hello and welcome to Anachrony in about three minutes. Anachrony is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 30 minutes per player. Anachrony is a complex mm. game. In the distant future, Earth is hit by a colossal meteorite that devastates the planet. Among the ruins, the survivors find Neutronium, a rare metal that can be used in time travel. Using this rare resource, they notify their ancestors that the meteor is coming. Each player plays an ideological group competitive. Players are competing for resources and only one can win, worker placement. Players take actions placing units on spaces and gaining the associated advantages. Engine building. Players build an interconnecting system of upgrades throughout the game. Winning the game. The winner is the faction with the most victory points at the end of the game. Points are scored many different ways, including increasing your morale, time travel, building facilities in your base, public objectives, and gathering the required supplies you need in order to evacuate when the meteorite hits. Player turn. Roll for Paradox. The player with the most items on the timeline in each era rolls the dice, gaining Paradox equal to the roll. Every three Paradox are turned into an anomaly, which occupies a spot on your board and costs you victory points. Players take turn powering up suits. Normally three are available for free, and additional ones cost one power each. You then warp resources from the future. If you need some Neutronium now, you can get your descendants to send some back to you. Think of this like a loan from the future that you will have to pay back at some point, but also an opportunity to earn time travel points. Players take actions in turn order. Actions on the board include gathering minerals, building new buildings, recruiting workers, and doing research. Each of these spaces is limited to one power suit with one worker inside. Some workers are better suited for certain roles. For example, engineers give you a discount on building. Trading and gaining water also uses power suits, but any number can occupy these spaces. You can also use buildings inside your base without a suit. Some buildings do not require workers at all. Buildings are the only way to remove debt from the timeline. This building allows you to move your focus back one era and remove one warp marker, paying the cost in the process. Finally, once all players have passed, reclaim your suits and reset the board. Why would you like this game? Anachrony is a wonderful looking game. I can't recommend the exosuit expansion pictured here enough. They really complement the game and make it much more visually pleasing. It's also an excellent example of the worker placement genre with a lot of options and paths to victory. Each faction has two board sides and two leaders, each with different powers and abilities and the building pools and superpowers have a great deal of variety. If you like games with a lot of ways to score points and that don't require direct conflict, then this game could be for you. The single best thing about the game is the Chronobot. The Chronobot is a solo player mode and it plays like an actual opponent. So if you really want to play in Acrony and no one is around, the Chronobot will always be there to challenge you. However, this is an expensive game and it doesn't feel complete without the Exosuit expansion, which is an additional cost. It's also very busy and there are a lot of mechanics and systems to learn, so it might be overwhelming for some players. For other great examples of games in the worker placement genre, I recommend Caverna or Viticulture Essential Edition. Hello and welcome to Architects of the West Kingdom in about three minutes. Part of our program to promote New Zealand gaming, review copy used. It is a game for one to five players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 60 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. It's about 1850 AD in the Carolingian Empire of Chuck the Great, also known as Charlemagne. You're all aspiring nobles looking to make a name for yourself. A town is under construction and needs buildings, workers, and most importantly, a cathedral to be built. But only one of you can become the greatest architect architect the West Kingdom has ever known. The game ends once all building slots have been used up, and this changes based on the number of players. When the last building is placed, you have one more full round, and the winner is the player with the most points. Points come from virtues, constructing buildings, building the cathedral, and a few other sources. Competitive. Each player is competing to become the greatest architect. Worker placement. Each turn you will place a worker in a location and gain the associated benefits. Player turn. A basic turn consists of you placing a single worker at a location on the board. 
The major point of difference between this game and other worker placement games is there is no refresh phase where you take your workers off the board. All workers stay in play until game effects move them. However, you have 20 workers. In general, the more workers you have on one spot, the more powerful the benefits are. For example, if you place one worker on the quarry, you gain one ore. But here, where you are placing a third worker to gain wood, you gain three wood. Resources are used to build things like this well. Place a worker in the build slot and pay the resources shown on the card. You then gain the benefits at the bottom of the card as well as the victory points shown on the top right. You can also build the cathedral, paying the cost shown and gaining victory points and a benefit card, but only one person can build the final step. You can gain assistants who grant buffs and new building plans at the workshop. Virtue is shown on the tracker at the left of the board. Some actions will increase your virtue, like building the cathedral, whereas others, like robbing the tax stand, will reduce it. The black market allows you to gain powerful bonuses affordably, but when the market spaces are filled, those workers are arrested, and the player with most workers in jail gains a debt. To remove workers from the board, you go to the town center and arrest them. Each worker allows you to target another player at the same location. Take these workers and place them on your player board. You can then take them to the guardhouse and sell them for silver. The guardhouse is also where you reclaim your own workers. Why would you like this game? Architects of the West Kingdom is a fascinating take on the worker placement genre and is quite unlike any other game I've played. The constant placement of workers and the capture reclaim workers mechanic encourages player interaction. If you're concerned about the red player getting five wood a turn, take an action to stop that and get rewarded for doing so. This is not a multiplayer solitaire game and you will need to keep an eye on your opponents. I like that the faction cards are double-sided, with one side being a level playing field for all players and the other side having variable player powers. The game also has a lot of variety with a larger selection of buildings and the assistance you can hire. The best thing about this game is the innovative worker placement system. No resets means very little downtime and game maintenance. However, with a dozen action spaces, some with multiple actions, there is a lot going on in this game and it might be a bit overwhelming for some players. It's also a game that benefits from a quick tempo and a player who gets analysis paralysis easily may cause the game to grind to a crawl. In many ways, this game has a similar look and feel to Raiders of the North Sea, so I recommend checking that out as well. And thematically, it shares a lot in common with Pillars of the Earth, a more traditional worker placement game. Architects of the West Kingdom, worker placement on speed. Hello and welcome to Architects of the West Kingdom Solo Mode in about 3 minutes. Part of our program to promote New Zealand gaming, review copy used. This is the solo only review. Playing time is around 30 to 60 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. It's about 850 AD in the Carolingian Empire of Shalaman, and you are an aspiring noble looking to make a name for themselves. A town is under construction. It needs buildings, workers, and most importantly, a cathedral to be built. However, you are not the only noble with designs on making a name for themselves. You must battle against this enemy clad in black and become the greatest architect the West Kingdom has ever known. The game ends once all building slots have been used up. In the solo game, that's 12 buildings. You win if you score more points than the AI opponent. Points come from being virtuous, constructing buildings, building the cathedral, and a few other sources. Worker placement. Each turn you will place a worker in a location and gain the associated benefits. Automata. Your opponent is an AI deck of cards. Player turn. A basic turn consists of you taking taking one action to place a worker, and then turning over an AI card and resolving its effects. The main point of difference between this game and other worker placement games is there is no refresh phase where you take your workers off the board. All workers stay in play until game effects move them. However, you have 20 workers. There are a lot of spaces to place workers, so I won't cover them all. But in general, the more workers you have on one spot, the more powerful the benefits are. For example, if you place one worker on the quarry, you gain one ore. But here, where you are placing a third worker to gain wood, you gain three wood. Resources are used to build things, like this well. You place a worker in the build slot and pay the resources shown on the card. You then gain the benefits at the bottom of the card, as well as the victory points shown in the top right. You can also build the cathedral, paying the cost shown and gaining VPs in a benefit card, but only one player can build the final step. You gain assistants, who give you bonuses when you use a location, and new building plans at the workshop. Virtue is shown on the tracker on the left of the board. Some actions will increase your virtue, others, like the black market or robbing the tax stand, will decrease it. To remove workers from the board, you go to the town center and arrest them. Take those workers and place them on your player board. You can then take them to the guardhouse and sell them for silver. The guardhouse is also where you reclaim your own workers back to your board. The AI player acts by turning over a card. Follow the instructions as described. The AI deck also
also gets more powerful as the game progresses, as cards are added to it from an upgrade deck. Play until the final building slot is complete. Why would you like this game? Architects of the West Kingdom is a fascinating take on the worker placement genre, and quite unlike any other game I've played. The constant placement of workers and their movement around the board allows you to settle into a great rhythm with this game, and playing it feels a bit like a sparring match with the AI, as you place and then check to see their response. And the AI doesn't stuff about either. It will arrest your workers, build the cathedral, steal the best stuff from the black market, and genuinely acts like an annoying opponent. The game also has a lot of variety within the large selection of different buildings and assistants you can hire. A good example of that variety is these two seemingly identical characters at first glance, who actually give different benefits. The best thing about this game is the innovative worker placement system. No resets means very little downtime and game maintenance. However, with a dozen action spaces, some with multiple actions, there is a lot going on in this game, and that might be a bit overwhelming to some players. Getting your head around a good strategy will take you a couple of plays. It's not that the game is complex mechanically, but all the interactions and the best path to victory is. In some ways, this game could be considered the fourth game in the North Sea trilogy, and I recommend checking out Raiders of the North Sea as well. Hello and welcome to Arctic Scavengers with HQ and Recon in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is just under one hour. It is a relatively simple game. It's 2097 and climate change has ruined the planet, causing massive weather upheavals and plunging the world into a dark and deadly ice age. In the frozen ruins, groups of survivors band together into tribes and fight over what scarce and valuable resources remain. In order to win, you must build up your tribe through conflict, recruiting and hunting. The winner is the player at the end of the game with the largest tribe. Competitive. Players represent a tribal leader and are in conflict with each other. Deck Builder. Players start the game with a basic deck of cards and improve it through play. Secret Orders Each player contributes to the skirmish phase by placing cards face down. Player Turn All players draw 5 cards, and if you run out of cards, you reshuffle your discard pile and continue drawing. The first player is called the Initiator and starts the round. They also look at the top card of the contested resources pile. When it is your turn, you can play cards to do any and all of the following actions, once each. Draw, dig, hunt, or hire. Once a card is used for an action, it is discarded. Cards come in two main types, people and tools. Tools must be used of a person who has the skill already and they work as a booster. Draw allows you to draw extra cards to your hand, in this case, two. Dig allows you to look at a number of cards from the junk pile equal to your dig score. Put one card in your discard pile and put the others on the bottom of the junk deck. Hunt allows you to gather food that is used in hiring. Hire allows you to add one card to your discard pile from those available. Cards cost food, medicine, or a combination of the two. Once you have done these actions, you declare how many cards you have for the skirmish phase and the next player acts. The skirmish phase happens at the end of each full round and players compare the total fight values of the cards they kept back. The winner takes the top contested resource in secret to their discard pile. The initiator moves to the next player, and a new turn begins. Why would you like this game? Deck builders are a very interesting and popular form of game, and I recommend gamers give at least one a go. A common criticism of that genre is they have low player interaction, but that is one of the strengths of Arctic Scavengers. The skirmish in particular has you contesting for resources, and the act of declaring how many cards you have for the skirmish leads to a lot of gambling, bluffing, and risk taking. It's also fast paced and the card design and ability to take multiple different actions makes for meaningful decisions each turn. The best thing about this game is the level of customization available. There is a lot of content in the game and you can tune it to suit your needs and wants. However, the theme is very bleak and the card art is dour and somber and there is a slight joylessness to the setting. The solo play mode is not very good either. It also stands in the shadow of Dominion the undisputed king of deck builders that Arctic Scavengers borrows heavily from. If you want to play a deck builder, I recommend checking out Dominion as well. And if you want to try a deck builder, but want a better solo or cooperative experience, I recommend Legendary Encounters Alien. Hello and welcome to Argent the Consortium in about three minutes. It is a game for two to five players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around two to three hours. It's a pretty complex game. The Chancellor of Argent University of Magic is stepping down and a secret cabal of powerful wizards is deciding who will be their replacement. You are one of the senior members of the faculty and you have only a few days to amass supporters, power and influence in order to demonstrate to the consortium that you are the logical choice to lead the university. The winner of this game is the player with the most votes at the 
end of the game. Most of the voters' identities are hidden at the start of the game, and you will discover what they want as the game progresses. The game ends after five or six rounds. Competitive. There can only be one Chancellor at Argent. Worker placement. Placing mages in room spaces gains your resources and power. Engine building. Supporters, spells, and treasures can be combined to make powerful combinations of effects. Player turn. At the start of the game, select a character. Take their starter spell, two wizards matching their color, and three others of your choice. Place one mark on a voter. That allows you to privately look at them. Every time you place a mark, you choose a new voter to examine. The main resources in this game are money, mana, merit badges, marks, mages, intelligence, and wisdom. Your turn consists of an optional fast action and one main action. Fast actions have this symbol, and they must be done before you take your main action. Placing a mage is an action, but you will normally not gain the benefits of that placement until the end of the round. Spaces with this symbol require you to have a merit badge to use them. And these slots here are for shadowing mages, which you can do with spells and effects. Each different type of mage also has a special ability. For example, planar mages can be placed as a fast action. You can also cast a spell as an action, paying the mana cost and tapping it. You can use supporters or treasure. Use supporters and consumable treasures, go to your personal discard and count at the end of the game for scoring. Finally, you can claim a bell tower card as an action. And when the last card is picked, the round is over. You then activate each room starting at the top left, working across and down. The player with the mage at each spot gains the benefits listed. For example, six gold or three mana. Mages in regular slots resolve before ones in shadow slots. Merit badge slots require you to use that merit badge for this round. Spells can be learned using research by placing intelligence on that spell. Spells can also be powered up using wisdom and research. Supporters, basic resources, influence, marks, and treasures are all gained from rooms. If this is the last turn, turn over each voter one at a time and calculate who has the most of the resource the voter is after. The person with the most total votes wins. Why would you like this game? Arjun is a fascinating game with a myriad of possible strategies and paths to victory. It's very much a game for people who like options and emergent strategies. And while it looks complex, the core gameplay is similar enough to most worker placement games that it's easy to teach the basics. The complexity in the game comes from all the interactions and possible decisions to be made. Few games have more customization options than Argent. You can choose from a multitude of rooms to build the university and choose A and B sides of these rooms, as well as a dozen different characters. Even the wizards themselves are double-sided. The best thing about this game is the sheer level of interaction and crazy effects. No other worker placement game I've played allows you to rearrange other people's workers or blow up entire rooms. However, there is a lot going on and this game can be easily overwhelming, but for new players who could find the game too much to take in, and for experienced players who may struggle to decide on an action with so many options available. It's also a game where players mess with each other, and if you don't like the idea of having your major sent to hospital by a fireball, this game won't be for you. For another work placement game with high levels of interaction, check out Architects of the West Kingdom. And if you like the art and style of this game, check out Millennium Blades. Argent the Consortium, Harry Potter and the Game of Thrones. Hello and welcome to Azul in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 2-4 to four players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 30 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. The King of Portugal has returned from a trip to Spain and is thoroughly unimpressed with the state of the Royal Palace of Evora. He summons the best and brightest artists in the land to get to work brightening the place up. In Azul, only one of you can cleverly draft, build the most impressive tile collection and become the master artist of Evora. The winner of this game is to play with the most points at the end. The game ends on the round, any player finishes a horizontal row of tiles. Competitive. Only one player can have the fanciest looking tiles in Portugal. Drafting. Each turn, players will draft tiles from a central pool. Tile laying. This is literally a game about laying tiles. Player turn. At the start of each round, refill the factory displays with four random tiles drawn from the bag. On your turn, you can claim all tiles of one type from one of the factories. The remaining tiles go into the middle of the play area. You can also claim all tiles of one type from the middle. The first player to do so claims the first player marker for next turn. Once you have claimed tiles on your turn, you have to place them on your display. There are five possible rows you can place tiles. Each row can only be used to hold one type of tile. As you claim more tiles, place 
place them alongside matching tiles. You want to collect as many as there are spaces on the display and no more. Once all selections have been made for a round, you need to check your display. If you have enough tiles to fill up a row, remove them and place a matching tile on the tiling area. If you didn't get enough tiles to fill a row, they stay on your display. And if you got too many of a type, they go to the bottom of the board and count as negative points. And here's where Azul gets tricky, as you now cannot place tiles in a row that matches a tile you have on the tiling area. And you must continue unfinished rows. This means that after only one turn, your options are limited to those shown on the left here for each row. Scoring is a bit tricky. A single tile is worth one point. If a tile forms a line, it is worth the total number of tiles in that line. And if it forms both a vertical and horizontal line, score each separately. At the end of the game, vertical lines of five are worth seven points. Having all five of one tile placed is 10 points and a horizontal line is two points, but finishes the game. If the game isn't over, put the used tiles in the box, refill the tile bag if it is ever empty and restock the factory tiles. Why would you like this game? Azul is another of those rare games where the simplicity of the design doesn't really give you an idea of how well it plays. You read the rules and think, oh, this is easy. All I have to do is line up like this each turn. But this will never ever happen because this game has a high level of interaction and drafting to sabotage your opponents is a perfectly valid strategy. The costs of over-selecting tiles in this game are brutal and it means each draft decision has to be calculated and every tile placement has to factor into scoring and later restrictions. The components are very nice to look at and the tiles feel really great in your hands. The best thing about this game is how you have to adapt to the ever decreasing options for placing tiles. The game slowly and surely squeezes you and ups the tension. However, Azul is still an abstract game and no amount of presentation will make it appeal to someone who wants a rollicking adventure or to just throw some dice around for a laugh. And while it's quite simple mechanically, the play with in the game can become quite intense. If you don't like pressure situations or games where other players can mess with you, this one might not be for you. For another abstract game that's very well suited to two players, check out Santorini. And if you want a more complex game with some similar ideas, check out Suburbia. As all. Oh god, I needed that tile! Hello and welcome to Bethel Woods in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. There is no official solo mode, but it can be played solo. Playing time is between 30 and 60 minutes. It is a reasonably simple game. Set in the world of Jesse Ribody's The Hours, Bethel Woods is a remote orphanage for gifted and unusual youngsters. Long ago, a former ward of the orphanage named Seth constructed powerful and unusual machines to keep Bethel Woods safe from sinister outside interference. Now, years later, the machines are beginning to malfunction and the sinister forces begin to encroach on Bethel Woods. In this game, you play one of the young residents of Bethel Woods trying to fix the machines and rebuilding the Dreamweaver device. The game is also a race against time, as you lose if four of the machines are malfunctioning at the same time. Cooperative. Each player is a different resident of Bethel Woods working together to repair the Dreamweaver. Set Collection. Repairing machines gives you knowledge, which is the currency in this game. Player Turn. There are six machines on the board in six different regions. Each machine is numbered from one to six. And when a malfunction token is drawn, it is assigned to the appropriate machine. If a machine ever has four malfunctions on it, flip its assigned damage marker and resolve its effects. Then draw a spy from the spy pile and place them on the appropriately numbered area. Spies count as a malfunction token when determining if a machine is damaged or not. On your turn, you will select one region and take all the workers from it. You can then move clockwise or counterclockwise, leaving one worker in each area as you move. Repeat this process until you're out of workers to place. Each placed worker can fix one malfunction, but it must be the same color as them. The final worker can, if they match one of the colors shown on the orphanage, move to the orphanage and pay a number of knowledge shown on the face down Dreamweaver card to flip it over. The knowledge must be the same type as the worker used. Also, if your final move is in the same region as a spy, you can spend the knowledge shown on the spy to remove them. Once you have finished moving and repairing, if the Dreamweaver is built, you win the game. Otherwise, draw three new malfunctions and play passes to the next player. Why would you like this game? While it is solid as a co-op game, this game really shines as a solo puzzle game where you play two characters by yourself. And what a wonderfully elegant puzzle it is. 
The radial movement system is great and leaves you thinking multiple turns ahead as you try to maneuver your workers into the most efficient places. If you want a 30 minute solo game that challenges your brain and has high replayability due to the variables in the game, Bethel Woods could be for you. It also has its own soundtrack and not many board games can boast that. The single best thing about the game is its fascinating rising tension. As the cost to build each part of the Dreamweaver increases, your total workforce also decreases as workers are locked in place in the orphanage. This makes those final few turns really quite tricky to manage. However, as a co-op game it is prone to alpha gaming. The strengths of chaining moves that you can do in solo are much harder to coordinate multiplayer without alpha gaming happening. With some groups this could be problematic, but at a comparable level to Pandemic. And while the setting is interesting, I had never heard of the IP before picking up the game. For another co-op game that can be played solo, with a comparable complexity and replayability, I recommend Pandemic. And for very different games from the same designer, I recommend checking out Raiders of the North Sea or Architects of the Western Kingdom. Hello and welcome to Between Two Cities in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 1-7 to seven players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is under 30 minutes. It's a relatively simple game. In this game you will work with two other players, seated to your left and right, and collaborate with them to build the two best cities that you can. You will take turns placing regions in each city until the city is complete. You will need to balance your cities and not focus on one too much, as the winner is determined by your lowest scoring city. The game ends when all players have placed 16 different buildings in a 4x4 grid. Then you score points based on how the buildings are placed. Some examples of scoring are that yellow buildings score more points if they are placed in a straight line, and red buildings score more if you can collect the whole set of four of them. Each different tile type has its own scoring rules. Each city is scored, and the winner is the person whose lowest scoring city scored the most points. Competitive. While you are working to build cities with people, there is still only one winner. Tile placement. How your tiles in the city are placed has an impact on your final score. Set collection. Tiles work best when you collect groups of them. Player turn. At the start of the game you will receive 7 tiles and have a city marker either side of you. You will be building a city with a person on your left and on your right. So Pip Girl will be building this city with Gizmo and this city with Macho Man Randy Savage, while Macho Man and Gizmo will build the third city together. Each turn you will select 2 tiles and pass the remaining along to the next player. Once you have selected your 2 tiles, you must place one in each city. This is when you need to talk to your neighbours about what they have picked and come up with an ideal place to put each tile. Your choices are your own, but working well with your neighbour will help you both. Once you have placed 3 tiles in each city, you then discard your final tile and get 3 of the double sized tiles. You choose 2 and place 1 in each city. You then get another 7 tiles and repeat the first 3 rounds, passing the tiles the other way. The game ends as soon as your last tile is placed and you immediately score each city. Why would you like this game? Between Two Cities is a feel good game. All the interactions you have are collaborative and positive. There's no incentive to play negatively, and even if you lose this game, you will still have a good time interacting with your neighbours. It's also a simple game that is really easy to teach, and if you have brand new players, you can sit them by experienced ones who can help coach them through the game. And veteran players have an incentive for the new players to do well. It's kid friendly and perfect for families, and there is enough going on to keep serious gamers thinking, especially if you add in the expansion with the extra rules and tiles. The best thing about the game is it scales up to 7 players with no additional game time and no additional difficulty to the rules. However, as good as it is, it is still just a filler game and a gateway game, so don't expect it to be anything more than a fun activity for about 20 minutes. And winning the game is highly dependent on who you are teamed up with. One poor decision can be the difference between first and last place in this game. If you want a deeper competitive city building game, try Suburbia. And if you want another family friendly building game, check out Dream Home. Hello and welcome to Black Orchestra in about 3 minutes. It is a game for up to 5 players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is around 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. It's 1936 and Hitler has tightened his grip on power in Germany. The Weimar Republic is dead and the Third Reich is reaching its zenith. But not everyone is happy with Herr Hitler. Not even within his own administration. Military leaders chafe under the little corporal's rule and men and women of principle are appalled by the brutality of the Nazis. Some of them meet in secret to devise a way to rid Germany of Hitler. In this game, you play those individuals. 
rules. There is only one way to win this game, and that is to kill Hitler. You lose the game if the war ends, and Hitler has not been killed, or if all the conspirators are in prison at the same time. Cooperative. Everyone is a conspirator, working together on the same goal. Dice. Conspiring and assassination attempts use dice. Killing Hitler. This really isn't a mechanic, I just wanted a symbol for it. Player turn. Governing each character in Black Orchestra are two important stats. Motivation, which is how keen your conspirator is to kill Hitler, and suspicion, which is how dodgy the Gestapo think they are. You'll want to keep motivation high and suspicion low as much as possible throughout the game. If your suspicion is too high and a Gestapo raid event happens, you will end up in prison, and that's bad news for everyone. On each player's turn, they may take three actions. You may move to an adjacent region. You can reveal an item in a location, and for another action, you can also collect it. You can deliver an item to a location and gain the benefits shown there. You can collect conspirator cards. They can be legal or illegal, and actions or reactions depending on the card. You can also conspire, rolling one dice per action used. Each number you roll gains you that many actions, which cannot be used to conspire again. Eagles are bad news, raising your suspicion by one each. Hits are added to the dissident track, and when this reaches three, you can increase a character's motivation by one or reduce Hitler's military support. Hitler's military support is important, as it represents how hard he is to kill. If it is on seven, you will need seven successes to kill him, which is almost impossible. So let's set it to three. You need to have a plot and be with Hitler to carry it out. You then build a dice pool based on that plot, gaining dice for matching your political affiliation, having the right equipment, bonus character skills, and cards played from your hand. You then roll and hope you get more hits than Hitler's support and less eagles than your suspicion. If Hitler is killed, you win the game. If not, bad stuff might happen. If Hitler is still alive, draw an event card and it is the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? In a lot of co-op games, there is a sense that you are fighting fires, rushing around dealing with each emergent crisis and making sure the game doesn't overwhelm you. Black Orchestra is far more patient. It's about keeping your head down, not raising suspicions, and being in the right place at the right time to finally act. And that gives it a totally different sense of tension, a nervous tension. And I found that experience very rewarding. It's also true to history, with events bound to the actual war and a cast of characters who were all legitimate opponents of Hitler's. The single best thing about this game is that you get to kill Hitler. Although if they reprint the game, they should make the We Killed Hitler card into an A4 poster. However, the pacing of this game might be off-putting to some. When Hitler's military support is high, he's virtually untouchable, leading to a long mid-game where you're preparing, but not necessarily acting. The assassination attempts do come down to a single dice roll, and if you don't like that kind of luck, this game could really bug you. I also don't like the difficulty system. It doesn't make the game harder to play as such, it just makes your assassination attempts less likely, and I feel more nuance could have been added for changing difficulty. If realistic war settings are interesting to you, but you want a much deeper story game, try this war of mine. And if you like the idea of historic co-ops, you could also check out Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Black Orchestra makes me want to kill Hitler over and over and over again. Hello and welcome to Block by Block, the Insurrection Game, first edition, in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. You can play it solo. Playing time is around two hours. It's a moderately complex game. The people of Block City have had enough. Poverty, state oppression, and police brutality have lit a fire that cannot be contained. It can only burn itself out. The Blocks are taking to the street and taking on the police, pushing back the riot cops and trying to occupy the city. No more will they stay silent. It's time for these Blocks to fight the powers that be and tear the city up. The players win the game if they manage to occupy all four state districts in the city before eight turns are up and the military arrives to quash the insurrection. You lose if you fail to do that in time or if any player has no blocks on the board. You can also play with scenarios and personal objectives that change these win conditions. Cooperative. Players are all different factions with the police as the common enemy. Area control. The city is made up of 25 districts and controlling these are the key to winning the game. Player turn. There are eight turns in a normal game and on each turn each faction will be able to take a number of actions. You roll three to five action dice based on how many blocks you have on the board. You can use one dice to move any number of blocks in one area to any area they can reach. However, However, they stop if they run into police. In this example, they want to go to the garment sweatshop, but the police block the route, so they go the other way to the metro station and travel from metro to metro to get there. You can spend any dice to build a barricade to slow down police. Each region has a numbered value, and the following actions require a dice equal or higher to take that action. You can place an occupation in an area and gain the benefits. You can loot a district if it has a looting space, placing graffiti the first time you do so, and a burning marker the second time. Once all spaces are burned, no 
more looting can be done in that district. You can engage police in a clash and choose to remove either one cube from the board or force two into an adjacent district. Police vans require three hits to remove and are frequently in high numbered regions, so you will likely need a lot of good rolls, some teamwork or Molotov cocktails to help you out. After each player acts, the police move based on the current police morale. Barricades and tactical movement of your blocks can slow the police down. Once all players have acted, the cops attack and remove blocks. You then check to see if a district can be liberated. If you have double the district's rating in blocks, you flip it, gain the manifestation card underneath, and all factions who took part get that benefit. If you have occupied all four state districts, the game ends. Otherwise, it is now the next turn. Why would you like this game? This is one of my favorite games for a lot of reasons. The first of which is the theme. So many games are about war, but few are about rebellions against state authority. They're just something wonderfully honest about how the game is constructed and the historic links it has to events like the Rodney King riots, the Arab Spring, and New Zealand's very own Springbok Tour. It's not a very well explored area in gaming and block by block nails it, but it does it in a way that is tactfully abstracted. It's not about a specific event as such, it's about the blocks living in Block City and the artwork of the blocks is both adorable and clever. It's also a brutally tough cooperative game with solid mechanics, a lot of replayability and some serious tactical gameplay. The single best thing about the game is that they made the cop blocks white. And if that last statement has you rushing to post a comment, then this game might not be for you. Make no mistakes, this is a politically motivated game with a political message. If that message is one you do not want to hear, then I recommend staying clear of this game. This game is my Pandemic. It shares a lot in common with Pandemic and how it plays, but I find Block by Block to be a lot more engaging and tactical. And if you want another co-op game about people fighting against oppressive regime where the goal is to kill Hitler, check out Black Orchestra. Hello and welcome to the Castles of Mad King Ludwig in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is 60 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. It's 1873 and the Bavarian King, Ludwig II, has decided that he wants a lot of castles built across his lands. He has contacted the master builders of Europe to construct the greatest and most prestigious castles possible. But King Ludwig has unusual tastes and fickle favor. You must build a castle to match his eccentric whims and not necessarily a castle that makes any practical sense. The winner of this game is the player who scores the most points. Rooms are scored constantly throughout the game when you place them, and you will gain bonus points for how they are placed. You also score points based on the randomly chosen goal tokens as well as your own secret objective cards. Competitive. Each player is building their own castle, and only one can be the best. Tile laying. Each room in the castle is a different tile, and how you place them makes a big difference to your score. Set collection. Many ways to score points are improved if you have multiples of the same type. At the start of the game, there will be public goals shown and secret objective cards given to you. These will guide your choices on what to build in the game. Each turn, a different player will be the master builder. They draw replacement cards for any tiles that were purchased on the previous turn and then have to decide what to price each tile as shown here. When a player buys a room, the master builder gets that money and it has to last you until you are the master builder again. You can also buy a corridor or stairs for three coins. Stairs are the only way to build dungeon rooms. You can also choose not to take a room and to gain five coins. You score points when you place a room. So this room is worth one point by itself, but will be worth much more when it has blue rooms attached. A room is completed when all its entryways are closed, as shown here. You then check the room completion bonus. This is a living room, so the room is rescored. The room itself was worth one point, and four points for each blue room attached to it, for a total of nine points. Other bonuses include food rooms, which allow you to take an extra turn, bedrooms, which allow you to look at a stack of tiles and put some of them on the top for later, and utility rooms, which allow you to get extra secret objective cards. You continue playing until the stack of buildings runs out. Why would you like this game? There's something quite rewarding about taking tiles and building your very own unique castle, and its mix of tactile and cerebral play elements will appeal to a lot of players. The objectives for each game change, and they really impact on your decision making. For example, in a game with these two public objectives that feature bedrooms, bedrooms would be in huge demand. And while it is a low conflict game, it is one where you have to pay attention to what your opponents are doing, this is not a multiplayer solitaire game. The single best thing about this game is that you get to build a castle. Having your finished construct sitting in front of you at the end of the game is really satisfying. However, the pricing phase is a nightmare for new players, and even people who have played the game a lot can get frustrated with it. Knowing what to price and how each player could use each room leads to a lot of analysis paralysis. 
it's also quite hard to recover from mistakes. And if you have a bad round as a master builder, you can be wasting actions to gain coins instead of building rooms. There are two very similar games by the same designer. The first of which is the Palace of Mad King Ludwig, which is a tile placement game where you're building one palace instead of independent castles. Palace has much more of a competitive focus. And if you want a similar game to castles, but prefer the idea of building a modern city, I recommend Suburbia. Hello and welcome to Civilization in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 3 to 7 players. There is no official solo mode. Playing time is really long. It is a relatively complex game. It's around 4000 BC when the first major human settlements in the Fertile Crescent and the Mediterranean are starting to grow. You will lead your civilization through the perils of war, famine, civil war, epidemics and heresy. You will trade across the known world and develop technologies. But only one civilization can be the greatest in antiquity. The winner of this game is the player who moves to the end of the scoring track first. If multiple players finish on the same turn, it is the player with the most points who wins. Points are scored primarily by technology cards. Competitive. Only one player can win this game. Set collection. Collecting sets of trade goods is key to victory. Player turn. First off, you collect taxation. If you don't have enough to pay, your cities revolt and go to the player with the least amount of people. Then you gain population. One in a region with one unit and two in regions with more than one. A census is taken. The player with the most units will move first. You can move any number of units, one region each in your turn. Ships can move up to five units for spaces and can pick up and drop off units freely. Combat occurs after all players have moved, so a smaller civilization can react to an opponent's attack by withdrawing or reinforcing. Combat has players alternate removing units, starting with the smallest stack first. Keep removing units until you reach the region's population limit. Cities count as 6 units, so must be attacked with at least 7 units. Cities can be built with 6 units in an area with a square, or 12 units anywhere else. Then, reduce population down to the region's limit. For each city you control, gain 1 trade card. These come from the numbered decks, so a player with 6 cities draws cards from the first 6 stacks. Cards are worth more if you have matching sets. You can trade them in groups of three, but you must truthfully say the total value of the cards and one of the cards in the set. In this example, bronze for nine is traded for cloth for eight. However, the cloth player has traded away an epidemic, which will be bad for the player receiving it. There are eight disasters, four are tradable, and four happen to whomever draws them. To buy a technology, you must use trade cards and discounts. For example, coinage costs 110, but mysticism gives a 20 point discount. The player uses four cloth combined for 80 points, as well as other cards to make up the last 10. Once all Civ cards are purchased, move your scoring marker along of Able, and then start a new turn. Why would you like this game? Before there was a video game franchise, there was the original Civilization board game. Few games have a greater legacy in gaming than Civilization. It has no player elimination, a lot of come from behind mechanics, diceless conflict resolution, trade and set collection. All hallmarks of what we would call Euro gaming, but decades ahead of when those became popular. As a game, it has held up remarkably well in most areas. And even today, it feels far more epic and grand than other games in the civilization genre, and more coherent. It sticks to the ancient world and doesn't try to go beyond that, which keeps the immersion factor high. The single best thing about the game is the dramatic swings and changes that can occur via disasters and mismanagement. It's easy to build a large civilization, but very hard to keep one for long. However, playtime is the biggest detractor from this game and places it in the same category as super heavyweight games like Twilight Imperium 4. And while the game has a lot of strong come from behind mechanics, it takes a few plays to really understand how to make those work in your favor. The game has recently had a reprint for the first time in a long time, and although its content might be a little different to this version, I recommend checking it out. And to get incredibly meta, you can play the board game of the computer game inspired by this board game with Sid Meier's Civilization. And if you want a game about developing a civilization, but with a much shorter playtime, I recommend Civilization A New Dawn. Hello and welcome to Dead of Winter, and Dead of Winter The Long Night in well over 3 minutes. This video will be a bit longer than normal because we've got two games to cover and even though they're virtually the same game, there are a bunch of differences I'm going to point out. It is a game for 2-5 to five players. It has no official solo mode. Playing time is around 2-3 to three hours. It is a moderately complex mm. game. When the dead started to walk the earth you could barely believe it. But thankfully, you had enough presence of mind to cave old man with his skull in with a shovel before he bit you. The next few days were a mad panic, with the CDC, military, and civil defense all failing to contain the contagion. A small group of survivors fled to the mountains and now ekes out a living in the harsh, cold landscape. Supplies are short, morale is low, and there is a constant threat from raiders and the undead. And you're also not too sure about that old Raxon facility in town. 
The game comes with many scenarios, and they mostly require the colony to survive a certain amount of turns while gathering a set amount of resources. If you make it to the end of the game, you will win! Hooray! That is, as long as you've completed your own personal secret goal as well. And that's only if your secret goal wasn't to burn the colony down and dance around in its ashes. Cooperative. Players work together to make the colony a success. Traitor. Except when that comes into conflict with their own personal goals. Narrative driven. The crossroads cards in this game add a lot of story elements. Dice. Many actions require dice, the worst of which is the exposure dice, which can lead to characters being wounded, suffering frostbite, or being bitten by a zombie. Player turn. Turn over a crisis card. This is a task that all players can contribute to during their turns, and each crisis card has a consequence for failure. Players can contribute cards face down to the crisis pile during their turn. Roll action dice equal to the number of characters in your group, plus one. Many actions require a dice to do, and some require no dice at all. Dice-free actions include moving from one location to another, you can spend fuel to drive there safely, or risk rolling the exposure dice. Other free actions include equipping items, trading items, and voting to exile a player from the colony. Actions that use any dice include placing a barricade to slow down the zombies, cleaning the camp to stop morale decreasing, and moving zombies from one location to your location. The main dice actions are attack, where you need one dice higher or equal than your attack skill to remove a zombie. This causes a roll for exposure as well, although some weapons negate that. Searching, which requires one dice equal or higher than your search skill. You draw one card from the location deck and keep it. You can also push your luck and add noise to draw an additional card, but you still only keep one. You can do this multiple times, but noise attracts more zombies. Once all players have acted, you pay food to feed the colony, see if you have passed the crisis by shuffling all the face down cards and seeing if you have enough resources then you add zombies at locations based on the characters presence and noise it's now the next turn why would you like this game dead of winter is a fascinating game to play with people it captures the feeling of the zombie survival genre really well the hidden objectives bring out the selfishness that would be present in a real world survival situation for example one character might be a junkie and need to stockpile medicine for their own use, and this may make them not contribute that medicine to a crisis requiring it. The crossroad cards are also very thematic, and while they might not trigger enough for some people, I find their impact is made better because of that. The single best thing about this game is the companion crossroads card app. We link it to a speaker and pass the tablet around, and the narration adds a lot of atmosphere to the game. However, some groups will not enjoy the level of distrust and social manipulation in this game. It also has some pretty dark and adult content that might not appeal. And finally, it has some odd tonal shifts that seem out of place. One minute you can find a woman dying in the street, or have a character commit suicide. And the next moment, Sparky the Wonder Dog can use a sniper rifle and vote on a political issue in camp. Dead of Winter versus The Long Night The Long Night is not an expansion as such, nor is it a second edition of Dead of Winter. It's in a hazy middle ground between the two. It is a standalone game that does not require the original Dead of Winter to play, but can be combined together to make a superset of the game. If you really love this game, it's worth having both. But which one should you get first? The original game has more characters, with a total of 30, and slightly simpler rules. But that's about all it has over the Long Night. The Long Night has improved locations on heavy card stock. It only has 20 characters, but that's enough for any game I've played of it. It also comes with a bunch of additional systems and options. As well as barricades in the original, you also get explosive traps. Helpless colonists are supplemented by hostile colonists. Injuries are not just wounds and frostbite, they now include despair. Improvements are added, which allow you to upgrade the colony in ways you couldn't in the original game. There is also a graveyard region used to track colonists who have died, a raider camp complete with raiders who add another challenge to the game, and the Raxon facility, with its own scenarios, encounter deck, challenges, and a collection of unique and rare zombie types. All in all, The Long Night simply comes with more content, and a lot more options for how to enjoy the game. I would only recommend getting the original over The Long Night if you plan to own both eventually, and if you want to ramp up the difficulty and complexity of the game by slowly adding The Long Night later. But if your budget only stretches to one of these games, I'd recommend The Long Night by a long margin. And if you love it, you can always pick up Dead of Winter later. This would also allow you to play War and Colonies, the next expansion for Dead of Winter that requires components from both games and pits two groups against each other. To see how this world went to hell in a handbasket, I recommend playing Raxon, the prequel game to Dead of Winter. And for another game with hidden traitors, social manipulation and survival, I recommend Battlestar Galactica. Hello and welcome to Dream Home in about three minutes. 
It is a game for two to four players. There is no solo mode, although there is one in the expansion. Playing time is around 30 minutes. It's a very simple game. You've scrimped and saved for years, or gotten a lot of money from your parents, and have decided to build your very own dream home in suburbia. By placing rooms, using tools, and getting ornaments, you can build the prettiest house possible. Who will have the nicest house and be able to lord their middle class superiority over their neighbors? There is only one way to find out by playing Dream Home. The winner is the person with the most points at the end of the game. You earn points for rooms, and more points if the rooms are bigger. For example, this living room is worth 9 points if you have all three sections side by side. You also gain points for having a logical house, with a bathroom on each floor, and a kitchen, and a bedroom. You also score points for ornaments in your house, and finally you score points for your roof. You get a lot more points if your roof tiles match, and bonus points for having a window. Competitive. Only one person can have the nicest house in the street, and lord it over their friends. Set collection. Rooms are worth more if they match. Victory points. The winner of this game is the person who scores the most points. Player turn. At the start of the turn, you will refill the build track with cards from the decks on the side. There will always be rooms in the bottom row, and the top row will contain a mixture of roof tiles, bonus cards that will help you out, or ornaments to improve rooms. The first player gets the first choice and collects cards from one row, taking both the top card and the bottom card. If you select the leftmost row, you gain the first player marker and can pick first next turn. Roof cards go face down, and you cannot look at them again. So remember what you picked. Tools can be used to modify things, and helpers can make changes at the end of the game. Then you place rooms, but there are some restrictions on where you can place them. You can always place in the three rows on the left of the main floor. You could not place this one here because there is no support below this room, nor here. This is a legal placement as the living room supports the playroom. Only basement rooms can be placed in the basement area, which allows you to build above them. Once you have placed your cards, refresh the track, and start again until you run out of cards. That's the end of the game. Why would you like this game? Dream Home is a very simple game and is a perfect gateway game for new players. It has easy to learn rules, a theme that is incredibly accessible, and plays in a short time. There's enough decision making that it feels like a real game while still being playable by very inexperienced players. Visually it's nice to look at and has some good variety of content within the game which could help with replayability. The single best thing about the game is the scoring system. It's logical, it's simple, and it reinforces the theme. However, Dream Home is a simple game and expecting it to be more than it is may disappoint some players. If your idea of a perfect game is Caverna or Twilight Imperium, it may not be for you. And I also suspect that based on its simplicity, that players may quickly tire of the game with repeated plays. For another great gateway game with an urban theme, I recommend Between Two Cities. And for another game about building rooms, but with a lot more complexity and depth, I recommend Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Hello and welcome to Empires of the Void 2 in about three minutes. It is a game for two to five players. It does not have a solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It is a moderately complex mm. game. With their homeworlds destroyed by a relentless invader, a group of alien species heads out into the void on massive world ships. When they arrive in a previously unknown region of space, the old habits of conquest, control, and domination begin again. Only one can be the true empire of the void. Competitive. Players each represent one spacefaring race and play against each other. Role selection. One player chooses the active action for that round. Area control. Players score points by occupying planets and maintaining alliances. The Empire with the most victory points at the end of the game wins. You will score twice. You score points for having alliances, occupying planets, having buildings constructed, and objective cards. In addition, you score points for every battle you win. Player turn. One person per turn selects an action from the options here. They then take that action, and all players may choose to follow that action, pay two commands to do a different action, or refresh their cards, command, and money. Let's look at each action. Move and attack. Move units from one region any distance, paying one command per region moved. Combat is simple. Roll dice as shown on your units, pick the highest one, add your units power together, and then play a card. Highest value wins. The losers retreat to the nearest friendly region with no losses. Research and build. Take any actions you can afford. Research costs the trade goods shown, plus power cards equal to the value shown. For example, a life form trade good and four power here. Buildings cost the sum of the money cost shown, but that cost may be reduced by adding a trade good permanently to that board. Once one type of good is chosen, only that one may be added in future. Building new things uncovers new spaces on your track and gives you the associated advantages. Buildings can go on planets with one per region or on your world ship, paying the power cost. 
Card action. Play a card from your hand and gain the associated benefit. In this case, placing influence on this world. Or discard cards to attempt diplomacy. Recruit units. Pay the cost shown for the units and place them on any region you control or have units currently. You may recruit as many units as you can afford. Scavenge. Never pick this if you can avoid it. It's the only way the player choosing actions can refresh, but it makes everyone else's turn easier. Why would you like this game? 4X Games, which is Explore, Expand, Exploit, and Exterminate, are very popular on PC, and several efforts have been made to bring them to the tabletop. Many of those games require long play times. Empires of the Void 2 is a rare attempt to capture the feel of a 4X game without the long playtime. It takes the core elements of a 4X game and pushes them front and center, giving you a great sci-fi epic game in a reasonable time. Also, it's an exceptionally good looking game with wonderful artwork. The single best thing about this game is the event cards. Each one is tailored to a planet and they have colorful and important impacts on the game. The most memorable event for me was one that involved the doom of an entire world. However, while it does deliver on the 4X experience in a short time frame, it also feels less epic than some of its longer running cousins. The action selection system can cause some players headaches and analysis paralysis. For a much bigger and epic 4X game, you can't go past Twilight Imperium 4. For another 4X game with a short time frame, and a game where you can discover New Zealand and learn Haka, I recommend Conquest of Paradise. Hello and welcome to Manhattan Project Energy Empire in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 1-5 to five players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 2 hours. It's a moderately complex game. World War 2 is over and the nuclear age has begun. You are the government of a major world power as the great technological advances of the Cold War take place. You will need to build infrastructure, educate workers, keep your environment clean and provide the power needed to make it all run. The winner of this game is the player with the most points at the end. You gain points from buildings, achievements, supporting the global order and having a clean environment. The game ends when the pollution markers run out. Competitive. Only one player can have the greatest energy empire. Worker placement. Placing workers on the board to gain benefits is the main action in this game. Engine building. Building cards that combine effects and work together are key to winning. Player turn. The resources in this game are money, plastic, steel, science, oil, power plants, workers, energy and pollution. Each player is a different nation and they start with different resources and a unique way to advance the UN track. Most turns you'll place one worker on the board and take that action, paying any cost shown. For example, you place a worker at the government market and choose to buy the national resources card. This costs either one science or three money. If a worker is already in a spot you want to use, you must pay at least one more energy than the worker already in that space. Many cards have a pollution cost. If they do, take it from the pollution track and add it to your board. This may trigger an event which happens immediately. Once you have taken your worker action, you can activate any buildings you own with the same color. So in this case, green buildings. You can place workers or energy on the spaces on those cards and use their effects. This one allows you to spend one science to clean up two points of pollution. One point can either flip a nuclear marker or remove a normal pollution. This card requires two energy or workers, and this card has two slots, but you can only use one per activation. You can also use your nation card, paying the cost to advance the UN track for victory points. You can also choose not to place a worker and generate power. If you have two workers or energy left when you do that, you can claim an achievement. Reclaim all your workers from the board. Power generation requires power plants that you must buy here, and they're represented by dice. You can also spend up to four oil for oil dice. Roll any of the power plants you want, count up the energy symbols, and that's how much energy you now have. The highest dice rolled also determines if you get pollution. Keep playing until a pollution stack runs out. Why would you like this game? Energy Empire is a game for people who like building game engines, and who like to be able to play with that engine for a long time. There's a great variety of buildings and paths to victory, and adapting your engine based on what cards and actions are available is the key to winning the game. The components are top quality, and I particularly love the chunky steel tokens. The pollution timer keeps the game advancing rapidly, and gives all players a nice idea of how long the game has to go. And the environmental message is done well, with pollution hampering your chances of winning, but being a necessary part of developing your nation. Each different nation's starting position gives you a different focus each time you play. The best thing about this game is when your engine is running and you have a lot of power. 
and one worker placement becomes half a dozen different actions. However, there are an awful lot of interactions to keep track of in this game, and it requires a lot of attention to detail, so while it's not complex mechanically, it is still one of those games that could be incredibly overwhelming to some people. And like a lot of engine builders, you can get a runaway leader, and there is little other players can do to rein them in. If you love the engine building aspect of this game, you'll probably enjoy terraforming Mars. And there are also the other games in the Manhattan Project family that you might want to check out. Manhattan Project Energy Empire. Three gigawatts of a game. Hello and welcome to Euphoria. Build a better dystopia in about three minutes. It is a game for two to six players. It has no solo mode. Playing time is around 60 minutes, but longer with more players. It is a moderately complex game. When you were growing up, you thought your world was a utopia. At least, that's what all the broadcasts kept telling you. Slowly it dawned on you that you were living in a nightmarish dystopia. Being one of the few aware people, you decided to take action. As a mid-level manager, you use your sway to convert your subordinates to your way of thinking. And it's time to build a power base. The way to win this game is to accumulate influence across the board, handily represented by stars, gaining authority over each faction, and by pushing your subordinates' faction agendas. The first player to place all their stars wins. Competitive, players are rival managers operating behind the scenes. Dice, dice in this game represent your workers. Worker placement, the board contains many areas where you place your workers and gain the associated benefits. Player turn, Euphoria is a paradox, a relatively simple game that is difficult to explain because all the systems are so interconnected. I will not cover all of them, but we'll focus on the high notes. You start the game with one open recruit and one hidden. Their allegiance will impact what factions you try to support during the game. Your turn itself is simple. You either reclaim any or all of your dice from the board, or place a dice on a location and gain the associated benefit. When you reclaim your dice, you roll them and add your intelligence score. If you ever roll a combined total of 16 or more, you lose the highest dice. If you decide to place dice as your action, you have many locations to choose from. Also, if you ever have two dice of the same number, you can place twice in a row. First of all, there are commodity regions. When you place a dice there, you gain the benefits for the total value of all dice there. The more dice in location changes the reward. You can gain extra workers by using either electricity or water. Tunnels allow you to gain resources or artifact cards and advance the tunnel marker. Monuments require multiple dice and resources and can be built by more than one player. Any player who did not contribute to building the monument gets hit with a penalty. Monuments and artifact markers allow you to place stars for victory. Many locations also increase that faction's influence, which unlocks bonuses for players who have those factions recruits. There are a lot of locations in other small systems, but a general rule for the game is that you get commodities in order to get cards and resources, which you then convert into stars to win. Why would you like this game? The recruit system is neat and adds a lot of variety to the game, and having one open and one hidden recruit makes for some interesting decisions and interactions, especially at higher player counts. The take your dice or place a dice system is excellent. It keeps the game moving with great rapidity and keeps players engaged and the production values are great. The whole game looks wonderful on the table. The single best thing about this game is the resource tracker cards. Uh, I don't know why every resource management game doesn't come with these, as they are a huge time saver. However, the game is not as thematic as I initially thought. When I saw the decision cards initially, I thought there would be a morality system built into this game, but they ended up being a very minor part of the game. It also works far better with four or more players than it does with two or three, as with lower player counts, there will be several factions you don't interact with. It is also a game that needs to be played at pace, and even one slow player can make the game drag far more than most. For another quick and fun worker placement game, I recommend Lords of Waterdeep, and for another worker placement game by the same designer, I recommend Viticulture Essential Edition. Hello and welcome to Ex Libris in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is about 60 minutes. It's a reasonably complex game. Never let anyone tell you book collecting isn't serious business. Not in your city, and certainly not when the job of head librarian has become available. With dreams of administering your town's collection of rare and wonderful tomes, you set out to impress the mayor with a stunning and well shelved collection of wonderful works. The winner of this game is the player with the best collection at the end. Scoring is is quite complex, so I will show that later. Worker placement. Actions in this game are the result of placing workers at locations and gaining the associated benefits. Set collection. Books come in six different types and heavily influence scoring. Tarlang. The best collections are arranged on shelves alphabetically and carefully. Player turn. 
At the start of the game, decide if you are playing a basic game with standard player boards and three normal minions, or the advanced game with factions and unique minions. Also, determine what type of books the city really wants and which ones are currently on the banned list. Each player gets a secret book goal as well. Each turn, deal out a number of locations equal to the number of players. Players alternate placing workers to collect books, shelve books, and take special actions depending on that location. The round ends when all workers have been placed. You then put the lowest numbered building tile in the permanent locations area and draw new ones. This means the number of available locations increases during the game. But the core of the game is shelving. You will have a hand of cards and they have a letter in one corner and the types of books in the spaces marked at the top. You want to shelve cards in alphabetical order and you can shelve them up to three high. Any cards shelved out of alphabetical order, reading from top left to bottom right, or duplicates will not be counted for scoring. They do however keep your shelves stable as you cannot place any cards just floating. The number of cards stacked in one continuous group scores you points. The game ends once a certain number of cards have been shelved. On to scoring. First of all take all your books that are arranged in order and not duplicates and line them up. Write down the numbers of each type of book. You then score points for your shelving and for each of the books the city favoured. You lose points for each of the banned books in your collection. You then score points for the lowest number of a book type in your collection and finally you get double points for the books that match your private goal. The winner is the player with the highest total. Why would you like this game? Ex Libris is a fun, vibrant game with pretty easy to teach rules that has quite a broad appeal. It's in a sweet spot for complexity where it can appeal to reasonably casual gamers while offering something for fans of heavier worker placement games. I'm breaking my single best rule for this game because it has three things that really need praise. First, the dry erase board for scoring. For games with a lot of ways to score points, this is simply amazing and I'd love to see it done more often. Secondly, the individual player boards with their own unique meeples are both good from a gameplay point and are just really cute. And finally, the book titles. I can't overemphasize how much work went into these and how fun they are. You'll likely stop during a game multiple times just to have a chuckle at them. However, with great praise comes great condemnation, and the writing on the faction boards and the worker placement boards is really hard to read. And every game I've played has required players to either pick up the boards to look at them, lean in close to read them, or ask for them to be read out loud, and it derails the game every time. As a result, what should be an excellent, easy to play game ends up with far too much rule checking and referencing happening. Also, with adding new locations every turn, the game gets big really quickly, and the usual tension of placement spots in a worker placement game isn't a big deal here. If books and playing around with letters really appeals to you, you should check out Hardback. And if you want a deeper, more complex fantasy themed worker placement game, check out Argent the Consortium. Ex Libris, file it under H for hard to read. Hello and welcome to Fallout, the board game, in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. The game takes around two hours for four players. It is a moderately complex game. War. War never changes. Centuries after the fires of nuclear war have burnt the cities of the world to ash, humanity survives and ekes out a living in the wasteland. You are one of these survivors, and have set out on a quest. Competitive. Players are competing against each other. Character development. There are many ways to improve your character in this game. Narrative driven. The game contains many encounters and events. The winner is the first player to score the required number of victory points, shown by thumbs on these cards. Each card is worth a minimum of one victory point, and they can be worth more. For example, these loyalty cards are worth an extra point for each step that that faction is ahead of its opponent in the story, so these are worth three. If you had three of them, they would be worth nine total. Advancing the story for the faction you are loyal to is the key to winning this game. Some cards also have miscellaneous objectives. Player turn. Many actions require the special fallout dice to be rolled. Each die has two bits of information on it. A hit location, which is used in combat, and the asterisks, which are used for skill checks in combat. Sometimes you can re-roll dice if you have an appropriate skill. For example, here I have the intelligence skill, and the weapon also has that skill, granting me one re-roll in combat. If I had all three skills, I could re-roll up to three dice. On your turn, you'll have two actions, and you can do the same action twice. You may move up to two spaces of a move action, and may take other actions during a move action. For example, you can move one space, have an encounter, and then move another space. Green areas are radioactive and do radiation damage, and red areas cost two movement points each. Explore actions allow you to discover new tiles, placing monsters when they are revealed. Quest actions allow you to interact with the current quest card. Encounter actions allow you to draw a ruins encounter or a city encounter, if you are at the appropriate location. The camp action allows you to refresh cards and recover hit points. 
Bite actions require you to roll a number of hit locations equal to the monster's level, in this case 2. The dice must show you have hit their vulnerable areas. The monsters deal damage equal to the asterisks rolled times their level, in this case 6. When you defeat an enemy, place a new one from the stack face down on the board at the nearest spawn location for that enemy type. Why would you like this game? First and foremost, it is a Fallout game, and it does capture the unique look and feel of that setting. If you enjoy that world, you are likely to enjoy the stories and encounters presented in this game. It's also a solid adventure game that you can play solo or with friends. But the biggest selling point of the game is the world building that has gone into it. The single best thing about the game are the encounter and quest cards. There is a huge variety of stories in here and the system allows for easy expansion. However, the game feels slightly incomplete, as though this is the core box for a much larger game. The competitive nature of the game and the victory point system is not great. I feel it needs a full co-op mode as well. In addition, the story elements can be accessed by any player, which means player 1 can discover a quest, but player 2 on the other side of the board instantly knows about it and can act on that information as well, which is slightly confusing. For a much deeper, complex and more intense game with similar game concepts, I recommend Mage Knight. For a fully cooperative game set in the post-apocalypse, I recommend Salvation Road or Defenders of the Last Stand. Hello and welcome to First Martians in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 1-4 to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 1-2 to two hours. It is an extremely complex mm. game. You and your crew are the first team to land on Mars. There is no backup immediately available and the success of your mission and your own personal survival are totally in your own hands. How will your team cope with the challenges of surviving on the Red Planet, living in close proximity with each other and dealing with the dangers of early space colonization? In order to win this game, you must complete the goals listed on the scenario and these can be dramatically different. On top of that, you must ensure that at the end of the game, the base is not too badly damaged. Cooperative. Players are astronauts working together to survive on Mars. Worker placement. Each astronaut has action markers that they use to take actions on the board. App driven. This game comes with an app that is required to play the game. Player turn. First of all, the board looks intimidating, but it's best to think of it like a systems dashboard. If the light is green, the system is working fine and you don't have to worry about it. If it's red, that means there is a problem. The app will help you manage the turn order. First off, an event will happen and that may or may not have immediate consequences. Then you check morale and stress, increasing stress for each astronaut in the base. Then check production to see if you have enough power, oxygen and food. If you don't have enough oxygen or power, you must shut down rooms. Then you must assign actions to the different workspaces around the board. Once all actions are assigned, you resolve them in a set order. You can assign actions to the current event. Rest and unwind gives you focus tokens to use skills and increases morale or decreases stress. The med lab allows you to heal wounds and the control center reduces the chance of malfunctions. The next four actions use the special dice. If you assign two actions to a task, you do not have to roll the dice. But if you only assign one action, you do. Each dice has a chance of success or failure, of getting a wound, or having a complication. Complications are managed by the app, and you need to enter what astronaut got the complication and what role they were making. Explore allows you to discover areas outside the base. Gather lets you collect resources from the outside. Research lets you examine those resources and build lets you build new features or repair damaged systems. Depending on the scenario you are playing, there may also be special actions. Once all these actions are resolved, you move to the next turn. Why would you like this game? This game is like the movie Apollo 13. It's not flashy and overly dramatic, but there's a great deal of tension when a system light flicks over from green to red and you start wondering if people are going to die. It has a huge amount of depth and rewards serious and determined play. The scenarios change up the game dramatically, and the game ships with two legacy campaigns as well, which contain additional linked scenarios. This game would appeal to a group who appreciates the very real feeling of a game about space exploration, or solo gamers who want a deep and challenging experience. The single best thing about the game is the ongoing support the game is getting. New scenarios and app updates are coming out, and the game continues to be worked on, which is unusual for a board game without additional expansions. However, this is a game many people will bounce off hard. The complexity is high, it can be brutally unfair, and it looks dry and uninviting. If you want something light and entertaining, this is not the game for you. Also, the rulebook as written is not great, and the app continues to have some awkward writing in it. Many people consider First Martians a weaker game than the designer's previous game using the same core systems, Robinson Crusoe, so I'd highly recommend checking out both games. And for another serious survival-themed co-op game with good solo options available, I recommend 
this war of mine. Hello and welcome to Flaming Pyramids in about three minutes. This game is part of our campaign to promote New Zealand made games. Prototype copy is shown. It is a game for two to six players. There is no official solo mode. Playing time is around 15 minutes. It's a relatively simple game. In Flaming Pyramids, you are trying to offload your hand of cards and build a giant pyramid. Unfortunately, there are several problems you have to deal with. Overloading the pyramid can cause it to collapse, and part of the pyramid is made with flammable materials, which have a tendency to explode. You will need cunning and planning in order to effectively play your tiles to win. The winner of this game is the player that empties their hand of cards first. That's it, but there are many situations where you'll be forced to pick up new cards, so it's not as easy as it initially sounds. Competitive. Only one player can win this game. Card management. Deciding which cards to play and which to hold is the key to victory. Tile placement. Cards are placed into a shared tableau and their placement there has a great impact on the game. Player turn. At the start of the game, deal out all the cards so players have an equal number. They form a draw deck for each player, and any leftover cards are placed in the middle of the table. Each player will draw five cards, and each turn you will play one card and then redraw to five, if you can. The types of cards are straw, embers, which set fire to straw, wood, campfires, which set fire to wood and straw, stone which does not burn, and this unique multicolored stone card. Cards must be placed on top of two other cards if that is a possible legal placement. These examples show where the legal placements are in each of these situations. Cards have three main bits of information, their color, their type, and their weight, which is the number in the corner of the card. Ideally on your turn, you will want to place a card that matches one of the cards below it in color or weight, and whose total weight score is less than the two below it combined. If the card placed is too heavy, you will have a collapse, where the card will fall down and remove those below it until it comes to a legal placement. Then you have straw fires and wood fires, which remove all connected flammable materials, reducing the pyramid. Any embers or campfires that ignite are removed from the game, but any cards that explode or collapse on your turn go into your discard pile, and you will have to get rid of them later. Being forced into a position where you have to set a fire is less than ideal. You keep playing until someone plays their final card and the game finishes. Why would you like this game? Flaming Pyramids is a quick paced game that is simple enough to be a great addition to family game night while being thinky enough to be a filler game for more serious gamers. While there are a few tricky rules around collapses and explosions, most people will figure those out after one short play. So it'd be very good for families, as long as there's an adult there to teach those special rules. This game is a bit like a modern take on Uno, a last card game that has been a popular family classic for a long time, and it's better than Uno as well. The final production version will look quite different to this prototype version. Here's some example art. The single best thing about the game is its time frame and portability. It's a small box, takes one minute to set up and one minute to pack away, and around 10 to 15 minutes to play, which makes it an ideal filler game for most groups. However, sometimes there are no good moves to make and that can be a little frustrating for some players. And you can also be on the receiving end of a big explosion and end up in a position where it's very difficult to recover from to win. As mentioned, this would be a good replacement for Uno and other popular short duration family games. And for another quick card game, but with a much less family friendly theme, check out Kitten Casualty. Hello and welcome to Fog of Love in about three minutes. It is a game for two players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around one to two hours. It's a reasonably simple game. There's something in the air tonight. Could it be love or simply regret? In Fog of Love, you play two star-crossed people who are testing out their new blossoming relationship. They will have to get to know each other, face trials and challenges, and argue over whether or not to adopt a puppy. Will your new couple go the distance, or was this a love that was never supposed to be? Winning this game is slightly odd. There are destiny cards that control whether you win or not, but the game is less about winning and more about the story that you tell during the game. Narrative Driven. Fog of Love is a shared narrative game where players share in building a story. Player turn. At the start of the game, you will collaboratively build your characters. In our sample game, Steph created Chad Bankley, a stern merchant banker with piercing eyes and an alluring musk, whereas I created Pastor Steve, a hip, liberal, tattooed youth group leader. Each character has an occupation, as well as three defining traits. You also have personal goals that you are working towards that you keep secret from the other player. There are six different personality traits on the board. The top represents a tendency towards that trait, and the bottom an aversion. Your relationship score is the combined value of your tokens in each area. So in this example, Pastor Steve is curious, Chad Bankley is close-minded, and the relationship total is zero. There is also a happiness score that changes during the game for each character. You will have a hand of event cards, 
Each player will alternate playing event cards and resolving their effects. Some require a choice to be made by one player, whereas others require a choice from both players. Each action can result in changes to your personality. Other actions give your partner a choice on what they will do. At all times, you are encouraged to narrate and roleplay your character in these scenes. And after a certain number of cards is played, the chapter advances and new plot elements are introduced. Cards come in three types, sweet, serious and dramatic. Play continues as you progress through the chapters, encountering events and changing your personality and happiness scores. Finally, at the end of the game you compare your secret goals to the final personality scores. In this case, domineering Chad Bankley seemed quite happy in the relationship, but poor Steve was not. Chad plays a dominant destiny, but Steve can't play a destiny card. The game is over, and they have broken up. Why would you like this game? Fog of Love covers ground not normally travelled in board gaming, that of the romantic comedy. If that topic interests you, I certainly recommend checking out the game, as it is heavily rooted in the tropes of that genre. The game benefits a lot from having buy-in. You need to be able to play the character and laugh along with the game as you get into a bunch of wacky predicaments. The game is also nicely produced and the cards, chips and counters all have a nice look to them. Best thing about the game is that it's pretty damned inclusive. Despite the blue and pink pieces, the cards seem to work for any two person relationship. However, this is a romantic comedy game and if that theme does nothing for you, you'll likely bounce off the game hard. The game is also quite busy with all the traits to keep track of, and the cards you get can be quite random at times, leading the story to feel disjointed. I felt the mechanics got in the way of the storytelling, which I feel is the core of the game. There's not a lot of games like Fog of Love, but if you like group storytelling game, you could try your hand at Once Upon a Time. Hello and welcome to Ghost Stories in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is around 60 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. In mythic China, a village is in serious danger. Wu Feng, a malicious and evil necromancer, has summoned wave after wave of malicious spirits and ghosts to destroy the village. Only a small group of Taoist monks, represented by the players in the game, stand between Wu Feng and his goal of annihilating the village. In order to win this game, you must defeat one of the incarnations of Wu Feng. At the start of the game, you randomly select one of the 10 possible incarnations and put it in the bottom 10 cards of a deck. Once it is defeated, you win the game. You lose if every player is eliminated, if three of the village tiles become haunted, or if Wu Feng is still active when the deck runs out. Cooperative. Each player is a monk, and you must work together to win. Dice. In order to banish the ghost, you will need to roll dice. Automata. Your opponent in this game is a deck of cards. Player turn. Each player takes their entire turn, then play passes to the next player. On each player's turn, start by checking to see if all three spaces on their individual board are full. If so, that player loses one of their chi tokens. If they ever run out of chi, they are killed and must go to the graveyard. Then, draw the top card from the ghost deck and place it in an available space matching the color shown. Black ghosts go on the current board if possible. If you cannot place a ghost on the matching board, place it somewhere else. Then, if there are any haunters, advance in one space. If they make it to the final space on their track, flip over the next face-up village tile on that line and send the ghost back to its card. The player can then act. They can move one space and then either attempt to banish a ghost or use the ability of a location they are on. In order to banish a ghost, you must roll an equal number of colored icons as shown on the ghost. In this case, three. White icons can count as any color. You can also spend Tau tokens to count as successes, and in this case, because the location has a yellow token on it, that counts as well. If you defeat a ghost, remove it from the board. Location ability include the debuffing one I mentioned before, this one which gets you extra tower tokens, banishing any ghost on the board, and placing a Buddha token to prevent a ghost from spawning. Once you have taken your action, it is the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? First of all, Ghost Stories is hard, and I mean stupidly hard. Even on its lowest difficulty, it is a terribly difficult game to play. So if you want a co-op that will push you and really challenge your group, Ghost Stories might be for you. It's also an excellent solo game where you control all four Taoists. Learning the locations and how to best use their abilities is hugely important and is the difference between doing well and getting badly beaten. Each character also has different abilities and the player boards are double-sided, which opens up new game options. I also really like the look and feel of the game. I know little about Chinese mythology and how accurate the game is to it, but I do like the art and the overall feel of the game. The single best thing about this game is its brutal, unrelenting pace. You never, ever feel in control. However, the game's difficulty makes this an exceptionally unfriendly game for new players, and there really isn't a learning curve. It's hard from turn one. The iconography is also hard to remember, and it's a game that could really have benefited from some player aid cards. And finally, while there is some mitigation for bad rolls in this game, dice plus high difficulty could be very off-putting for some people. 
For a similar play experience, but with more adjustable difficulty, I recommend The Captain is Dead. And for a co-op that is far more friendly to new players, I recommend the classic Pandemic. Hello and welcome to GKR Heavy Hitters in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 2-4 to four players. It has a solo mode, although multiplayer is its focus. Playing time is approximately 2-3 to three hours. This is a moderately mm. complex game. In a dystopian future, mega corporations put on spectacles of giant killer robots fighting each other to act as the bread and roses for the common people. Each player is a pilot, representing one of these sinister mega corporations and piloting a heavy hitter into the arena. Only one team can win, and a lot of collateral damage is expected. Competitive. Players play against each other, either in an all-on-all -all melee or in teams. Card management. Each player has a set of cards that represent the abilities they can use. Cards also represent your heavy hitter's health pool. Area control. Tagging buildings in the game gains you sponsor cards, which are powerful one-off abilities. There are two main ways to win this game. First of all, you can blow up the enemy robots. You can play until all the heavies are defeated, or until the first heavy is defeated. When you take damage, you must discard cards, and once you run out of cards, you are defeated. Once all heavy hitters are defeated, you score points equal to your remaining cards plus your achievements in game. Achievements include demolishing buildings, taking flank or alley shots, and having three support units on the board. Secondly, you can win by being the first player to demolish four buildings in the game. Player turn. Determine who the glory hound is. They are the first player for this round. This is determined by who tagged the most buildings in the previous round. Each player then chooses whether to deploy a support unit, spending two energy if they have a deploy card or four if not. Players move in turn order, spending energy for each space move. Each player secretly chooses attacks, up to one primary and two different secondary attacks. They pay energy for each of these attacks. Overspending on energy causes damage to your heavy hitter. Weapons and support units activate in speed order, shown in the top left of the card. Each weapon has a range. For example, this one is range 1 to 4. Roll 2d6 to hit your target. Heavy hitters are easier to hit than support units, and units in cover are harder to hit. Each attack does damage. Roll an armor save for each damage point. 5 plus for heavies, and 6 plus for support units. Discard a card for each unblocked damage to your heavy hitter, either from your hand or from your deck. Finally, tag one building for each unit you have next to a building. Heavies can remove an opponent's tag. If you have four of your tags on a building, destroy it. Why would you like this game? It's a wonderful cutthroat game with a lot of action mixed in with thoughtful planning and maneuvering. It has a lot of the strengths of a good miniature skirmish game, but with more accessible and friendly rules. It looks wonderful on the table, and the pre-painted figures are of a very high standard. But you will mostly enjoy this game if the idea of fighting your friends in giant killer robots sounds like a good time. The single best thing about the game is the giant killer robots. They look really good, and you just feel like you are piloting a giant death machine. Lining up flanking shots with your massive laser cannon is just great fun. However, the game is not cheap and it's bound to get a lot more content, so price could be a problem for some people. It's also exceptionally cutthroat, and very easy for someone to be ganged up on. People who do not enjoy high levels of player conflict should avoid this. For a similar experience, but much lighter and easier, I recommend King of Tokyo. And if you want more complexity and depth, I recommend War Machine. Hello and welcome to Gloomhaven in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around one to two hours per mission. It's a complicated game. The town of Gloomhaven is surrounded by evil forces. You are an adventurer with your own reasons for coming to Gloomhaven, who has teamed up with like-minded individuals to form a party. Together you will complete your personal goals while uncovering the evil that threatens the town of Gloomhaven. The campaign is made up of a number of scenarios and each scenario has its own objectives cooperative each player is working together to defeat the enemies but each has their own personal goals as well card management your deck of cards represents your powers but also your energy player turn first of all you must decide on a mission to do from the map then you can access that entry in the book and set up the game map accordingly each player will get a private objective that they may complete to get additional upgrades to their character you have a character board and a deck of cards your deck size limit is static for this character it is a 
trade cards. You also have equipment. Some is one use per mission, while others can be refreshed when you rest. On your turn, you will select two cards to play. One card will be the leading card, and its initiative score will determine when you act. You can use the top of one card and the bottom of the other, and you can choose freely which card to use. In this case, we will use Fork Beam to attack two enemies at up to range three with a strength of two. You then turn over cards from your attack modifier deck and apply the results. The first card gives plus two bonus damage, while the second card is a miss. The used cards go in the discard pile, unless they have this icon, in which case they go in your burn pile. Burn cards cannot normally be reclaimed during the scenario. There are loads of potential effects, including ongoing buffs, area effect attacks, heals, looting cards, and fast movement. A card can always be used for two melee attack or two movement as well. The monsters each have their own action decks, stats, and modifier deck. Monsters can be regular or elites. If you are damaged by an attack, you can take it as damage on your dial, burn a card from your hand, or two from your discard pile. If you ever run out of health or cards, you are defeated. You can rest to regain your discards, but you'll have to burn a card each time you do so. There is also this element board which changes during play. Some cards will show an elemental icon, and when they do, you advance that element one space right. Elements can also be spent by cards for bonuses. This one uses a fire and an ice to get extra effects. Some cards allow you to move over enemies and terrain on the board. When enemies are defeated, they drop a coin in their space. You can collect these by ending your turn on them or by using a loot card. At the end of the round, all elements drop one step. Play continues until the scenario goals are complete. Why would you like this game? If you like tactical combat and resource management, this game is excellent at both of those. Every turn is a tough decision about what cards to use and how to use them. There's a huge variety of enemies to face, each requiring a different approach, each character class plays differently, and while I've only seen five classes in play at time of this review, they have all felt incredibly different. We still have this many character boxes to open as well. There are a lot of ways to improve your character, including adding new combat modifier cards to your deck, as well as equipment and action cards. There are also city and road cards that add story elements and random events to each session. And there's just a lot of material, from tile decorations to map parts to the stack of monsters. The best thing about this game is the sheer amount of content it has in the box. With nearly 100 missions, there's an awful lot of game to discover. However, the game is not cheap and you will want to play a lot to get your money's worth, either by playing it solo or finding a regular group. If either of these sound like a problem, it might not be for you. It's also a combat focus game, and while there are story and character elements, the bulk of your time in game is spent fighting monsters. Oh, and there's a lot of icons and effects to learn. If you like the idea of card management and intense gameplay, but don't want to commit to a campaign, check out Mage Knight. And if you want a campaign that's more story driven, try Near and Far. Gloomhaven, it's bigger on the inside. Hello and welcome to Heroes of Tenefer in about three minutes. Prototype copy used. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 60 to 90 minutes. It's a reasonably simple game. In this game, you are the Heroes of Tenefer, a Dungeons and Dragons like fantasy world. Your task is to fight through a series of dungeons to gather experience and power in order to defeat the boss at the end. At the start of the game, you choose one of the four bosses to fight. In the final battle, you must defeat all four versions of the boss, one after the other. When the last one is defeated, you win. Cooperative. Players win and lose this game as a group. Deck building. When monsters are defeated, they become cards that are added to your deck. Push your luck. The main decisions you will have in this game is whether to play your hand or to draw a new one. Player turn. At the start of the game, set up 10 dungeons and reward cards, with each dungeon having 4 monsters in it and a reward card beside it. You then choose a hero, take their skill card and 12 starting cards. When it is your turn, you choose which dungeon to explore and fight the face-up monster in it. The monster needs a certain amount of damage done to it, as indicated by the number of players at the top of the card. Each player then plays cards in order. You draw 3 cards and then choose to either play all of them in any order or discard them to draw three more. You must play all three of your cards during your turn. Each player acts until enough damage is done to defeat the monster. If so, the player who struck the killing blow adds the monster to their discard pile. If all players have played and the monster is still alive, you lose that encounter. You can choose to continue with the dungeon if you defeated the monster, and if you defeat all four monsters, you claim the reward card. Or you can leave and reshuffle your discards. If you leave voluntarily, advance the timer one step. However, if you failed to kill the monster, you are booted out of the dungeon and you advance the token two steps. If the token reaches the end, you lose the game. 
Why would you like this game? The game is easy to learn and the rules are not complicated. They can adequately be summarized on one page. There are quite a few monsters and skills in the game and you will not see the same things each time you play. This game would probably best suit a group that wants an activity that is not too mentally taxing while they socialize. The best thing about the game is the end game where you have a lot of variable power cards and timing of how you play them matters. However, this game is very light on decision making. If you get into this thinking it's a tactical deck builder where you can coordinate strikes and combos with other players, you will be disappointed by it. It is a push your luck game and the main decision you make in that game is whether to play your hand or to draw a new one. And at the start of the game, when you only have ones, zeros and one class card in your deck, it can feel like the game is playing you. The game is also too long for something so simplistic and a lot of the game feels like busy work. For a deeper, more tactical fantasy team deck builder, I recommend Dragonfire. And for a similar experience, but quicker and with more decision making, I recommend One Deck Dungeon. Heroes of Tenethir, play or discard? Hello and welcome to Hostage Negotiator in about 3 minutes. This is a solo only game. Playing time is under 30 minutes. It's a relatively simple game. It's late in the evening when you get the call. Someone in the city has taken hostages and a siege is underway. As the top hostage negotiator in town, it is your responsibility to defuse the situation, to get the hostages out safely, and to arrest or eliminate the hostage taker. The lives of many innocent people depend on the decisions you take next. You win the game by having all hostages released, and by capturing or eliminating the abductor. You lose the game if time runs out, the abductor escapes, or more than half of the hostages are killed. Card management. Each turn you must buy a hand of cards using points earned. Managing these purchases are key to winning. Dice. Most actions outcomes are decided by dice rolls. Player turn. Each turn represents a conversation with the abductor, and the player can end the turn by their choice, or when they run out of cards, or when the abductor hangs up the phone. Each hostage taker is different, and you will have a different set of demands and starting numbers for threat level and the hostages is taken. You will choose a card to play from your hand and roll a number of dice equal to the number shown in the threat display. In this case, two. Shields are successes and blanks are failures. Compare your roll to the card and apply the effects. In this case, we reveal a demand, then discard the card. In order to buy new cards, you need conversation points. So we play a small talk card to get some. The roll is a blank and a four. And fours can be turned into successes if you discard two cards. If we don't do that, the abductor will hang up and end the conversation. Finally, we play another small talk for more conversation points and end the turn. Next, we can buy new cards for the next turn. We keep the one card we held and take a look at the possible options. Each card costs the value shown in its bottom right, and you cannot buy cards that were used this turn. Cards can do a lot of different things, like lowering the threat rating to make it easier to deal with the abductor, modifying dice rolls, or making extraction attempts to rescue hostages. You then flip a terror card and deal with its consequences. Once the terror deck runs out, you will reach a pivotal event and have one last conversation. If you fail there, you lose the game. Why would you like this game? Hostage Negotiator is a great game to occupy 15 minutes or so. It sets up quickly and plays rapidly. It's not the deepest game, but it has enough variety to be replayable and enough strategy that it feels like your decisions matter. Hostage Negotiator comes with three different abductors and they all have their own playstyle and story. The game is also very portable, which makes it an excellent travel game. And there's also Crime Wave, which is the original game's deluxe version. It comes with a far bigger and more robust board, three more abductors, more threat cards, a second set of conversation cards, and dividers to organize all those cards. There are also seven more abductor packs available, each with their own unique scenarios and rules, and I still haven't played all of them. And while the core box is fine for what it is, it really is the extra content that adds a depth to this game. The single best thing about the game is the individual abductors and how differently they play. For example, Edward Quinn in particular is a tragic story, as he's just trying to get his sick kid health care. However, while the game has some mechanics to help mitigate bad dice rolls, a run of bad luck can completely ruin your chances in the game, leading to a spiral you cannot recover from. Its short playtime may also mean you burn through the content quickly and tire of it. And most importantly, if you don't like the core system, no amount of extra content, abductors or tweaks will change that. But if the idea of playing a short solo game appeals to you, but Hostage Negotiator isn't for you, I'd recommend checking out One Deck Dungeon. Hello and welcome to Kitten Casualty in about three minutes. This game is part of our campaign to promote New Zealand made games. Promotional copy is used. It is a game for two to five players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 15 minutes. It's a really simple game. Have you ever wondered if people with lots of cats are secretly collecting them in order to sacrifice them to their dark overlord in order to mystically murder their rivals? No? Yeah, well, me either. But that's the premise of this game. 
Each of you are building a legion of kittens in order to destroy your rivals. There will be mayhem, murder and betrayal, but only one person will stand victorious upon a pile of shattered kitten bones. The winner of this game is the last player standing. Players can be eliminated in two different ways. First, you can sacrifice 500 points worth of kittens to the Dark Overlord and eliminate a player of your choice. Most kittens are worth 50 points, but some are worth zero and others up to 150. You can also assemble all the parts of the Kitten Lord and discard them to eliminate a player of your choice. Competitive, only one player can win the game. Player Elimination Once you are eliminated, you are no longer part of the game. Card Management Choosing what cards to play and when to play them is the key to victory. Player Turn Each player starts with five cards, and there are different types of cards. Kittens, which are played in front of you in order to be sacrificed later. Cards that give you power-ups. Cards that attack other players. Cards that allow you to steal off other players and parts of the Kitten Lord. Each turn you will draw one card, and then you can play up to three cards. Kittens go in front of you, as do parts of the Kitten Lord. Any card in front of you is in play and can be targeted by other cards. All used cards go to the discard pile. If you ever run out of cards in your hand, on your next turn you redraw up to five. So there's a real incentive to play cards instead of holding on to them. If you are eliminated, all your cards go into the discard pile. Each player alternates drawing and playing up to three cards a turn until everyone but one player is eliminated. That's the end of the game. Why would you like this game? Kitten Casualty is a very fast-paced, super simple filler game designed for an audience that doesn't mind that the winning of this game requires you to sacrifice kittens to a Dark Overlord. The game takes very little time to set up and pack away, and the box is incredibly small, so it's highly portable. Here's the size of Imperial, for any viewers from the USA or from the 19th century. There's a lot of variety in the effect cards in this game, and numerous dirty tricks that can be played on your friends. Plus there's an awful lot of different kittens in the deck. The single best thing about the game is the card quality. Not the art itself, but the way the cards were made. They're possibly the best quality cards I've seen in a game. However, this game is pretty brutal and horribly unfair. It relies on player elimination as a core mechanic, and that's something many people loathe. And the theme would certainly be off-putting to some, as sacrificing kittens to a satanic figure is not everyone's idea of a good time. The elephant in the room with this game is the massive hit, Exploding Kittens. I think Kitten Casualty is a better game with more decisions in it, but Exploding Kittens has better art. But they're similar enough that if you like one, you'll probably like the other. And if the idea of sacrificing kittens is not for you, but you want a new filler game that's more family friendly, check out Flaming Pyramids. Hello and welcome to Klondike Rush in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for two to five players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around an hour. It's a moderately complex game. The mad rush for Klondike Gold is on. Four major mining companies are competing for the best real estate. Can you invest wisely in these companies and realize the best return on investment? And what is that hulking mass moving off in the distance? The winner is the player with the most wealth at the end of the game. The game ends once all mines have been placed or all players have run out of cash. Competitive. Only one player can have the most money and win this game. Auctions. One round auctions are the cornerstone of the game. Set collection. Both deeds and goods need to be collected in sets. Player turn. At the start of the game, each player is given $30 and a profit card. Each turn, the active player will turn over a company card for players to bid on. Each company card is for one of the four mining companies, as noted by the color on the card, and will have a mixture of shares, order crates, and mines on it. The auction starts with the active player and proceeds clockwise. For example, the active player bids five. The next player bids six. The third player is broke so does not bid, and the fourth player passes. Auctions only go one round, so the second player wins the card and claims the order and mine. The active player can then place mines. In this case, they have two red mines. The first mine is placed here and costs $2, as shown by the number on the connecting line from the nearest red mine. They also claim the moose token. The second mine costs the same and also grants them a moose. Fortunately, that player had an order for moose, so spends those tokens to claim $7. If a mine of any color occupies both spots on a line, the cost of that line is reduced to one, so placing a green mine here only costs $4. Whenever a mine is placed, raise the share value of that company by one step. The active player can also use their profit card, and for each share in a company, they gain the company's value in dollars. So with one share in the green company, 
company, that is $4. Play continues until the company deck runs out or no players have any money left and have used their profit cards. At the end of the game, players collect money as though using their profit card again, and the player with the most sighting tokens claims a $25 reward. The winner is the player with the most money in hand. Why would you like this game? Klondike Rush is an unusual game, an auction game that really rewards being thrifty on occasion and bold at others. The board evolves in interesting ways, and timing your purchases so you can get the best placements in order to fill orders takes a lot of skill. Chaining together placements and orders can be very satisfying. The starting city can also be placed anywhere on the map, creating a different layout each time. The optional last bid cards also add an extra tactical element to the one round bidding mechanic. The best thing about this game is the single round auction. It keeps the game moving at a good pace. However, once you run out of money and use your profit card, there is little you can do but watch the other players continue to play. This can lead to a period of play where one player has money and no one else does, and they can simply get every remaining card for $1 each. Also, while the mine company values fluctuate throughout the game, they can very easily all end on the same value. This makes it feel like those early purchasing decisions really didn't matter. And the Gold Rush Yeti sighting theme is pretty thin, especially compared to Red Raven's high standards in this regard. For a richer, more thematic game from Red Red Raven, check out Empires of the Void 2 or The Ancient World. Or if you're a fan of Gold Rush on the Discovery Channel like I am and want a thematic gold mining game, check out Pay Dirt. Klondike, don't rush or you'll end up broke. Hello and welcome to Last Friday in about three minutes. It is a game for two to six players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 30 minutes per chapter, so two hours for a full game. It is a reasonably simple game. It's summertime at Camp Apache, and a group of camp counselors have arrived to set up the camp. There will be drinking, pranks, flirting, skinny dipping, and of course, murder. The camp counselors figure out something is wrong when they find the camp owners brutally murdered. There is a masked killer on the loose, and now is the time for running, screaming, tripping and falling, and quite likely a fire axe to the skull. One player is the masked killer, while the others play the five counselors. This game is played in four chapters, each with its own unique rules and victory conditions. In chapter one, the counselors Counselors are on the run and need to find the keys to cabins to lock themselves in before they are killed. In Chapter 2, the counselors fight back and must hunt down the killer and defeat them. The player who defeats the killer, or the one who comes closest to doing so, becomes the predestined hero for later chapters. Chapter 3 has the resurrection of the killer and a renewed massacre. The predestined must be protected at all costs. And in the final chapter, the predestined hero must land the fatal blow on the killer to finally defeat them. Team play. One player is the killer, and the others must work together to defeat them. Hidden movement. The killer's movements are kept hidden from the counselors for much of the game. Player turn. Here is a look at the board of the game. You will notice that some spaces have numbers on them and some have white dots. Counselors move from white dot to white dot and the killer moves on the numbered spaces. The killer chooses a start location in secret and records it on their sheet. Every time they move, they record the number behind the screen. Every three turns, they must place their killer token on the board to show their current location when they are being hunted or their location three moves ago when they are the hunter. Each chapter lasts for 15 turns. In chapters 1 and 3, if the killer makes a move that would have them cross over a counselor, that counselor is killed and a body is placed in their space. That player is out of the game until the next chapter, where they get a new counselor. In chapter 2, if a counselor passes over the killer, they are removed and the chapter ends. That player becomes a predestined. And in the final chapter, the killer cannot move over the other counselors, who act as blockers. And if the predestined moves over the killer, the counselor wins. If they fail to catch the killer in 15 turns, the killer wins. There are various tokens and skills the counselors can use to help their cause, such as bear traps that can slow the killer down and lanterns that reveal the killer if they move past them. But the killer has their own skills, such as invisibility, which makes it so the killer does not have to reveal, or plot twist, which can extend a chapter by an extra turn. Players alternate turns between counselor and killer until the chapter is over. Doing well in one chapter helps you in later ones by earning you rewards. Why would you like this game? While this is not a licensed Friday the 13th game, it is very much a Friday the 13th game. Chapters 1 and 2 are very much much like the first film, where the killer stalks people before being hunted down and killed. Chapters 3 and 4 echo Fridays 2, 3 and 4, with the killer going on a rampage before finally being defeated by a chosen one. And even if you are not a fan of horror movies, it's still an excellent hidden movement game, with the chapters really changing up the dynamic and flow of the game. Going from hunter to hunted requires a real shift in your thinking. And the chapters also help build a story, with the consequences from one building to the next. The single best thing about the game is that all counselor communication is open. You can make as many 
plans as a councillors as you want. The noise travels far across the lake and the killer can hear them. However, the game must have all five councillors in play, which leads to some weirdness about who controls who in all but two and six player games. The chapters also take a bit of getting used to and you will likely have to recheck the rules for them on your first few plays. It would really have benefited from some reference cards for each player to summarise each chapter. Letters from Whitechapel is considered by many the best pure hidden movement game around and focuses on real world killer Jack the Ripper. And for another hidden movement game with a lot more depth and complexity, I recommend Fury of Dracula. Hello and welcome to Lords of Hellas in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It is a complex game. In ancient Greece, it is a time of gods, monsters, and most importantly, heroes. But this isn't the ancient Greece of tradition. Here, heroes wield arcane technologies and battle against cybernetically enhanced monstrosities. You will build monuments to the gods, wage wars against your fellow heroes, go on quests, wield powerful artifacts, and god-given magic. But only one player can be the true hero of Greece. There are four distinct ways to win this game. First, you must control two full regions on the board. Secondly, you control five different regions that contain a temple. You can also win by defeating three different monsters in heroic combat. And finally, you can win if you control a region with a fully built monument after three turns of it being built. Competitive. Only one player can be the true hero of Greece. Area control. Having armies on the board and controlling regions is very important. Card management. Your combat cards are important for both battling monsters and fighting wars. Player turn. On your turn, you can take any and all of the basic actions, and then one advanced action. The basic actions can be done in any order, but the advanced action is always last. The basic actions are move your hero as many regions as their speed score. If you're in a region with a quest, you're able to start that quest or move further along a quest. You can move a number of armies equal to your leadership score one region. You can activate artifacts, but once they are used, they do not recharge for a while. And you can send a priest to a monument and gain the associated advantages. Once you are done with your basic actions, you take your special action. Each special action, once used, is covered up and cannot be used again for a while. Prepare allows you to heal injuries to your hero, gain combat cards, or recruit armies near your hero. Hunt allows you to attack a monster in your region. The combat is quite involved, but in essence you have to play specific combat cards to damage each part of the monster and then defend its counterattacks. If you take too many injuries, you are forced to end the fight. Winning gives you major rewards. Usurp allows your hero to take over a region as long as they have the favor token of that region. Favor tokens are gained for completing quests and killing monsters. Build Temple allows you to place a temple in a temple region, which may trigger a blessing draft. You draw a number of blessing cards equal to the number of players plus one. Choose one and then pass them to the next player until all players have chosen one. Recruit allows you to put more troops on the board at cities you control and March allows you to move all your armies from one region to another. Finally, Build Monument adds one stage to a monument of your choice and resets the game a little. All artifacts refresh, special actions are renewed, and then an event is drawn and the monsters act. Once you have done your basic actions and a special action, it is the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? I'm a sucker for good looking games with great miniatures, and Lords of Hellas is suitably impressive on the table. But that wasn't the reason I backed it on Kickstarter. Where this game really shines is the variable win conditions and the action selection system. At any time, all four victory conditions are open and different players will be pushing for different goals. So you need to maintain an awareness of what other players are doing and a flexibility in how you react. The Blessing Draft, as well as the use of priests to gain powers from monuments, allow you to tailor your hero and develop your playstyle in the game organically. The single best thing about the game is the monster fighting system. It's a heck of a lot of fun and genuinely feels like you are this hero of ancient times taking down a big bad critter. However, it's not cheap and there's a heck of a lot of additional content coming out for this game, so getting it all is going to cost a fair bit of money. Money. There's also a lot of moving parts in the game and keeping track of them takes some getting used to. Its openness and multiple ways to win could be overwhelming to some players. If you like the ideas of Lords of Hellas, but want a game with less conflict and more focus on economy, I recommend Scythe. And for a much simpler game with a similar theme and ideas, I recommend Risk Godstorm. Hello and welcome to Machikoro in about three minutes. All pictures are of the deluxe edition that comes with the Harbour expansion. It is a game for two to five players. There is no official solo mode. Playing time is around 30 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. Welcome to Machikoro, the latest building development in Japan. You have been placed in charge of the city and it is up to you to build the best and greatest city possible. Carefully planning your city and keeping an eye on what your rivals are up to are the key to becoming the one and only mayor of Machikoro. The winner of this game is the player that finishes building all of the landmarks in their city. The first player to do so wins automatically and the game ends immediately. Competitive. Only one player can have the best city. 
dice. All resources in this game are generated off the roll of dice. Engine Builder. To succeed, you will need to build city upgrades that work well together. Player turn. You start the game with only two buildings, a wheat field and a bakery. Each building has a number above it. If that number is rolled on the dice, the text on the card triggers. Blue cards, like the wheat field, work whenever any player rolls that number. Green cards, like the bakery, only work when you roll that number. Red cards allow you to take money off other players whenever they roll that number, and purple cards allow you to take money off players whenever you roll that number. You start off able to only roll one die, but the train station landmark, when built, allows you to roll two. There is a marketplace with 10 different cards you can buy. On your turn, you will roll the die, in this case a four is rolled and three coins are collected from the bank. If you had rolled a two, you would collect one coin from each bakery for a total of two coins. You can then buy a building like this forest for three coins and take it into your city. You then replace the building card. If you draw a duplicate, add it to the pile and keep drawing until you find a new building. Instead of buying a new building, you can also build a landmark, paying the cost as shown. Flip the landmark over to show it has been built. Landmarks do not need to be purchased in order. Play then passes to the next player who rolls the dice. And remember that your green and red cards work on their turns, so keep an eye on their rolls. The game ends once you build your final landmark. Why would you like this game? Machikoro is a great family-friendly game and it'll be a great addition to a family game night. It's easy to pick up and play, and while it requires a lot of dice rolls, there are some engine building elements and card interactions that could hold the interest of serious gamers, at least for a couple of games. I'm using the deluxe box and the harbor rules for this explanation, as it's the only version that I've played. And this version comes with a lot of cards. And I mean a lot. The single best thing about the game is that it's really inoffensive and good for almost any crowd, except perhaps really hard-bitten wargamers. However, its simplicity will be the biggest issue for a lot of people. It's not a deep game, and it won't take a veteran gamer too long to discover strong strategies that mitigate the piles of dice rolls. And the dice rolls are another issue. When playing this game, you can feel like you're at the mercy of the dice a lot and can spend a fair few turns cursing the lack of helpful dice rolls. If you want to step up and play a more challenging and complex city building game, check out Suburbia. And if you want a different sort of city building game for family game night and a little less competition, try Between Two Cities. Hello and welcome to Makana Arcana in about three minutes. Prototype copy used. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around two to three hours if you live that long. It's a complex game. You are deep underground in some lost and forsaken tunnels. Dark cyclopean shapes stagger towards you and the light you are holding recoils from them. You have only your wit and your steampunk technical expertise to protect you. Can you survive this dark place long enough to create the means to defend yourself or will you just be food for the old ones? The game is played in chapters and each chapter will require a certain task to be completed to advance. The final chapter takes place on a special tile. Cooperative. Each player is working together to overcome the evils in this underground. Until one of them dies, that is. Then they get to control the monsters. Dice. This game features a lot of dice rolls, but the dice are designed with low variance. Player turn. Each player gets a number of action points equal to their stamina. It costs one stamina per square moved on the board. There are numerous different locations on each board that you can use with stamina. They include the chest, where you can draw two items and keep one. The recharge station, where you can roll this dice to get back stamina or health. The event space, which allows you to draw a blessing. The workshop, which allows you to draw three cards and keep one. You can also discard items to keep additional cards drawn. The trap space, which does damage to all units on the great tiles. The exploding barrel, which explodes when you shoot it, and you can also seal doors to slow the monsters down. Killing monsters and using locations gets you essence. Essence can be used in the place of health, or can be used to activate chapter spaces like this. Chapter spaces are frequently used to advance to the next part of the story. Once all players have acted, you roll to spawn monsters for each player. This is the result of a d10 roll based on the current monster spawn number here. As the game progresses, the monster level will increase and the monsters will get tougher. You then roll for curses, but only once for the whole group. Monsters will act and try to attack you if possible. All units have armor and will scores. In combat, you'll roll dice shown on your attack and try to beat your opponent's defense score, whether it's will or armor. A successful hit does one damage. When a monster loses its last health, it is defeated and the attacker gains one essence. There can only 
ever be a two by two grid of tiles in play. So if you move in a way that would break that rule, the other tiles and all monsters on them are removed. Continue playing until you're all defeated or you finish the scenario. Why would you like this game? First of all, the game is hard and I mean really hard. If you like games that are utterly remorseless and punish mistakes brutally, you might enjoy this. This is a prototype version so the production game will look a lot more polished. There's an awful lot of blessings and curses in the game which should help with making it replayable. There's also a lot of equipment as well which is introduced in tiers as the chapters advance and this is just the weapon cards. There are weapons, apparel, artifact and consumable cards. The single best thing about this game is the crafting system as you can cobble together different components and build yourself unique custom kit and that's really satisfying when you get a good piece of gear together. However this might be the least casual friendly board game I have ever played. The rules are not incredibly complex but the gameplay is so unforgiving that it's hard to teach without telling other people exactly what to do. Also if you pick this game up and expect it to be another descent style dungeon crawler where you fight the baddies and win you'll find the gameplay very difficult as standing and fighting normally means standing and dying. Weirdly the game this most reminds me of is a PC game Darkest Dungeon. They share similar tone and murderous playstyles. and if you want a grander experience with a similar feel and have a lot of spare cash you can also check out Kingdom Death Monster Machina Arcana the darkest of dungeons. Hello and welcome to Mage Knight in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a very good solo mode. Its playing time is about two to three hours. Mage Knight is a very complex mm. game. So complex I'll barely be able to touch on all the systems in three minutes. In Mage Knight you are a powerful wizard on a quest. Your objective is to raise some cities and gain power and infamy along the way. You will fight monsters, learn magic, gain powerful abilities, discover artifacts and even raise an army. Mage Knight can be played competitively or cooperatively. Card Management Each player has a deck of cards that represent their abilities. Almost all actions in Mage Knight are card driven. Character Development This game has many ways to improve your character. From buying spells and abilities with influence, to recruiting armies and gaining loot, through to leveling up and gaining extra abilities. Winning the game There are several scenarios in Mage Knight, but the most common way to win is by destroying cities. Cities are very tough encounters that require either a very well-tuned and experienced mage to defeat, or in some cases, a group of them. Player turn. See if it is day or night according to the scenario. Day and night determine which initiative cards are used for that turn and has an impact on movement and how mana is used. Roll dice for the source. This is a collective resource of mana that players share. Select an initiative card. Yellow for daytime and black for nighttime. Draw cards as shown on your character icon. This starts at 5. Play cards to move, attack, recruit using influence, and other special effects. Cards will have a numerical value telling you what they do. For example, this one is influence 2. They will also show a colored icon. This is the effect you can use if you power the card with mana from the source or crystals from your inventory. Doing so makes this card influence 4. Adding the red card increases the combined influence to 6 allowing the player to purchase a 5 cost unit. If the player had 1 red mana, they could boost the total influence to 9 and buy any of the cards. Cards can also be played sideways to add 1 to any value. You play cards and move, fight and explore, until you either pass or run out of cards. Then you redraw your hand to full unless your deck is empty. Once all players have passed, the game proceeds to the next day or night. There is a lot to Mage Knight, such as combat, encounters, wounds and healing, but to give you an idea of its complexity, here is my play of cards for taking out a low level city. Why would you like this game? Mage Knight is frequently voted the best solo game on the market by board game fans, and it's not surprising. The game is a deep and complicated puzzle that will never be solved the same way twice. Timing, planning, card and resource management, and some audacity is required to excel at the game. If you want to be challenged mentally and play a game that rewards analysis and problem solving, Mage Knight could be good for you. The single best thing about the game is the city sieges at the end. In order to win them you have to be well prepared and, and when that plan comes together it is very very satisfying. But there are reasons you might not like this game. It's exceptionally complex and there is less of a learning curve and more of a learning cliff. It is a game prone to analysis paralysis and overthinking by some players. In certain groups that could lead to a lot of time spent waiting for someone else's turn to finish. The theme is also thin. For a fantasy adventure game it's light on adventure elements. If you're looking for a fantasy romp full of encounters and action, Mage Knight might not be for you. For another brain burner that requires a lot of thinking, I recommend Spirit Island. For a much lighter, more story-driven game of character development, exploring, and encounters, you could try Fallout. Hello and welcome to Martians, a story of civilization, in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. 
It is a complex game. It is the early days of Martian settlement, and you're one of the corporations backing those first steps. Before you can even consider such grand goals as terraforming the planet, you must first build the core infrastructure needed to simply survive on Mars. Failure to provide food, medicine, and oxygen for your colonists will result in some rather dire consequences. The winner of this game depends on which of the many scenarios you choose to play, and whether you are playing competitively or cooperatively. But generally, in order to win, you must complete the objectives of the scenario, and if the game is semi-cooperative or competitive, you must have contributed the most happiness to the colony. Martians features four different play modes, solo, fully cooperative, semi-cooperative, and competitive. Worker placement. The core mechanic of this game is placing workers and getting their associated benefits. Player turn. Before taking actions, you may be required to do some other things first. In this round, they are draw an event, turn over a weather card, and collect power. You turn over an event card from the turn stack matching the turn you're in and follow its instructions. Then flip over a new weather card from the deck. Each player then collects power, modified by the number of power plants they have and the weather. As this weather card says plus one energy for wind plants, they generate three instead of two. Most actions on the board require power, so generating power is incredibly important. One key point of difference in this game is that you don't just place a worker in your turn. You have three time units and can place a worker and do multiple actions. For example, if I place here to build and have the components, I can do all three actions for three time. It costs you one time to pull all your workers off the board. There are many action spaces you can use. Some allow you to gain resources, process basic resources into advanced ones, and others to gain upgrades to your corporation. For example, the Moxie generator allows you to spend one time and one power to remove one oxygen demand and increase happiness by two. The education center allows you to spend two dollars to gain an assistant or an expert. And the excavation region allows you to mine for regolith and water, and then move the mining truck, revealing what resources are available for later excavations. Once you have acted, place a colonist marker to show you are done, and then play moves on. Next turn, the player to your left will act first. Why would you like this game? First of all, the four play modes are designed as part of the game and don't feel bolted on. So you can play this game as a friendly co-op experience or as a ruthless competitive game and it works well as both. Competitive mode adds extra objectives and challenges, but doesn't change the core gameplay. It's also a very deep and challenging worker placement game with a lot to pick apart and discover. There are many options in regard to what recruits, technology and plants you can upgrade your corporation with, and how much emphasis you put on that over basic survival makes this game a tricky one to optimize for. It is very much a game that gets better and better on repeated plays. The single best thing about this game are the scenarios, and they change up the game and add in new events, increasing replayability in an already deep game. However, the English language rulebook is widely considered one of the worst. It's a real nightmare to figure out the game, but thankfully there is much advice on BGG and improved copies of the rulebook available there. And even once you figure the game out, it's still at the heavy end of the worker placement genre. I would not recommend it to people new to gaming. If you want to zoom in even closer to the lives of the first astronauts on Mars, I recommend First Martians. And if you want to play a game with a far broader and wider scope, I recommend Terraforming Mars. Hello and welcome to Maximum Apocalypse in about three minutes. It is a game for one to six players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is around 60 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. Something terrible happened to the world, plunging it into a chaotic post-apocalyptic nightmare. Some say it was nuclear war, others climate change, and Bob the Fireman says it was aliens. Whatever it was, they are out there, somewhere. And this noisy, gas-guzzling band seems to have gotten their attention. It's time to gear up and go get what you need to survive. At the start of the game, you will select one of the many missions available to play. Each one comes with its own setup and special rules for how to win, but they normally require a certain amount of fuel be brought back to the van as well as another objective. You also choose which one of the enemy groups you will face, which includes zombies, mutants, robots, and aliens. You lose if all your characters die before completing the objective. Cooperative. You are a team working together to complete a shared goal. Card management. Each player has their own deck of cards with unique abilities. Running out of cards means you die. Player turn. Once you have set up the board and sorted out the scavenge cards as directed on the mission card, each player chooses a character, draws four cards, one enemy card, and starts off at the van. At the beginning of the mission, all locations aside from the van start face down. Before you act, roll 2d6 and place a monster token at any locations rolled. If you are in one of those 
locations, a monster appears in front of you. Then, draw a card. You have four actions. Drawing another card is one action. You can move to an adjacent location, and if it is face down, flip it over and reveal it. If a location has a monster token on it, you will need to roll under your stealth score to avoid them. Otherwise, draw as many monsters as there are tokens and place them in front of you. You can scavenge at a location that has a scavenge icon. You can keep any gear you draw. You can play a gear card to the table in front of you. Gear frequently comes with ammunition or fuel, which represents limited uses. And you have a limit of how much gear you can carry at any one time. You can play a card from your hand for its special effect. And you can take other actions, like shooting your guns at monsters in range. Monsters will normally take a few hits to take down, so keep track of any damage done to them. Once your four actions are complete, you increase your hunger score by one. If your hunger ever gets to six, you start taking damage. You can reduce hunger using food or some other special cards. Finally, all the enemies in front of you damage you. If the total damage exceeds your health, you are eliminated. Play continues until either the objective is complete or you are all dead. Why would you like this game? There's a lot to like in this game. It's a good co-op game that has easy to scale difficulty and it's a solid solo experience, especially if you don't mind playing multi-handed. The rules are pretty straightforward and easy to teach to new players. The decks are also really neat as well, with each player having their own character with their own strengths and weaknesses. For example, the Gunslinger is amazing at dealing damage, while the Surgeon heals people and has powerful team buffs. The single best thing about this game is that you can change the setting. Four different enemy types come in the core game, and the expansions will add a bunch more. However, the rulebook is not great, and while this game is fine to teach once you know the game, the rulebook makes that first game more annoying than it should be. It also takes a little long to set up, as you have to configure the salvage decks and find the exact right tiles for each scenario. For a very different post-apocalyptic experience that's less about fighting, and more about survival, you could try Salvation Road. And if you really like the idea of custom deck characters in a co-op game, I can recommend checking out Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello and welcome to Mega Land in about three minutes. Review copy used. It is a game for two to five players. It has no solo mode. Playing time is around 15 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. Coins are life. Coins are everything. It's time to run the maze, dodge the monsters, and take all the treasures that aren't nailed down. And if they are nailed down, fix bring a crowbar. So mash that jump button, run the level, and look out for killer rabbits. You gotta get them coins. The game ends once a player gains 20 or more coins. If more than one player does that, the winner is the player with the most coins. Competitive. Only one player can win this game. Push your luck. Deciding whether to quit and take your rewards or push on and risk losing it all is key to this game. Player turn. Set up the game with the six basic buildings and seven more buildings of your choice. There are 17 to choose from, so you can mix them up freely. At the start of each round, everyone places their character on the level board. Our character, the crazy beard guy, has six health and two jump markers. Turn over a level card. This one does one damage as shown here. We could jump the monster using a jump token, but we choose not to. We also get one treasure. Each player then chooses to stay or quit in turn order. We all push on. The next level is empty and we all claim another treasure. The third level is scary and it would do three damage. We use a jump token to avoid that. The other players who did not have jump tokens choose to quit at this time, taking the treasures they have earned. We continue encountering this chest card, which is worth two treasure tokens. You keep turning over cards and resolving them until you quit or lose all your health. If you lose all your health, you also lose all the treasures you accumulated. Once everyone has run the level, you spend the treasures you gained. Buildings cost a number of different treasure cards Cards equal to their cost. So one card for this building, but six different cards for this one. Buildings have many different effects, from static victory points, to victory points gained when you do something in game, bonuses when other people do something, or bonuses gained each time you finish a level. You can also buy additional hearts with matching treasures, with an increasing cost. Finally, you must discard all unspent treasure except for one card for each building you own. If someone gained 20 or more coins, the game is over. If not, move the first player token along, shuffle the level deck, and run it again. Why would you like this game? Mega Land is fast and frantic and the game is over in next to no time. It makes a really good filler game or one for a younger audience. The level deck is quite small and you know the exact probabilities of cards turning up each time, so there is a lot less guesswork than some other push your luck games. The treasure cards also come in set probabilities, so you can easily see which ones are common or rare. The large amount of buildings will shake up the strategies each time you play a little. The insert is great and everything packs away nicely, and like all Red Raven games, the art is 
wonderful. The best thing about this game is that it moves quickly and doesn't overstay its welcome. If you lose a game, well, you can reset and play again in moments. However, Megaland is, at its core, a very basic game built around a single mechanic. Its strength as a light filler game will mean that it won't hold the attention of gamers looking for something meatier. It also has a problem with runaway leaders, but due to the game's length, that's not as big a problem as it could be for other games. If you love the art style of Megaland, but want a deeper game, check out Above and Below. And for a different sort of pushy luck game, with a short playtime, you can check out Welcome to the Dungeon. Megaland, there's no quick save button. Hello and welcome to Mission Red Planet in about three minutes. It is a game for two to six players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 60 to 90 minutes. It is a low complexity game. It is the late 1800s in the reign of Queen Victoria and during the height of European imperialism. Mars is the new frontier, ripe for colonial exploitation and resource harvesting. You must assemble your team of brave pioneers and send them on rocket ships to Mars. There they must harvest resources and stake claims because the empire always needs more minerals. The winner of this game is to play with the most victory points after 10 rounds of play. Points are gained from resources, which are generated on turns 5, 8 and 10, and given to the player in the region with the most astronauts present. In the case of a tie, the resources are shared. There are also secret missions, which are scored at the end of the game for extra points. Competitive. Each player represents a different mining company in competition with each other. Area control. Players gain points by having the most units in an area. Roll selection. You have a hand of 9 roll cards and select one to use each turn. Turn. Player turn. Before the round begins, you will secretly select one of the nine available roll cards. This will determine what actions you can take and when they happen. Once a card is played, it is discarded. Turn order is done like a countdown, starting at nine and working its way down. Each roll will allow you to place one or two astronauts on ship cards and to use a special ability. Ships depart once they are fully loaded to the destination shown on the ship. Nine is the recruiter and allows you to reclaim discarded roll cards. Eight is the explorer, who allows you to move astronauts on Mars. Seven is the scientist, who lets you look at some of the special cards. Six is the secret agent, who allows you to launch a ship early, before it is fully loaded. Five is the saboteur, who allows you to blow up one dock ship. Four is the femme fatale, who allows you to steal an opponent's astronaut. Three is the travel agent, who allows you to put three astronauts on one ship. Two is a soldier who allows you to remove an opponent's astronaut and move your astronauts from Phobos to Mars. One! The pilot allows you to change a ship's destination even if it's in flight. Blast off! Once all these actions are done, ships reach their destinations and astronauts are added to that region. New ships are added for the next turn and the turn marker advances. Why would you like this game? It's a very quick paced, brutal area control game that somehow manages to feel less vicious than others in its genre. When someone uses the pilot to send your astronauts to completely the wrong side of Mars to where you want them to go, you can't really get that upset about it, as the whole game is a series of mean moves served with a side order of extra meanness. It's quick to set up, easy to learn, and yet there is plenty of space for serious gamers to have serious decisions to make. The single best thing about this game is the role system, which is quite similar to one of the designer's other games, Citadels. Yet this time, the role selection system seems to open up play options rather than close them down. However, area control games are very competitive and cutthroat, and some people might find that off-putting. And the sheer level of take that actions and meanness in this game might make it unappealing for those people who do not enjoy conflict in their games. For a similar brutal game with a light-hearted theme, I recommend the Small World series. And for another area control game, but set in the real world and with a far more serious tone, I recommend Tammany Hall. Hello and welcome to Mountains of Madness in about three minutes. It is a game for three to five players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 60 minutes. It's a moderately simple game. It's the 1920s and a group of explorers set out into the last great unknown on Earth, Antarctica. There, amid the frozen wastelands and perilous mountains, they discover traces of a lost civilization, an ancient civilization of alien and unworldly origins. As the ascent continues, the team grows increasingly on edge. The foul cold wind whispers half-heard unsettling words, and the shadows grow long and contorted. The cold wastes remind you that you are alone, an insect exploring the home of a fell race. Then you must leave before the madness consumes you all, inspired by the H.P. Lovecraft novella of the same name. In order to win this game, you must reach the edge of madness and escape with more artifact cards than you have injuries. You lose if you run out of leadership tokens. Cooperative. The team is working together to solve puzzles and win the game. Set collection. The main tasks in this game involve matching card sets. 
Each turn, a different player is the expedition leader. The turn order is as follows. Choose a location to visit, reveal it and state the required goal, take 30 seconds to negotiate and play cards, then check to see if you have won or lost the challenge. Finally, read your cards and pass to the next player. You can use leadership tokens to get a boost during each phase. Mechanically, the game is very simple. Let's take this basic example. Dyer, Danforth and Lake need to beat this challenge. Danforth says, I have six guns! And Dyer says, I have four! They agree that those two cards will match the 8 to 10 guns shown on the tile. Lake says, I have all the tools needed! So they all place the cards face down, total them up and succeed quite easily. But the game's complications come from the set of madness cards, which you will gain during the game. Each level of madness is increasingly more difficult to deal with. So let's do another scenario. Lake high fives everyone at the start of the round and says, I got all the guns! We're sorted! Go team! Danforth says, I have five crates! I have five crates! Dyer says, I have eight boxy things! To which Dyer says, do you make crates! Do you make crates! Dyer nods. They still passed the challenge, but it took way more effort. Lake high fives everyone again. Succeeding in a challenge gets you rewards such as healing, power-up cards, looking at unrevealed tiles, and artifacts needed to win the game. Failure means gaining more madness or rolling the penalty dice, which is bad. Continue the game until you escape or you run out of leadership. Why would you like this game? Mounds of Madness is an awful lot of fun for the right group. If your group has role players or outgoing people in it, it can be a real blast, but it requires that buy-in and a certain lack of shame. It would also be great fun for reasonably casual gamers who are outgoing, as the rules are quite simple. There are an awful lot of Madness cards as well, but I won't spoil more than the ones I've already shown you. I also like that the character cards are double-sided, with female and male characters on either side. It's also a nice looking game, and a unique take on the whole Mythos Madness trope. The best thing about this game is laughing about the negotiation phase once it's done, and the giant mess you have made of it. However, as a game, it's pretty thin, and if you're a serious gamer wanting a deep puzzle to crack, this is not the game for you. It's more like a social game than a traditional Euro in many regards. And if you're someone who is very self-conscious and doesn't like performing in front of people, this game would be quite challenging in that regard. And finally, as much as I enjoyed the game, it's not one I will play often. Its best value is as a novelty you play occasionally. If you like the Cthulhu Mythos but want something a bit more structured, check out the similarly named Mansions of Madness. And if you want timed actions but a more serious tone, I recommend XCOM the board game. Mountains of Madness, great fun if you don't mind making a fool of yourself. If you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out our Patreon. Hello and welcome to Nemesis in about three minutes. It is a game for one to five players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is up to three hours. It's a reasonably complex game. You're groggy as you awake from hypersleep on board the Nemesis. Why is the alarm going off? Which way is it to the showers? And why does Spaceman Steve have a giant hole in his chest? Something is seriously wrong. The engines don't sound like they're working, and the navigation array is making funny sounds. But worst of all, you're not feeling at all easy about the suspicious looks you're getting from the crew. Was one of them responsible for this? Each player starts the game with two objectives. When the first alien arrives, you choose one to keep. You win if you complete your goal and escape the ship, or go into hypersleep and the ship makes it to Earth. If the timer reaches zero, or the ship blows up, and you haven't completed your goal, you lose. You also lose if you get eaten. Semi-cooperative. Most of the time you will help your shipmates, unless your goal is to space one of them. Card management. All player actions in this game require the use of cards. Player turn. At the start of the game, each player selects a character and gains their player board, 10 character cards, a starting weapon, and two quest items. Each turn you will draw five cards. To play a card from your hand, you must discard it, along with a number of additional cards as shown in the white box on the left. You can also do these basic actions by discarding cards. Movement costs one card, and then you roll for noise, placing a noise token in the adjacent numbered corridor. Moving into a space with another figure does not generate noise. If you move into an unexplored room, flip the exploration token and roll for noise, then place the room so that this arrow is matched up against the number on this token. That's how many searchable items are in this room. To search, play the appropriate card, then draw two items matching the room's color, and you can keep one. Then, turn the room number down one step. At any point, if you have to place a second noise token in a corridor, you're in serious trouble. Remove all the noise connected to that room and draw something from the bag. In this case, an adult alien appears. If you have cards left, you might be able to attack it. In this case, the soldier gets lucky and does three damage. Unfortunately, the alien draws a four defense value and survives, and is ready to counterattack later in the turn. Once all players have passed, 
the alien's attack. You then draw an event card and then draw a token from the bag for alien behavior. In this case, a lava alien evolves into an adult. Keep playing until everyone is dead, in hypersleep, or off the ship. Why would you like this game? Very few games deliver an atmospheric and thematic experience like Nemesis, and while it borrows heavily from the Alien franchise, it does it exceptionally well, feeling enough like its own world while still being very rooted in the tropes. And there is much to do on the ship. You can research alien weaknesses at the lab, steal eggs or blow up the alien nest, check or change the ship's destination on the bridge, and fix and break the engines. The ship has a lot of rooms and a variable layout each time, and the characters all feel very different when you play them. And the contamination mechanic is something really neat, with the active scanning cards being genuinely tense. The best thing about this game is the cinematic moments it produces and the gnawing tension throughout the game. However, this game is full of unfair moments when roles do not go your way or a sudden betrayal cripples you. Even playing as well as you can, you can still get infected, eaten, and vented into space. The space horror theme will also not appeal to some. We also found playing the game too suspiciously makes it a lot harder to win in general. The game feels like it should be everyone for themselves, but you really have to play it quite cooperatively. If you want the feeling of panic while a ship explodes around you, but want a shorter, fully co-op game, try The Captain is Dead. And if betrayals are what appeals, you could try tracking down a copy of Battlestar Galactica. Nemesis. Now you know what it means. Hello and welcome to New Angeles in about three minutes. It is a game for four to six players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It's a moderately complex game. Welcome to New Angeles, city of the future, home of the space elevator and cyberpunk dystopian corporate enclave. Six powerful mega corporations have claimed extra territorial rights in New Angeles. They are the law. Life is cheap. People are resources to be consumed. Which one of you will make the right deals and emerge as the most powerful mega corporation? cooperative, competitive, and traitor. The victory conditions in this game are complex. At the start of the game, you'll be dealt a secret objective card. In this example, Haas Bioroid wins if they have more capital at the end of the game than three other players. Global Sec and Melange Mining have been dealt each other's cards, which means they must have more capital than their rival to win. Genteki must have more than Wayland, NBN must have more than Genteki, and finally, Wayland is secretly working for the government to sink the entire project and win if the threat level reaches 25, in which case all other players lose. So this game can have multiple winners, and if no one is working for the government and the threat level reaches 25, all players lose. Player turn. The game is broken into six turns, with a demand phase every second turn. However, there are several rounds of play happening for each turn. The number of rounds in a turn is determined by the previous event card. Place one asset face down for each number shown here. The first asset is then placed in the middle. The active player then puts forward one of their cards cards as the main offer. The next player can pass or place their own counter offer in, discarding a number of cards equal to the offers already in place. Once all players have passed or put a counter offer into play, voting begins. The two players who place their offers cannot vote for them, but can beg, whine, and plead to their heart's content. The other players vote on the offers by discarding cards face down in turn order. In this case, the main offer wins. The player putting that offer forward takes the asset in the middle of the table and then chooses how the offer card is used. The overall goal of these offers is to produce the goods needed to meet the demand card that has been drawn. Each region can be impacted by a variety of status effects that can change how well they produce or even if they produce at all. Once all assets have been bid on in a turn, draw an event and resolve it. This may cause enemies to move on the board and if any enemies reach this space, you increase the threat level by two. Each corporation also has a secret goal for each demand phase, which gives them extra capital if they achieve it. Play continues until the final demand phase or the threat level reaches 25. Why would you like this game? New Angeles is the perfect game for a group who enjoys intense negotiation games and a real cutthroat atmosphere. The world the game is set in is a rich one and is shared by games like Netrunner, Android and Infiltration. The corporations all have character and will want to focus on specific aspects of running the city. This is backed up by the offer cards they draw which are focused on that area. There are a heap of unique assets to bid on which allow for emergent playstyles and extra complications. It also looks really nice set up with high quality figures, cards, and art. The single best thing about this game is that almost every action is based on negotiation. There is very little randomness outside of the event cards. However, the trader aspect in this game might be its weakest point. I feel that rampant greed between the corporations 
would have made for enough tension anyway. And if the Federalist is discovered, there is very little they can do at that point to impact the game. It also requires a group committed to the idea of negotiation heavy play. This is not a game for casual gamers and will likely fall flat with many groups. This game shares a lot of the concepts of Battlestar Galactica, but has more emphasis on negotiation and a less refined traitor system. And if you like the idea of a negotiation heavy game, but want something simpler, I recommend Chinatown. Hello and welcome to Oaxaca in about three minutes. This is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 30 to 40 minutes. It's a reasonably simple game. Oaxaca is part of southern Mexico and you are a family of skilled Oaxacan craftspeople. Your region is known for its unique arts and craft style and tourists come from all over the world to your market to buy your hard work. Can you guide your family into becoming the best crafters in the region? The winner of this game is the player with the most points at the end. Points are determined by the total quality of your crafted goods at the end of the third round of play. Competitive. Only one player's family can be the best crafters in Oaxaca. Dice. Actions in Oaxaca. Use dice. Engine Builder. Many of the craft goods you build will give you extra actions and bonuses. Player Turn. This game revolves around cards and dice. Craft cards come in five different types and each player has their own colored dice with the craft symbols on them. Each craft item has a cost in its top right corner. This is how difficult it is to make, but it's also its victory points. When built, the card will also have a benefit shown at the bottom. At the start of your turn, place your worker on your board, grab your five dice and roll them. You may re-roll any or all of the dice once. Choose one of your dice each round to use. First, we will use a wild dice, which can be used like any other dice but with a lesser effect. We choose to gather from this deck, taking the top card and placing its value in cubes on it. For our second action, we choose a pottery dice to craft with. This allows us to remove one cube from each card with a matching symbol. In this case, all three cards in our workshop are pottery cards. Finished items go to our market stall. Each turn, at any time, you can use up to two market items, so we choose to use the wild icon to gather one jewelry card. On our next turn, we use a workshop card as a jewelry action to gather two jewelry items, choosing one to keep. In the center of the board, there are worker placement spaces. We place our worker on this one and take a craft action to remove cubes. We then use our jewelry dice to craft again. By the end of the round, we have used all of these market cards to improve our production and can even store one dice for the next turn so we can ensure what side it is. Once all players are done, advance the tourist marker. If the marker would leave the board, the game is immediately over and you head straight to score. Why would you like this game? Simply put, Oaxaca is a small box game with a very deep and engaging game in it. Mintworks is shown for scale. Its rules are simple, but the engines you build are quite intricate. Each of the five different building types have different ways to build your engine and score points. Tin Art, for example, has many ways to manipulate the dice rolls, whereas jewelry is all about in-game scoring. Choosing which one or two of these to focus on at the start of the game will really influence your overall engine and how well it does. The game comes with a few variants, including a solo mode and the Taste of Oaxaca module, which adds food as a sixth type of craftable item. I especially like that the player sheets flip over to become the scoring track. That's a really clever design idea. The best thing about Oaxaca is, in 30 odd minutes of playtime, you get to build an intricate engine full of interconnected effects. However, Oaxaca is a small publisher game and might not be easy for you to pick up at your local store. So getting a copy, even to look at, might be a bit tricky. And its big strength as a short, intense engine builder may also be a weakness to some, as sometimes a game can finish just as you feel like you're beginning to tool up. Oaxaca shares many traits in common with Roll for the Galaxy, and if you like that, you'll probably like this game. And if you're also into small box games, check out Tiny Epic Galaxies. Oaxaca, small box, big game. Hello and welcome to Pandemic in about three minutes. Warning, my copy of this game is really old. It is a game for one to four players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is under an hour. It's a reasonably simple game. It's 6 a.m. on Monday morning at the CDC and the reports are in. Four massive epidemics have hit the globe at the same time. You must assemble a crack team of specialists and help keep the diseases in check until you can find a cure for them all. You win this game if you manage to find cures for all four diseases ravaging the world. The game ends immediately if the outbreak track reaches the final step, you need to draw a player card and none are available, or you need to place a disease cube and there are none left. Cooperative. The CDC team has to work together to save the world. Card management. Cards are needed to make cures, but have many other uses. Player turn. At the start of the game, each player selects a role and gets some starting cards and a character pawn. Each player takes their turn and does four actions. Then they draw two player cards and finally reveal cards from the infection deck. Actions can be done multiple times if desired and include 
Moving from one space to an adjacent one. Removing a disease cube. Some actions need a city card to be spent to do so. Those include flying to that city from any space on the board, building a research station there, or trading that card to another player. You can move between research stations as if they were adjacent. But the main purpose of research stations is to find cures. While at a research station, if you have five cards of the same color, you can spend those to discover a cure. Cured diseases are easier to remove from the board as well. Once all four of your actions are done, you draw two player cards. If one of those is an epidemic, bad stuff happens. Advance the infection marker one step, pull a card from the bottom of the infection deck, and place three cubes in its location. Place it in the discard pile, shuffle it, and place all of those cards on top of the infection deck. The final part of your turn will be to reveal as many infection cards as the infection marker says and place one cube in each of those locations. If you would ever have to place a fourth cube in a city, there is an outbreak. Place a cube in every adjacent space and advance the outbreak marker. This can cause a cascade, although each space can only outbreak once per card. Unless the game is over, play then moves to the next player. Why would you like this game? There is a reason that there are no less than seven other games in the Pandemic series. It's a hugely important and influential design that has helped popularize cooperative gaming. Its success is largely due to a theme that people can connect with instantly, simple core mechanics that can be taught easily, and game difficulty that can be tweaked from easy to exceptionally hard. Each player has their own role on the team, and those different playstyles can suit different players. If you've got someone who just wants to smash disease cubes, hand them the medic. There are also event cards which can be held back and used at strategic times. The best thing about this game is that after a decade of owning it and countless games, it's still one I'm happy to play. However, there is zero private information in this game, and that can lead to a situation where one player tells everyone else what to do. This is known as quarterbacking or alpha gaming, and is frequently mentioned when people are critical of the game. Personally, I think that's a social issue and not the game's fault but the game can be incredibly unfair at times. Back-to-back -back epidemics can turn a game from manageable to a loss in a few turns with little the players can do to stop it. If you're looking for something similar, there's all the other pandemic games I mentioned, but my favorite game by this designer is Thunderbirds, a co-op game about the 60s TV show. Pandemic, a real gaming legacy. Hello and welcome to Pandemic The Cure in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 30 to 40 minutes. It's a reasonably simple game. The world is in danger once again. Four major diseases have broken out at once and it's up to you and your elite team to save the world. Sound familiar? Well, that's because the game's theme is the same as the original Pandemic. It's a reimagining of Pandemic with one major change to the game. Dice, lots of them. You win this game if you manage to find cures for all four diseases. You lose this game if either the infection or outbreak markers reach the end of their track, or if you need to pull dice from the infection bag and there are none available. Cooperative, the CDC team must work together to win this game. Push your luck. Action dice can be rolled as often as you want until they show a biohazard result. Dice. Seriously, this game has a lot of dice. Player turn. You will take your entire turn before passing to the next player. Each player has a character with their own unique abilities and special action dice. You roll your dice, removing any showing the biohazard symbol. You can re-roll your dice as many times as you wish, only stopping if they show a biohazard. For each biohazard rolled, advance the infection track one space. If that causes the marker to enter an epidemic space, pull a number of dice shown here from the infection bag, as well as any dice in the treatment area in the middle of the table. Roll them and place them on the regions on the board. There are several basic dice actions you can do on your turn. Let's look at them. Sail allows you to move to an adjacent region. Fly allows you to move to any region. Treat allows you to move a die from the region you are in to the treatment area in the middle of the table, or from the treatment area to the infection bag. Sample allows you to take a die from the treatment area and lock it down. This die can be used for finding a cure. There are some dice that show multiple action choices, and there are some character specific special actions as well. You can give samples to another player if you are in the same region as them. To find a cure, roll all dice of the matching color. If they total 13 or more, a cure is found. Finally, draw a number of dice from the infection bag based on the infection track. Roll them and add them to the board. If there are ever four or more dice of the same color in a region, advance the outbreak marker and move one of those dice one space clockwise. Dice with a cure symbol on them go to the CDC board and can be used to play special cards. It is now the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? A lot of what works in Pandemic works again here. This is a game with a theme that is really easy to grasp and simple core mechanics that are easy to teach. And weirdly, despite it being 
being a dice based game, I find Pandemic the Cure gives me more control over my destiny than the original game. And that's because there are so many dice rolls in this game, a bad roll is drowned out under the law of averages. And the ability to push your luck re-rolling dice adds an extra decision layer. Each of the playable classes also feels unique and offers a different playstyle and different team makeups. And I really recommend the expansion, if only to increase the number of characters available to recruit from. The best thing about this game is the dice. If you love rolling dice, there are so many in this game, and even more if you add in the expansion. However, this is a dice based game, and if that immediately puts you on edge, walk away now. There will be well over 100 dice rolls in a game, and this does mean, on occasion, you will roll nothing but biohazards. And like all pandemic games, it is prone to alpha gaming. Pandemic the Cure stands out from its family of games for having a totally different core mechanic, but they are certainly worth checking out. And if you love dice, check out Roll for the Galaxy, which was designed by the co-designer of the Pandemic the Cure expansion. Pandemic the Cure. It's not the goth version of Pandemic at all. Hello and welcome to Potion Explosion in about three minutes. This is a game for two to four players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 30 minutes. It's a reasonably simple game. If you're late to potions class one more time this month, Professor Humble Score is likely to turn you into a rat, or worse, make you clean out the cauldrons after school. You need to mix up a battery of potions, using the right ingredients and of course, magical assistance at the right time. You and your friends are aspiring wizards and only one can be head of the class this year. You win this game by having the most points at the end of the game. Each potion is worth the victory points shown on them. When you make your fifth different potion type, you gain a merit badge with victory points. You also gain a merit badge whenever you complete a third potion of a type. The game ends when the merit badges run out. Competitive. Each player is trying to be the best potion maker and only one can win. Set collection. Potions are completed by getting matching colored marbles in the right slots. Player turn. At the start of the game you set up the potion dispenser by pouring the marbles in the top. On your turn you can take one marble from the dispenser and use any number of potions. Any marbles that roll down and contact a marble of the same color are removed. In this example we remove this red marble which will cause the other two red marbles to touch meaning you collect them as well. These red marbles are then placed on the red available spots on the two potions, with the spear going on one of the three spaces in your flask. Next turn, we pull this black marble, causing the three yellows to connect. We remove and place them, which completes one of our potions. We immediately select a new potion to replace the completed one. Our third turn is more complex. We use a little help token, which allows us to remove one black marble without causing an explosion, at the cost of two victory points. We then remove this yellow marble, triggering a chain reaction. We grab our saved marbles from the flask, and then use some potions. First, the love potion allows us to steal marbles from another player's flask. We then use the prismatic potion to make all our marbles count as any color for this turn. We complete both potions and gain two new ones. Each of the different potions has a different effect. For example, this one allows you to take a different colored marble from each of the bottom rows of the dispenser. You keep playing until you run out of merit badges and then end the game when all players have had the same number of turns. Why would you like this game? Potion Explosion is easy to teach and learn and the core gameplay is very simple. But that doesn't mean there isn't strategy and brain power involved. The combination of pattern recognition skills for seeing what pulls will yield what results and the use of potions and little help tokens makes for a game that can have some pretty deep thinking. In each game there are only six of the available eight potions in play. Randomly deciding which ones to use shakes up the game a little each time. And of course you can't go past the wonderful tactile aspect of physically dropping marbles and moving them about. The hands-on nature of this game will really appeal to some people. The single best thing about this game is when you spot a complex and rewarding chain reaction and end up with a pile of marbles. Who cares if you can't use them all? However, some people might find this game not much more than a multiplayer analog version of Candy Crush and other phone app games. And there's no denying it has a similar feeling gameplay. I also feel the game needed more variety in its potions and game modes, but that's almost entirely addressed by the first expansion. For another simple to learn, hard to master puzzle game, you could try Azul. Or if you want to graduate to advanced potion making, you could check out Alchemists. And now for some bonus content. I'll quickly run through what's in the expansion. First of all, you have this cauldron containing the fifth element represented by white marbles. These marbles start the game in the cauldron and can only be collected using in-game effects, which allow you to swap a marble from your hand with one from the cauldron. White marbles can count as any other type you choose in potions and in the dispenser. Next we have four new potion types, taking the total to 12. The left two have marble manipulation abilities, and the right two are directly tied to the cauldron. Having 12 potions when you use six per game seems to be the sweet spot for this game in terms of variety. 
The game also introduces new positive tokens, which you get for using the cauldron, and negative tokens, which are used by the professors. And there are seven professors, and you can use them to change the overall rules of the game. This one allows you to swap an ingredient from your flask to the cauldron for a white marble if your flask is full at the end of your turn. And this one causes you to lose a victory point if you drop a marble during your turn. You can use none, one, or two of them to change the overall feel of the game. It's a good expansion because it adds variety and play modes without compromising what made the original game a lot of fun. But I'd really only recommend it if you think you were going to be playing an awful lot of Potion Explosion. Hello and welcome to Race for the Galaxy in about three minutes. It is a game for two to four players. It does not come with a solo mode. Playing time is around one hour. It is a moderately complex game. Humanity has left the cradle of Earth and struck out into the stars. Now the various colonies of Earth are competing for resources, planets, and technology in order to become the premier power in the galaxy. The winner of this game is the colony that builds the most impressive space empire. This is done by playing cards and trading goods. The game ends once a player has placed 12 cards or if all the victory point tokens for trading have run out. Victory is scored by the combined value of your cards plus your VP tokens. Higher score wins. Competitive. Players are competing colonies and only one can win. Card management. Nearly everything in this game is decided by card play. Engine building. The most successful empires play cards that work well together. Player turn. There are five possible phases in this game. Explore, develop, settle, consume, and produce. But not all five will happen each turn. You will select one of these turn cards to play face down, as will your opponents. When all are placed, you reveal, and only those phases will take place. Everyone will get to act in those phases, but the people who played the turn order cards will get a bonus. Explore allows you to draw extra cards. Each of the two different explore order cards also gives you a bonus. Develop allows you to play a development card, noted by its diamond symbol. Cards cost the value shown in discarded cards to play. The develop turn card gives you a discount. Settle does the same thing, but for planets, shown with a round symbol on the left of the card. Planets come in three different types, standard, military, and windfall, as well as four different resource types in order of value. Alien artifacts, genes, rare materials, and novelty worlds. Military worlds cannot be purchased using the standard method. They must be conquered with military points. Normally, consume is next, but we will show produce first instead, which allows you to put a trade good on a standard or military world. If you have the produce card, you can put one on a windfall world as well. Consume allows you to sell goods to gain victory points. The bonus cards allow you to trade goods for extra cards or to double the amount of victory points you get. Once all available phases are done, the turn is over. Why would you like this game? It's a great engine builder and you always feel like you're moving towards making a bigger and better empire. There is a ton of replayability in the core box alone and has numerous expansions if you want to go deeper. It compresses a lot of good strong gameplay and decision making into a comparatively short time frame. The best thing about this game is the use of cards. Not only do they have a lot of information on them, they represent your economy as well. Costs are played in cards, goods are represented by face down cards, and it just means you don't have extra tokens and things to worry about. However, the iconography on the cards takes a while to get used to, and decrypting the game for the first time can be a hassle for new players. This is also a high skill game that requires knowledge of the cards and how the game is paced, and new players will take a few games to adapt to it. In particular, knowing which one of the six point developments to build towards can really make a difference in your score. For similar games, there's Roll for the Galaxy, which is Race for the Galaxy's sibling game, which swaps cards for dice. Opinion is very split over which is better, but both are currently in Board Game Geek's top 60. For a similar card-based engine builder, but with a lot more going on, I recommend Terraforming Mars. Hello and welcome to Raiders of the North Sea, Solar Review, in about three minutes. This is part of our program to promote New Zealand-made games, review copy used. While Raiders can play with up to four players, we're looking exclusively at the solo mode today, and playing time is around about 30 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. You come from the land of the ice and snow, from the midnight sun where the cold springs blow. You will drive your ships to new lands. You will send your warband to Valhalla. You will conquer lands of green, make ruins, and become the overlord of the western shore. Well, you hope you can. There is another warband trying to outdo your efforts to become the greatest raider of the North Sea. You win this game if you have more points than the AI player at the end of the game. The game ends when all but one of the fortress spaces has been raided. You gain points from raiding, sending warriors to Valhalla, upgrading your armor, making offerings to the chieftain of your tribe, and from character cards. Worker placement. 
In this game, you'll be placing and removing workers from the board to gain the associated advantages. Automata. The AI opponent in this game is represented by a deck of cards. Card management. Cards represent characters in your warband, but each character can be played for a special effect as well. Player turn. As a human player, you will get to go first. You start with two coins and five cards, and you choose two to discard. On your turn, you'll have one worker in your hand. You can place that worker at an available space as long as the color of the worker matches. For example, this space needs a gray or a white worker. You gain the associated benefit of using that space. For example, this building allows you to draw two character cards. You will then pick up a worker from a different space, also gaining that location's advantage. In this case, the building allows you to recruit a person to your warband. Alternatively, you can choose to raid a location. You place your worker and spend the required gold and supplies to raid the space. If it is not a harbor space, you must fight to get victory points. Add up the fighting value of your crew, as shown in the red box on their cards. Add your armor value and roll a number of dice as shown on the location you are raiding. You gain VPs as shown on each board space. Regardless of your role, you always take the worker and resources from that region, clearing it out. For each of these Valkyrie markers, remove one character from your raiding party and advance the Valkyrie track one step. Once you have acted, it is the AI's turn. Turn over an AI card and check to see if the current armor score is equal or higher than the value on the card, and if they have enough provisions as shown at the top of the card as well. If it does, the AI raids the space shown, removing everything in that space from the game. If not, it gains the items on the bottom row of the card. In addition, card shows one space that is rendered inaccessible on your next turn. Repeat play until five of the six fortress locations have been raided. Why would you like this game? I haven't played Raiders as anything other than a solo game, which is why this review is focused on the solo mode. And it's a really solid solo mode. The AI player is relentless and gets out to an early lead, which makes every turn feel like you are playing catch. Up. The AI blocking off spaces also means you need to adapt your strategy as in the fly, just as you would in a multiplayer work placement game. It's also a very well paced game, and your actions and the AI's actions don't take much time, so there's not a lot of bookkeeping. The single best thing about the game is the place a worker, take a worker mechanic. It makes this game feel like it just has a real, natural rhythm to it. However, the solo mode is not included in the base game and has to be acquired separately, which will be a pain for a lot of people, and it's an additional cost. Thankfully, Garpel Games have identified solo modes is an important part of gaming, so the newer games will include them where possible. For a game with a similar type of AI solo experience, but a lot more expensive, check out Anachrony. And if you like Raiders of the North Sea, you will likely also enjoy Architects of the West Kingdom when it comes out, and that game will come with an inbuilt solo mode. Hello and welcome to Raxon in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around about one hour. It is a relatively simple game. The reports of a massive disease outbreak are grossly exaggerated, according to the Raxon Pharmaceuticals PR team, that is. And all this talk of the Walking Dead is just fake news. You're not so sure, and you're pretty certain that Old Man Withers was a lot more bitey than normal last time you saw him. You and your team play influential figures trying to evacuate the uninfected from the disaster area. In order to win the game, you must find all 30 survivors, and you must do it before the infected overrun you, or Raxon interference gets too much to handle. Cooperative. Players work together to find the survivors in the crowd. Push your luck. Actions have consequences, and the more actions you take, the harder they are to deal with. Tile placement. The crowd are represented as tiles on the board that you must manipulate to win. Player turn. First of all, the crowd is refreshed, and all cards start face down. Each player acts once, and in play moves to the next player. You can keep acting until you pass, or something happens in the crowd that forces play to stop. Common actions include... Investigate, to flip a card. Some cards have triggers when they flip, based on the number of matching cards face up. Evacuation actions move face up survivors to the evacuation area. Airstrikes send cards to the dead pile. Crowd control rearranges cards in the crowd. Quarantine moves infected to the contained quarantine area. Each character has a unique action as well as variations of the actions above. The most important game system Raxon has is consequences. For example, once this character uses an airstrike, they must add a new face down person before their next turn, and every turn after that. That might seem manageable, but if you're adding a lot of people to the crowd, flipping them and triggering Raxon cards before you act each turn, it can get out of hand very quickly. Once your turn is over, you add more infected to the draw pile based on how many are in the uncontained quarantine or in the crowd still. Then, contained infected move to the uncontained area and the dead pool is shuffled back into the draw pile. Why would you like this game?
it's a puzzle game, but it's quite an interesting one. It has a lot of mechanics that work with the theme, while mechanically feeling like a low-luck abstract game. It also adds to the world of Dead of Winter, and it's a nice companion game to that. Uh, many games deal with the zombie apocalypse, but this is one of the few that deals with the day one situation. The single best thing about the game is the consequences system. Knowing when to take an action and when to call a round over adds an awful lot of tension to the game. However, it is a puzzle game first and foremost. There is some flavor in the racks on cards, but they are a very secondary system for the game. It can also be quite frustrating as the ratio of survivors to infected gets very high towards the end game and finding the final few survivors can be very, very tough. If you're curious about what happens to your survivors after you save them, I recommend Dead of Winter The Long Night. Raxon even comes with two characters for that game. And if you like the puzzle aspect of this game, I recommend Bethel Woods. Hello and welcome to Robinson Crusoe in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around one to two hours. It is a very complex game. Mm. You are shipwrecked, stranded on a deserted island with very few resources and no shelter to speak of. If you are lucky, there might be some supplies left in the wreckage, but most likely you will need to craft everything you need to survive. Not only that, this island does not appear normal. Strange things are happening, and you and your team need to work together to overcome the island's challenges and survive. In order to win this game, you must complete the goals listed on the scenario, and these can be dramatically different. You must also do this without any member of the team dying due to starvation, wounds, cold or exposure. Cooperative. Players are working together to survive on the island. Worker placement. Each survivor has action markers that they use to take actions on the board. Player turn. This game is all about managing your limited resources, planning out your moves in the most efficient way possible, and dealing with calamities as they occur. First off, an event will happen. It is placed in the event order line, moving the previous event to the left. If an event leaves the line, there may be consequences, and those are shown on the bottom of the card. Then check the morale of your team and gain or lose determination points, which are used to power character skills. Then you must assign actions to the different areas on the board. Once all actions are assigned, you resolve them in a set order. You can assign actions to deal with the current event. Hunting allows you to attack any animals you have uncovered on the island. Animals frequently provide food and furs, but attacking them comes with the risk of injury. The next three actions use the special dice. If you assign two actions to a task, you do not have to roll those special dice. But if you assign only one action, you do and each dice has a chance of success or failure, of getting a wound, or having a complication. Complications require you to draw an event card from the matching deck. These are almost always really bad. Explore allows you to discover new regions on the island, which may contain resources you can gather later, animals to be added to the hunt deck, discoveries, and important items for the scenario. Each region has a terrain type, and each terrain type allows you to build certain items. For example, this is a mountain, and that means the fire card is now available to build. Gather allows you to collect resources. Any resources collected are not available until all actions are completed. Build allows you to either build a new item card or enhance the shelter, improving its roof or defenses, which are needed to keep out the cold, rain, wind, and wild animals. Finally, everyone needs to eat or they will suffer wounds from starvation. It is now the next turn. Why would you like this game? Robinson Crusoe is a brutal game that has you start with very little and endeavor to overcome the odds to survive in a hostile environment. It's a real challenge and has some excellent story moments, but most people's stories about the game are either narrowly surviving or dying horribly. It also feels like the perfect game for a solo player compared to a co-op group. While co-op could be fun, I think this is a game that really shines for those players looking for an engaging solo experience. If you like the idea of building a jungle hut in a thunderstorm with a rusty blade while trying to avoid being eaten by a tiger, this could be a game for you. The single best thing about the game is the scenarios. They are well varied and attempt to do very different things and explore different themes. Some are pure survival based, but others are more action oriented. However, the game is complex and has many different rules and systems to learn. It's not new gamer friendly, and the rulebook is a slog to work through. It's also a game that requires a thick skin, as the best laid plans in this game can be undone by an unlucky storm or disaster. For a newer game using the same core system, but set in the early stages of Settling Mars, I recommend First Martians from the same designer. And for another survival themed co-op game with good solo options, I recommend This War of Mine. Hello and welcome to Root in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 1-4 to four players. There is no solo mode, although there is one in the expansion. Playing time is around an hour. It's a pretty complex game. 
War has come to the Great Woodland. The Marquise de Cat is working to exploit the resources of the wood, and that is causing friction amongst the mice, foxes, and rabbits, who have banded together to form a ragtag group of rebels called the Alliance. It's at this moment that the Irie returns in force to reconquer the woods, while the Vagabond plays off against all parties involved. Only one player can win the day and determine the future of the Great Woodland. The winner of this game is the player who reaches 30 points first. Competitive. Only one player can rule the Great Woodland. Asymmetric. Every faction and route has very different rules and powers. Card management. The cards in this game can be used in a variety of ways. Player turn. There's no point describing what a standard turn looks like because it's different for each faction. The Marquise de Cat starts controlling the board and wants to build as many buildings as they can. Sawmills create wood, which is used to make other buildings such as workshops for crafting and recruiters for more troops. Success for the Marquise de Cat looks like a heavily reinforced board with lots of buildings on it and powerful armies that can move and strike at attackers. The Irie dynasties have to follow a strict set of instructions in a specific order, as shown at the top of their player board. Each turn they must add one to two cards to these instructions, and if at any point they cannot follow one of them, their society collapses, and that's not good for them. Success for the Irie is constant expansion and being able to build a roost each turn in order to score points. The Woodland Alliance uses its supporter cards to build sympathy on the board. Areas with sympathy can be targeted using matching cards for a revolt. A revolt removes all enemy pieces and allows them to place a base and recruit officers. Success for the Alliance involves having sympathy all over the board, bases in play, and officers who can recruit more troops and build more sympathy. The Vagabond is a single hero character who uses pieces of equipment to take actions. They can make friends with the other factions by trading with them or enemies by attacking them. The Vagabond can get extra items that other players players craft by trading with them. The Vagabond cannot be defeated in combat, but their equipment can be damaged, which slows them down. Success for the Vagabond involves completing various quest cards and roaming around the board, exploring and fighting. Why would you like this game? The asymmetric gameplay is key to enjoying Root. Each faction plays and feels completely unique, and that's a real achievement in design. The cards are used in many different ways in the game, from craftable powers and items, through to changing the victory conditions. The game also comes with excellent guidance on how to play your first few turns, which makes teaching the game much easier than I expected. The artwork and overall theme is wonderful to look at and incredibly evocative, and no game lends itself to character photographs better than Root. And there's already an expansion out of additional factions, such as the Trader Otters and the Sinister Lizard Cult. The single best thing about this game is that there is a faction that will likely suit any playstyle. Not keen on area control and war? Play a Vagabond instead. However, Root's asymmetry can potentially cause problems, as you can't really follow another player's actions while you're learning as everyone's stuff works very differently. This makes it harder for people who learn as they go to pick the game up. And make no mistake, cute critters aside, this is a war game of sorts, and it's exceptionally cutthroat. If cute woodland critters are your thing, but you want a lot less bloodlust, check out Everdell. And if you want asymmetric gameplay and a real world scenario, you should try a distant plane. Root, adorably murderous. Hello and welcome to Saloon Tycoon in about three minutes. It is a game for two to four players. There is no official solo mode. Playing time is about an hour. It's a moderately simple game. It's the Old West and there is a gold rush going on. Travelers and explorers are arriving in town and you and your opponents are rival saloon owners, trying to get their custom and make as much money as you can. Only one saloon can become the town's number one watering hole. Do you have the entrepreneurial skills to become a saloon tycoon? At the start of the game, you will create a stockpile of supply cubes based on the number of players. When those run out, the game has one more round and then you calculate your final score. You earn points for finishing rooms off, having roofs, completing public claims, completing private claims, and having citizens at your saloon. The winner is the person with the most points at the end of the game. Competitive. Only one player can have the best saloon in town. Card management. Playing cards is a large part of how you win the game. Tile placement. Each room in your saloon is its own tile. Player turn. You start the game with an unfinished saloon, three gold, and one income. You start your turn by collecting your income. On your turn, you can do one of the following actions. You can collect two gold. You can collect two tycoon cards with a hand limit of five cards. You can play a tycoon card from your hand and gain the benefits listed. You can buy a room, paying the cost shown on the tile. Depending on where you place the tile, there may be additional costs. Each room you build increases your income by one. You can also pay six gold to bribe an annoying character to leave your saloon. Once you have taken one of these actions, you may buy supply tokens, paying two gold for each one. Supply tokens go on rooms, and once all slots are full, the room is considered to be complete. You then score seven points for a big room and five points for a small room, and gain the room's completion bonus. 
in this case, four gold. Some rooms, like the jail here, give you a character when you complete them. In addition, you can score one of the open claims if you meet its requirements. For example, Gentlemen's Club requires you to have three male citizens in your saloon. If a room has all its supply slots full, you can build on top of it in later turns. Once you complete the third floor, you gain a roof tile and four victory points. After taking your one action and optionally supplying rooms or staking a claim, play passes to the next player. The game ends after all supply cubes run out and you score secret claims at that time. Why would you like this game? Building stuff is a lot of fun in this game. The vertical building options are something I've not seen before, and building tall versus building wide are both valid approaches to the game. Each player turn is really quick, and the limited actions per turn mean you never feel like you're waiting for your turn for a very long time, even during a four-player game. The tycoon cards have a lot of options that allow for player interaction as well, and the game does not feel like a multiplayer solitaire, even though most of your efforts are inwardly focused. And there is something wonderfully tactile about the game. You genuinely feel like you're building a saloon. There's also an expansion which adds a ranch with cows and horses for added variety to the game. The single best thing about the game are the negative characters. This is a clever mechanic designed to slow down players who get off to a flying start, without it feeling too forced. However, the Wild West theme initially put me off playing this game for a while. I'm from New Zealand, and the American Old West really does nothing for me as a theme. Uh, I probably would have jumped in straight away if the game had been about Ferengi bartenders. And the character collection system, while interesting, can be undermined by a few tycoon cards that allow you to steal characters off people. That card became exceptionally valuable in our games. If the Wild West isn't your scene, but you want another building game with a similar playtime, check out 51st State. And if the Wild West is your thing, and you want a bigger and more complex building game set there, check out Great Western Trail. Hello and welcome to Salvation Road in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players, although you can play it with five to eight. It has a solo mode. The game takes around 60 to 90 minutes. It is a relatively mm. simple game. Society collapsed almost overnight. The cities fell to violence and chaos, and your group has somehow managed to make it out. For a while now, you've been holed up at a desert compound, but supplies are running short, and armed gangs are starting to size you up. Then, over the radio, a message comes. All are welcome in Salvation. It's time to hit the road. You must load up the truck and make it to Salvation. This requires making it past a number of checkpoints and paying the associated costs. And then, at Salvation itself, you must pay a random final toll for entry. If you make it to salvation, you win the game. However, if both of one player's characters die, or there are too many bikers on the walls, you will lose before you hit the road. Cooperative. Players work together to escape the compound and make it to salvation. Push your luck. The longer you take to gather resources, the worse the situation gets. But you need those resources to make it to salvation. Dice. Rolling dice is always bad in this game. Player turn. Each player has two characters, a hero and a survivor. On your turn, you choose which character to use, and they get two actions. The main actions are move from one location to another, search to get random goods on that location and increase threat, gather to take a good from a location to your character's sheet. Whenever you move to camp, you can put goods on the truck for free. You can also rest, heal, transfer items, and attack the bikers threatening the compound. Once your character is finished, the next player acts. Then, when he gets back to you, you activate your second character and have their turn. Once all characters have acted, you roll for threat at each location. You roll dice equal to the threat shown, plus the number of characters, in this case, one. But as you search more, the threat goes up, and once it gets high, you'll end up rolling a lot of dice. And once you run out of the white dice, you're rolling the black ones, and they are especially bad. Each wound marker on a dice is now a wound on a character. Wounds take up spaces in your inventory, and can also be flipped over for even worse effects later. Finally, flip an apocalypse card and see what flavor of misfortune befalls your group. Your options are war, pestilence, famine, and death. Charming. Why would you like this game? It's a surprisingly quick game with good decision making and optimization, with an interesting set of push your luck mechanics, both with the rising threat and the final road trip. It has just enough flavor in the characters in the apocalypse cards that it doesn't feel like a dry euro, but it's smooth enough mechanically that it will appeal to people who like that style of game. The single best thing about this game are the survivors. Most games are full of heroic figures, and so is Salvation Road. But every player is also saddled with a liability, like a guy who screams whenever there is trouble, or this annoying rich girl. However, while the theme is there, and it's good enough for some, I feel some people will find this game a bit mechanical. The final toll is also a bit frustrating, as you need a lot of extra resources just to make sure. For another co-op in the post-apocalypse, though with far more complexity and variety, I recommend Defenders of the Last Stand. 
and for another short co-op game with similar teamwork and pressure, I recommend The Captain is Dead. Hello and welcome to Santorini in about three minutes. This is a game for two to four players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is around 20 minutes. It's a really simple game. On the sunny Greek island of Santorini, a battle for supremacy is underway. In this abstract game, you will place buildings, maneuver workers, climb towers, and gently shift the board state in order to take a decisive winning action. All in a matter of minutes. The winner of this game is the player whose worker reaches a third level of a tower first, but you can also lose the game if your workers can take no valid action. Competitive. Only one person can win this battle of wits. Tower placement. Each turn you will place building parts on the board. Player turn. For the basic game, set up the board and then one player places their two workers. The second player places theirs next. On your turn, you must move one worker one space in any direction and then place a building tile. Here are the possible spaces you can move. Note that you cannot move into an occupied square. Once you have moved, you must place a building in an adjacent region as shown here. You cannot place a building in an occupied area. Once you have placed, it is the next player's turn. Buildings consist of three levels and a dome can be placed on top of them. They must be placed in order. When you move, you can only move up one level per move, but you can move down any number of levels. As the goal of the game is to get to the third level, if you are in this position, you could win next move, but your opponent can block you by moving adjacent to a level 3 building and placing a dome on it. A building with a dome on it cannot be moved into and the dome cannot be removed. That's enough for the basic game. The advanced game adds variable powers. One player chooses god cards equal to the number of players and the other players choose which god to play. Each god changes the rules for that player. For example, Artemis allows you to move two spaces instead of one and place a block after you move, whereas Apollo allows you to move into your opponent's square and swap places with them. Play continues back and forth until someone reaches a third floor or a player can no longer make a valid move. Why would you like this game? There's a saying, minutes to teach and a lifetime to master, and few games I've played epitomize that idea more so than Santorini. Looking at the rules, it doesn't look like much, but once you're locked into the back and forth of the game, it becomes a mighty battle of wits. And yet this game can still be taught to and enjoyed by children, much as checkers can be. And there's a mighty collection of gods with different powers who ensure that the game plays differently each time. Oh, and the little blocks and towers are pretty damned adorable, but the best thing about this game is the intense back and forth and in realizing that in the three moves you can win and you don't think they can stop you. However, the game says it's for two to four players, it really isn't. It's a two player game at its core. If you buy this for a four player experience, it might be a little underwhelming. And it is an abstract. And while it's got some visual theming, if you want a game that tells a rich story, this is not for you. Santorini scratches a lot of the same itches as chess does, but without the scripted openings and having to deal with really serious chess players. And if you like abstract games and want something that's better for groups, I recommend checking out Azul. Santorini, what's checkmate in Greek? If you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out our Patreon. Hello and welcome to Scythe in about three minutes. It is a game for one to five players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It is a complex game. The Great War is over, and the powers of Europe are exhausted after many years of fighting. The factory, the mysterious source of the super weapons that fueled that war, has shut its door, and there is a tense and heavy pause in the conflict. You are one of the nations of Europe looking to rebuild your country and claim territories left vacant by the fall of the factory. The winner of this game is the country with the most victory points at the end. Money counts as victory points, as do territories and resources, but the main source of victory points is completing objectives and placing stars to claim them. The game ends immediately once one player has placed their sixth star, then points are scored and the highest total value wins. Competitive. Players are competing to become the next great power in Europe. Engine building. Making your economy run effectively is the key to victory. Point salad. There are many different ways to claim victory points in this game. Player turn. At the start of the game, each player is assigned a faction, and they have different powers and abilities. They are also assigned an economy board. Each of these boards has the same eight main actions, but they are in different orders and with different costs. On your turn, you will select one column of actions on your economy board, and it cannot be the same one you chose last turn. You do not need to take both actions in the column. Produce allows you to add resources to two to three regions where you have workers. One resource per worker. Trade gives you two of any resources, or popularity. Bolster increases your military power, or gives you combat cards. Move allows you to move two to three units, one space each. Upgrade allows you to move one cube from the top row to the bottom row, making both actions work better. Deploy allows you to build a mech, gaining a new power for your leader and for your mechs. 
build lets you place one of the four special buildings on the board. Recruit allows you to gain an advantage when one of your neighbors takes that bottom row action and provides a one-off bonus. While moving around the board, you can engage in battles, have special encounters, or visit the factory for a one-time upgrade. All of these actions build towards placing stars, and you get those for having audio developments, mechs, buildings, recruits, and workers in play. You also get them for completing a secret mission, for winning up to two combats, and for maxing out your popularity and power. Once you have done your top and bottom actions, it is the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? First of all, it is an impressive looking game and looks mighty on the table. It is a feeling of grandness a few games can match. It's also an interesting combination of ideas from the American and European School of Game Design. It has a lot of Euro mechanics in its economy boards and the emphasis on maximizing the effectiveness of your actions. But it also has encounter cards, combat, and moving units around a map, which are standbys of the American School. It has a little bit of everything, and I think it would appeal to people who like war games as well as people who like Euro games. The models are also really neat, and the game looks very nice fully painted. The single best thing about the game is the artwork and the world building. Jacob Rosalski has built an amazing world with his 1920s art, and Scythe was developed from that art, which is very unusual for a board game. However, as this game is a hybrid of Euro and American game themes, it might be off-putting to hardcore fans of either. Some people will find the conflict in this game not to their liking, while others will be wishing there was a lot more conflict. For a game that focuses more on the engine building and maximizing of actions, I recommend Caverna. And for a game with similar production values, but a lot more conflict, I recommend Lords of Hellas. Hello and welcome to Snakes and Ladders in about three minutes. This is a game for any number of players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is anywhere from five minutes to an eternity. It is a deceptively complex game. Snakes and Ladders also known in the United States by the far less snaky title of Shoots and Ladders, is an ancient board game that has its origins in India and was imported to the West thanks to British imperialism and American capitalism. Snakes and Ladders takes on the bold challenge of teaching players ethical frameworks and moral decision making, and the ladders represent virtuous actions towards enlightenment, while the snakes represent damning sins that leave you morally weaker. In order to win this game, you must navigate the board successfully to the end. The first player to reach the final space has attained enlightenment and can lord it over those morally inferior to themselves. Competitive. Each player is alone in their search for moral enlightenment. Dice. The ability to control dice of your mind is the key to victory. Snakes. The ever-present snakes represent areas of the board you must avoid. Ladders. Well-managed use of ladders is the key to victory. Player turn. On your turn, you will take a die of your choice and roll it. The number you get will advance your pawn that many steps along the path to victory. If you roll the correct number and end your movement on a ladder, you will move your pawn to the top of the ladder. Congratulations, you have improved your chances of winning. Sounds easy, right? But there is a catch. If you land on a snake, you must move your pawn to the bottom of the snake. This is a bad play, and you should feel bad when you chose to roll a number that lands you on a snake. It won't help you win, so I highly recommend not landing on snakes. Clearly, the obvious strategy in this game is to roll the correct numbers, and not to roll the incorrect ones. If you can master dice rolling correctly, the game is easy to win. Once you have moved, it is the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? While on the surface, Snakes and Ladders appears to be nothing more than an arbitrary dice throwing exercise with no actual decisions to be made, and is therefore outside the definition of what a game is, the truth is far from that. This is a game with sublime skill and nuance, and the winning strategies in this game fall into two major categories. First of all, you can be lucky, bless, or charmed into winning. If you win a game, it is proof that the divine entity watching over you has truly blessed you, and you should use this chance to tell everyone who lost how damned and unloved they are. The second strategy, and the one I employ, is the technical and mental mastery of telekinesis. I manipulate the dice of my mind in order to win, and that's an excellent transferable skill to other games. The single best thing about this game is snakes. It's a crying shame American children are deprived of snakes. However, some people will remain convinced that this is a random luck fest, and you can do your best to convince them otherwise, but it is likely not worth it. It's also very difficult to source a copy of this game with real snakes. If you're looking for an area control game with the same amount of mental acuity as snakes and ladders, I recommend Tic-Tac-Toe. And if you want a game where you don't even have to win the game to lord it over people, where simply owning the game will give you feelings of divine smugness, I recommend Kingdom Death Monster. Hello and welcome to Space Cadets in about three minutes. This game for up to six players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is one to two hours. It's a moderately complex game. Captain, there are unidentified vessels ahead. On screen, 
Ah, yes. Our enemies are dead ahead. Helm, plot a course to intercept. Raise shields and try to get a sensor lock on them. Yes, sir. Helm, why are we flying in the wrong direction? Torpedoes away, sir! No one asked you to fire torpedoes. Sorry, sir, we missed anyway. This is Space Cadets, and you win by completing your mission, usually collecting crystals and defeating enemies, and then activating the jump drive to win. You lose when the ship explodes. Cooperative. Everyone is working together on different stations on board the ship. Player turn. Each turn, the captain leads a discussion about the next turn's plan. The captain also keeps track of the timer. Each station will have 30 seconds to complete its task during its timed phase. Engineering is the most important station as it determines how much power the ship has. You take seven of the engineering tokens and arrange them in any order. You gain one power for each of the full symbols matching that station. Power is used by all stations for bonuses. Helm is the most important station as it directs where the ship goes. Drawing a number of cards equal to the ship's current speed plus power spent. You place a number of cards equal to your current speed and move the ship. Just watch out for asteroids. Sensors is the most important station on the ship as it is how you reveal new regions, target enemy ships and target crystals. You have to reach into the black bag and pull out matching tokens to your sensor cards and you only get one chance per card to be right. Which brings us to the most important station, shields. As without shields, you will be destroyed very quickly. You gain a number of tokens based on the power in the shields and have to place them in a poker style format with four of a kind and straights making stronger shields and pairs. Shield facing is also very important. The tractor beam is the most important station on the ship because it's the only way to collect crystals that you need to win the game. This is a memory game and you need to find matching tokens in order to track to something. None of the other stations are as important as weapons control, where you must first load the torpedoes by playing a tile matching game, and then you must fire them using only your finger. The further along the track, the more damage you do, but go off the track and you miss. Damage control is the most important station as it prevents the ship from blowing up. Whenever the ship takes damage, you will flip damage cards, and you can attempt to repair them during your turn. Finally, in order to finish the game, you need the most important station, the jump drive. In order to jump the ship, you will need to roll five of a kind. However, each turn you can buy cards with your current roll that can be used to modify the dice in later turns, and that makes getting five of a kind easier. Why would you like this game? Space Cadets is pure madness, with each player trying desperately to complete the individual stations in the time phase, and really succeeding as intended. The ship will go the wrong way, shields will be facing backwards, and torpedoes will miss. It can be very slapstick at times. But you can also get quite good at the game with practice, and getting things right in Space Cadets is remarkably satisfying. There's also a gameplay style bound to suit just about everyone with the different stations and their different mini games. The best thing about this game is the look someone gives you when they have completely ballsed something up. However, if you are someone who has difficulty handling other people people's errors and take winning co-ops very seriously, this game might not be for you. It is far easier to get things wrong in this game than it is to get them perfect. Also, each station is different and some stations can be very frustrating for some players. Finding the station that works well for you can take time. If you like real-time panicking games or want something more serious, you could try Space Alert. And if loads of actions in a short time sounds fun, but you don't like sci-fi, you could try Kitchen Rush. Space Cadets, making it so, has never been harder. Hello and welcome to Spirit Island in about three minutes. This is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is approximately 30 minutes per player. This is a complex mm. game. Imagine if you would that you're a peaceful water spirit in a remote Pacific paradise. Your days are spent talking to fish, making it rain and being prayed to by the locals. Then one fateful day, European colonists turn up and start clear cutting forests, damming the rivers and polluting your waterways. How would you respond? With flash floods and mass drownings of course. That is Spirit Island. Cooperative. Each player controls their own spirit and plays together against the invaders. Area control. Each spirit has tokens that represent their influence on the board and where they can use their powers. Card management. Each player has a set of cards that represent the powers they can use. Powers are discarded once used. Winning the game. Initially, the only way to win is to remove all invaders from the board. This is exceptionally hard. But fear is the key to victory. You must make the invaders fear you. When you destroy a town or city, you create fear. Many spirit powers also create fear. Fear increases the terror level. And when the terror level goes up, the type of invaders you have to destroy get fewer and fewer, making victory easier. Player turn. Choose growth actions for your spirits, such as reclaiming your discarded powers, gaining new power cards, where you draw four and keep one, 
gaining power tokens and placing presents on the board. Play cards and use powers. Some cards are fast and will hit the colonists before they act, but many are slow. Bear cards cause negative effects on the invaders. The invaders expand across the island, making a mess. Slow cards now take effect. Refresh and begin a new turn. Spirit Island is a brain burner of a game. Every turn will have a lot of difficult decisions for you to make. There are multiple different spirits and they all play differently, but perhaps most importantly, they synergize with each other differently, leading to a lot of combinations of powers. This spirit is a slow and steady builder who helps defend places from attack, while this spirit specializes in scaring people. Combine this with a large decks of available powers and you have a game that will never play the same way twice. Scenarios and different invader groups allow you to adjust the difficulty to suit your style freely. The single best thing about this game is when you've been fighting against the invaders for a while now and your spirit is growing in power, so you decide to get a major power upgrade. Then your eyes light up when you see something awesome in your hand. You keep quiet until someone says, How do we deal with this coastal city? And you reply, Well, I could always summon a tsunami, but there are reasons you might not like this game. It's complex, and that can cause a lot of information overload and analysis paralysis. It's not casual gamer friendly, and I would only recommend it to people with a fair bit of experience with modern board games. For the same combination of hard decisions, card management, and excellent solo gameplay, I recommend Mage Knight. Hello and welcome to Suburbia in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is 60 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. There are several new townships under development, and you have been appointed as the chief city planner for one of them. It is your call what gets built, and where and how the city expands is entirely in your hands. You will compete with your fellow city planners to develop the richest, most prestigious, and largest city of them all. The winner of this game is to play with the most citizens in their city at the end of the game. There are public goals as well, and the player who wins those goals will gain extra people to their city at the end of the game. The game ends the turn after you draw this tile. Competitive. Each player is building their own city, and only one can win. Tile laying. Each city district is its own individual tile, and how you place them makes a huge difference. Engine building. Selecting tiles that work well together with existing ones is the key to victory. Player turn. Your turn in suburbia is quite straightforward. You will take one action, make adjustments to your city statistics and score track, and then collect income. There are three main things to keep track of in this game. Your city's income, which is represented by numbers and circles. Your city's reputation, which is represented by numbers and squares, and your city's population, which is represented by the meeple symbol. Most of the time, your action will be to buy one tile from those available. That includes the seven in the purchase track, as well as a limited number of basic tiles. You will pay the cost shown on the token, plus the modifier on the track. This tile gives you plus one income, and plus one income for each gray and blue district beside it, for a total of plus three income. However, in suburbia, when you place a tile, it can also modify other tiles. So the freeway grants you another plus one income, because it now has the parking lot beside it. In addition, the community park gives you plus one reputation for a total gain of plus four income and plus one reputation. You can also claim a tile without paying its base cost and place it face down as a water tile in order to gain two coins for each district it touches. Finally, you can discard a tile from the track to place an investment token. These tokens double the bonuses you get from that tile, so it should be used on your best tiles. Once all adjustments to your city stats are made, collect coins equal to your income and increase your city's population by your reputation. If your score passes over a red line on the score track, reduce both income and reputation by one. Replenish the purchase track and play passes to the next player. Why would you like this game? Suburbia is a Millennium Falcon. It may not look like much, but it's got it where it counts. While the art style is minimalist, it's actually helpful as it allows you to see the information on the board reasonably quickly. Suburbia is a thoughtful game that rewards long-term planning and maximizing the efficiency of your actions. Being able to visualize how your city will look and what kind of districts you want to use to score big points is really important. And it also makes for some really tough and fun decisions. I also highly recommend the first expansion as the challenge and bonus tiles add an extra wrinkle to the game and the border tiles are really neat. The single best thing about the game is the sheer number of tiles and interactions. Including the expansion, this is only the A tiles. I'll then add in the B tiles and then the C tiles. However, if you have trouble doing a lot of simple mathematics in a short space of time, this game will be a headache for you, as after each action there will be a lot of small adjustments that need to be made, and some people find that the opposite of fun. There's also limited ways to impact on your opponents, so the game can be considered a bit of multiplayer solitaire. This game shares a lot in common with Castles of Mad King Ludwig, so I recommend checking that game out to see which one works best for you. And if you want a city building game, or want something a bit quicker, I recommend Quadropolis for competitive play, or Between Two Cities 
cities for something a little more friendly. Hello and welcome to Tammany Hall in about three minutes. It is a game for three to five players. There is no solo mode. Playing time is between one and two hours. It is a moderately complex game. Many people in the 19th century came to the United States looking for a better life and a chance at the American dream. And many of them came through New York City and fell immediately into the politics of poverty and immigration that ran rampant in the city at that time. The players each represent a political faction in New York, working to rehouse new immigrants in the city, but also using that power to gain influence over the city to ultimately win the mayoralty of New York. The winner of this game is the player who has the most victory points after four elections. In each election, you gain one victory point for winning a ward, two victory points for winning the Tammany Hall ward, and the player with most wards becomes mayor and gains three victory points. Competitive. Each player is a different political faction. Area control. The board is made up of 14 different wards, each of which is its own political battleground. Bidding. Elections can be decided by the bidding of political influence. Player turn. Tammany Hall is one of those games that has simple rules but a lot of complexity of choice. There are four different types of immigrant in this game. The Irish, English, Germans and Italians. Immigrants are placed at Castle Garden and when they run out you redraw cubes equal to the number of players plus two. On your turn you have three main choices. The first option is to place one ward boss in a ward and collect one immigrant from Castle Garden, taking a favor matching that immigrant type. Your second option is to place two ward bosses on the board either in the same or in different regions. Regions. And once every four turns, you may use a slander token. This costs one political favor and removes an opponent's ward boss. You can do this in two adjacent wards with one action. Each player takes their turn one at a time, and after every four turns, there is a city-wide election. Each ward election is done individually, and in the order shown on the map by the arrows. The winner of a ward election is the player with the most votes. Each ward boss counts for one vote by themselves. You can also spend, in secret, any political favors matching the inhabitants of that ward. For example, this ward has Irish, English, and Italian immigrants in it, so you can spend any of those three influence tokens. The black player bids one Irish influence and has one ward boss for a combined score of two. The white player has one ward boss and bid one English and one Italian influence for a combined score of three. The white player wins. All ward bosses other than the winner are removed from the ward. In a tie, remove all ward bosses as an independent candidate wins this ward. Repeat this process for every ward and the mayor is the player who won the most wards. The mayor then assigns political officers to their opponents, which they hold until the next election. The game ends after four elections. Why would you like this game? It's one of the meanest, most cutthroat and brutal games around, which absolutely fit the setting and the theme. The politics of this period were notoriously corrupt and they were the focus of the film, The Gangs of New York. It's also a very simple game to learn, yet difficult to master, which is a great place for a game to be. You can teach the game in minutes, but an experienced player will normally win. The single best thing about the game is the fact the mayor has to give out amazing powers to their rivals. It's a clever come from behind mechanic that rewards the mayor for winning the election by giving the mayor's opponents the means to take them down. However, despite the game's strong theme and artwork, it is still, at its core, a very straight area control game, which relies on calculating odds and long-term planning. This may feel quite dry to some players, and its fundamental meanness might also be off-putting. There are quite a few area control games with similar mechanics but different themes. Many consider El Grande to be the king of this genre, but there's also Utopia, Ethnos, and others. And for a game of similar rules, but a much friendlier theme, I recommend Mission Red Planet. Hello and welcome to Terraforming Mars in about three minutes. It is a game for up to five players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around two hours. It is a complex game. Mars. It's a rock. A cold, barren rock. But with a lot of time, some expert science, and a few asteroids thrown into the planet for good measure, it might be something special. You're one of the corporations taking on the task of terraforming Mars. It will take many generations of carefully planned projects in order for you to make Mars green. In order to win this game, you must have contributed most to the creation of a terraformed Mars. This can be by terraforming the planet, having greenery tiles you control on the board, having cities you control next to greenery tiles, completing milestones, winning awards, and having victory point cards. The game ends at the end of the generation when all three global parameters, oceans, temperature, and oxygen, have been completed. Competitive. Players are rival corporations competing against each other. Card management. Knowing what cards to buy and when to play them is key to victory. Engine building. Your cards need to work together to create a successful terraforming engine. Tile placement. Cities, greenery, oceans and other tiles will end up shaping what the future of Mars looks like. Player turn. You will gain resources based on your current production scores. 
money is gained equal to your current terraforming score plus your money production. You will gain 4 cards each turn, but you must pay 3 money to keep each card. On your turn, you can take 1 or 2 actions, and then play moves to the next player. You keep taking 1 or 2 actions a turn until all players pass. There are 4 main types of action, play a card, use a card action, convert resources, or use a standard project. To play a card you must first meet its prerequisites. Many cards have none, but some require a certain number of card tags in play already, and some require a global parameter to be at a certain point. Cards cost the value shown in money, although steel can pay for building tags and titanium for space tags. Red cards are events, and once played they are turned over. Green cards are one-off actions, but stay in play so you can count their tags for other effects. Blue cards have ongoing effects, like discounts on other cards or actions that can be taken. You may use each of these actions once per generation. You may turn 8 heat into 1 temperature, moving the global parameter up and increasing your terraforming score. You may turn 8 plants into 1 greenery and place it on the board, increasing your terraforming score. Standard projects allow you to do things like place at ease and greenery without a card. Once all players have passed, the generation is over and you can start a new turn. Why would you like this game? No one path to victory exists and there are many different approaches that can be implemented. Each corporation has its own strengths and weaknesses and they play quite differently. It's also a very competitive game with low levels of antagonism. So while you are competing and the occasional card does hurt other players, it's more about how well you are doing. I highly recommend playing this with a card drafting optional rule after your first game. It adds an extra level of strategy and interaction. The single best thing about this game is the card deck. There are a lot of cards and no duplicates, so no game will have the exact same draw. However, the artwork is mixed and some of the cards use basic clip art. The player boards are also quite flimsy and people can knock markers over. I fixed mine with magnets. There's a lot going on in this game and some people can find that overwhelming or hard to engage with. For a shorter engine building game using cards, I recommend Race for the Galaxy. Hello and welcome to the ancient world in about three minutes. It's a game for two to four players. It has no official solo mode. Playing time is around 60 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. Terrible titans stride across this ancient land, destroying all they come across. Five nomadic tribes inhabit the area, under constant threat from the titans. But a small number of fledging towns are under construction. Can they woo the tribes into joining forces with them to defeat the titans? Will you raise the first great city of the ancient world, or will you simply be snack food for the titans? The winner of this game is the player with the most points at the end of six rounds. Points are scored by collecting sets of banners representing the five tribes. Some cards can represent represent multiple tribes. The more matching banners you have of one set, the more points, up to a maximum of six banners for each of the five tribes. Competitive. Only one player can build the first great city of the ancient world. Worker placement. Actions are taken by placing your workers on the board and claiming the associated benefits. Set collection. Collecting matching tribe banners is the key to victory. Player turn. The game lasts for six turns, and on each turn you will take a number of actions. Most of these involve placing a worker on the board and claiming the benefits. You can use Explore to look at the next five Empire cards and store one for later. You can build one of the Empire cards, paying the cost shown on the card. If your worker is the same number as another worker there, it costs one extra coin. You can also build a stored card. You can spend three coins or a scroll to gain a district card, which will increase the number of Empire cards you can have. You can recruit a new army or upgrade an existing one by paying the cost shown. And you can get new workers, get scrolls, improve your combat skill temporarily, or get money with other actions on the board. And if any of your empire cards have actions, you can use them as well. The other main action is challenging a titan. You must select your military units and pay them a coin each. Their combined strength must be enough to match the titans. If it is, you defeat them and claim them as a reward. Then the titan reacts and rolls damage dice based on its level. This can damage your city and force you to make repairs. Coins spent on units stay on them, and each time you use a unit, its cost goes up by one. Upgrading resets it to zero. Keep playing until all workers have been used. It is now the next turn. Why would you like this game? Let's get the obvious one out of the way first. Ryan Lockett has a wonderful art style, and this is another great looking game for him. But it's more than just the artwork. The Ancient World is a solid worker placement game with an interesting and compelling theme. A lot of games in that genre are about building castles and cities, but I don't know of any others that also have you fighting monsters of legend at the same time. It's at the simple end of the spectrum for worker placement, but the large variety of civil cards mean there's a lot to dig into, and it has good replayability. The single best thing about the game is the art, and I kinda hate saying that a little as it undercuts Ryan as a game 
game designer who makes games that would be good without his great art. However, there are a couple of systems in this that are so-so. The does your worker match the number of another worker, if so pay a coin mechanic feels a little odd, like he wanted more tactical worker placement but didn't want to hurt players too much, and it just ends up feeling somewhat in between. There's also no particularly standout amazing mechanics in the game. It's good, but it's not great. The Ancient World also suffers from being compared to Above and Below, which came out a year later. Above and Below added storytelling elements to the worker placement genre, and many consider it Ryan Lockett's best game. And if you want to battle monsters in the Ancient World, or want something bigger and flashier, check out Lords of Hellas. Hello and welcome to The Captain is Dead in about three minutes. It is a game for up to seven players. There is a solo mode. Playing time is around 60 to 90 minutes. It's a relatively simple game. Aliens have attacked the ship and the captain is dead. You are the members of the senior staff still left standing after the initial volley of attacks. The jump drive has been disabled and the alien ships keep coming. You will need to repair the jump core, hold the ship together and prevent the aliens from overrunning you if you want to escape to fight another day. You win this game by fully repairing the jump drive. You must make a number of repairs based on the difficulty you have chosen at the start of the game, and win when you reach the engage space. You lose if the ship takes a hit when the shields are down, or if there are too many aliens on board the ship. Cooperative, you're all one crew in this terrible mess together. Card management, many of the actions you take require the use of cards. Automata, your opponent in this game is the deck of alert cards. Player turn. At the start of the game, everyone selects a roll and the ship is in pristine condition. You then turn over an alert card and damage the ship. Do this five times back to back without the players taking an action. The ship is now a mess and you can begin to play. Players act in rank order and each player does their individual turn fully before passing to the next person. On your turn, you will normally have four actions. You can use one action to move two spaces or if the teleporter is working, you can move anywhere on the ship. You can spend an action to defeat an alien in your space and you can use the various locations around the ship. For example, repairing the jump core is a location action. It requires two actions to use and that you discard five engineering cards. However, as this character is the chief engineer, they have a discount of two engineering cards to take this action. It also only costs them one time. A location can only be used if it is undamaged, otherwise it must be repaired first. And when some systems are damaged, there are serious consequences. For example, when the computer is working, you can use that location to draw a card. When it is offline, the draw pile is discarded until it is repaired. Knowing what locations to use and playing to your character's skills are really important in this game. Finally, once you have finished your action, you draw another alert and damage the ship. On your turn, if you have three command cards, you can negate that alert by discarding them. Play then moves to the next ranked player until you are defeated or the jump drive is repaired. Why would you like this game? The Captain is Dead captures the final dramatic moments of a sci-fi show, and it's a huge homage to Star Trek and sci-fi in general. It's also a reasonably easy to learn co-op game that can have its difficulty adjusted quite easily. The game plunges you straight into the action and the sense of tension is there from the outset. A lot of co-ops have a power up or a relaxing start, this game does not. There are a bunch of characters to play within each of the seven rank levels and the number of playable combinations is really high. The character standees are really nice and the whole game comes in a rather small box so it's nice and portable. The single best thing about this game is the Grow the Beard Battle Plan card because I laugh every time it comes up and it's such a fond tribute to Star Trek just like the rest of this game. However, the key to winning this game is always the same. Get those engineering cards and get the jump drive repaired. A well-tuned group will figure this out and cycle those engineering cards with great rapidity. Also, it's not a great game to play with someone who tells everyone else what to do on their turn. I don't recommend playing it with someone like that. If you want an even harder, more in your face co-op game, I recommend Ghost Stories. And if you want to take the Star Trek homage to the next level and have your friends playing together as an incompetent bridge crew, I recommend Space Cadets. Hello and welcome to The Grizzled in about three minutes. This video is dedicated to all the victims of World War One and to Tignus, the game's artist who was murdered by terrorists. It is a game for two to five players. There is no solo mode, although there is one in the expansion. It has a playing time of around 30 to 40 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. The Guns of August signal the beginning of what would become one of the darkest chapters in human history, the First World War. You play a group of young Frenchmen, drafted into this war, and sent to the front. Only cooperation and camaraderie will allow you to all make it through the war in one piece. You win this game if the trials deck runs out and peace is declared. You lose this game if one of your soldiers has four or more hard knocks cards at the end of the turn. You can also lose if the monument deck runs out. Cooperative. Only together can this group of friends survive the war. 
Card management. You must manage the cards you are dealt in the best way possible. Player turn. On your turn, you will receive a number of cards as chosen by the mission leader. The first turn is always three. These cards can be hard knocks with a lightning bolt at the top or threat cards. There are six types of threat. Night, rain, and snow are the three terrain types, and shell, mask, and whistle are the three item types. Some cards have more than two threats on them. On your turn, you can play a threat card into No Man's Land. If there are ever three matching threats of any type in No Man's Land, your mission has failed, and that's bad news. You can also use your good luck charm, Gustav's is snow, so he can remove one snow card from No Man's Land, flipping his card over. Threat cards with this symbol are trap cards, and they require an extra card be played from the deck, which can lead to a cascade. You can play a hard knocks card, which represents trauma, and it can be assigned to any player. You can use your speech token and nominate one threat type. All players can then discard one card with a matching threat icon. Finally, you can choose to withdraw and claim a support token. The round ends when all players have withdrawn or the mission has failed. Support tokens are used to help other players. In this case, Gustav has three hard knocks and everyone has chosen to support Gustav, which allows him to flip over to regain his luck charm or to remove two hard knocks. If you did not fail the mission, add three cards to the trials deck from the monument deck. If you did fail, add those three cards and all cards in no man's land. The next player is now the mission leader and gains a speech token. Why would you like this game? War isn't pretty, and the bulk of games about war treat the subject with a degree of emotional separation. Troops are pieces on the board to be maneuvered in a way to achieve a mission outcome. The Grizzled is not that. It's a game about camaraderie, of friends keeping each other going while they push through exhaustion and terror. And the gameplay is really simple and easy to learn, yet it pulls you into the moment. The artwork of Tignus is unique and iconic, and really gives the game its unique character. And this picture on the back of the rule book of the soldiers before the war really hits home for me. The best thing about this game is that the war is not depicted as something that can be won, only something that can be survived. However, this game is pretty unforgiving and you can sometimes feel that you've lost well before the outcome is finally assured. The game has a failure spiral that can be hard to pull out of. And for some people, this game will be a bit raw in its subject matter. If you want something light and silly, pick another game. For another game that deals with the realities of war, check out This War of Mine. And if you want to try a strategic game about World War I, check out Paths of Glory. The Grizzled. No winners, just survivors. This video was requested by Patreon backer Andrew Miller. If you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out our Patreon. Hello and welcome to the Palace of Mad King Ludwig in about three minutes. It is a game for two to four players. There is no official solo mode. Playing time is around 60 to 90 minutes. It's a moderately complex game. It's the 1880s, and the Bavarian king, Ludwig II, has decided he wants a mighty palace to go along with the wacky castles his master builders have been constructing for him. He assembles a super team of master builders and sets them to work on his grandest and most ostentatious edifice yet. The winner of this game is the player who scores the most points. Scoring is done at the end of the game, and you score points for placing rooms, completing goals, and collecting swans. The game ends when you run out of tiles, or when the moat is finished. Competitive. Each player is trying to gain the most points and win. Tile laying. Each room in the castle is a different tile, and most turns you will be placing a new room. Point salad. There are many, many ways to score points in this game. Player turn. When it is your turn, you will have a few options to choose from, but the most common action you will take is to claim a room tile and place it. Rooms in the two rightmost spaces are free to claim, but the others require you to spend a swan or two. You can place a room adjacent to any other room as long as there is at least a single valid connection. If the connections have matching swan symbols on them, you claim a swan of that color. Gray swans are wild cards and match any other color. You then place your control symbol on that room with the white side face up. Mark on your blueprint board that you have built a room of that type. You can also place a hallway or stairs tile, discarding a room from the display to pay for it. A room is completed whenever all its entry points are connected to another valid entry point. When a room of yours is completed, you flip your control token over to the other side and claim the room completion bonus as shown on the tile. You can claim this even if it was not your turn when it was completed. You can also take a tile and place it on your board to gain the power shown. For example, this one allows you to gain three swans at the end of the game. One of the room's completion bonuses is to gain personal favor tokens. Those must be stored on your blueprint board in a place where you have not placed a tile. As more tiles are placed, the tile piles will be exposed, and this shows how many moats must be placed at the end of your action. Moats must be placed connected to other waterways in most circumstances, and once the moats connect and there is no way to place a new room, the game is over. Why would you like this game? 
First of all, this is not just a rehash of Castles of Mad King Ludwig. It is its own game and has its own identity. Where it shines is in its competitiveness. You'll be watching your opponents closely and trying to limit their options while maximizing your own. This game also evolves very organically and the tile placement and moats make for a unique palace every time. If you want a competitive tile laying game with a pretty high level of complexity in that niche, this could be a game for you. The single best thing about the game is the end game mechanic. As the mode is built, it limits options and makes decisions tougher and tougher. However, this is a very busy game with a lot of mechanics and interactions. The amount of information on the blueprint board alone is enough to take in. Add to that the information in the actual play area, the public favors, private favors, and tracking swans, and you can have a game that could be very overwhelming to some people. It can also get very feisty as a lot of strategies involve blocking out other players. People who don't like confrontation might not enjoy it for that reason. If you're interested in this game, I also highly recommend checking out the castles of Mad King Ludwig. It's a slightly simpler game with less direct confrontation and explores a very similar theme. And if you want a tile land game but want something a little less complex, I recommend St. Petersburg. Hello and welcome to This War of Mine in about 3 minutes. The game is 1-6 to six players, although I would not recommend it with more than 3. It has a solo mode. It's a long game, taking over 3 hours. It is a moderately complex game. In war, not everyone is a soldier. A simple idea, but not one commonly explored in games. The players control a small group of survivors hiding out in a ruined building, scavenging food and water to survive, while ducking snipers and living in fear that someone will turn up to harm them. The setting is a modern European city, and it is heavily inspired by the siege of Sarajevo. Cooperative. The players collectively control the group of survivors. No one has a specific character they control. Narrative driven. The game comes with a large book of scripts that you will reference during the game. Dice. Many encounters will be decided by dice rolls in this game. This game is less about winning than it is about surviving the siege. You must not only make it through until the ceasefire is declared, you must maintain your morale and fitness. Raiders, illness, the cold and starvation will be your true enemies here and you must do your best to prepare for the long siege in order to survive. Player turn. The game comes with a journal, which has the game's play order in it. The player holding the journal does all the actions stated until they come to a next player icon. They then hand the book to the next player, who repeats this process. Draw an event, and follow the instructions shown. Take day actions. A character may only act as many times as shown on their status icons. For example, this character can act three times, and this one can act once. Day actions include removing rubble, searching heaps and furniture, checking outside for visitors, and building new fittings for the house. At dusk, you need to assign water to drink and food to eat, modifying your survivor statuses accordingly. Then you will choose who will scavenge, who will guard, and who will sleep. Scavenging is next. The chosen characters pick a location to explore. They then create a deck of exploration cards based on the location's position and turn them over one at a time to resolve them. Some encounters will increase the noise level, which may cause you to run into residents who may or may not be hostile. Others will have findings, which are items you can keep. Once you have finished exploring, you can return home, keeping as much as you can carry. Before your explorers return home, night raids occur. Turn over a night raid card and resolve it. This may result in wounds to the defending character or items being stolen. Then, assign meds and bandages to characters if available, draw a fake card and resolve its effects, and then finally draw two narrative actions choosing one. It is now the next day. Why would you like this game? This War of Mine is unique. It deals with a very serious and very dark subject matter in a very honest and true way. The game does not glorify war in any way. It is sad, it is frustrating, and it is a bit depressing, but in a thoughtful and considered way. And underneath all that, it's still a good game, with solid planning required and a lot to explore and discover. The single best thing about the game are the reality impact cards. When you draw one, you follow the instructions and go the relevant story entry. These range from bittersweet encounters through to matter-of-fact depiction of war crimes and atrocities. However, the game is not fair. If you are a person who needs to win often, and does not enjoy randomness in games, it could be very frustrating. You could be well set up and doing fine, and then suddenly have one of your characters murdered for no real reason. War is unfair, and so is this game. It's also very somber and dark, and those people looking for light-hearted escapism in their gaming might want to avoid this. For other story-focused games with much brighter themes, I recommend Tales of the Arabian Nights and Near and Far. For another survival game with story elements, but with more player interaction and antagonism, I recommend Dead of Winter. Hello and welcome to Twilight Imperium 4 in about 3 minutes. It is a game for 3-6 to six players. 
It has no solo mode. It's a really long game. It's a very complex mm. game. Many years ago, a great empire ruled this part of the galaxy from Mechatol Rex. Like many great empires, it grew weak and collapsed, plunging the area it once controlled into a new dark age. You are one of the new rising powers, looking to claim the mantle of Mechatol Rex and become the new ruler of the galaxy. The winner of this game is the empire to reach the required victory point total. The game ends immediately when someone does that. You can claim one public objective per turn for victory points. Secret objectives can also be claimed. And if you have the Imperial Strategy card, you can claim an additional public objective or a victory point if you control Mechatol Rex. Competitive. Players each represent one of many star-faring empires. Role selection. The strategy cards you pick have a huge impact on how you play. Victory points. This game is about scoring victory points, not having the biggest empire. There's an awful lot happening in this game, so I'm going to focus on the key points quickly. Plants have two main values, production and influence. Production is used to pay for most things in the game, and influence is used for voting and buying new command counters. Command counters determine what actions you can do. Tactics are spent to activate systems, allowing you to move to them and to build in them if you already have a spaceport there. If you activate another player's system, combat occurs. If you already have an activation token in a system, you cannot move units to there or from there. Fleet tokens restrict the number of ships you can have in any one hex. Strategy tokens allow you to use abilities on other people's strategy cards. The strategy cards are the key to this game, so let's quickly blast through them. Leadership gives the holder command tokens and allows everyone to buy more with influence. Diplomacy protects one system from attack this turn, but allows other players to refresh some planets. Politics lets you choose next turn's first player, the speaker, gain action cards, and set the political agenda. Other players can get action cards. Construction allows the building of point defense systems and space docks. Trade gives you trade goods which can be spent as either production or influence, and helps you control whether other people can trade easily. Warfare allows you to pick up a command token, enabling you to move from an area that had already been activated. It allows other people to build in their home systems. Technology allows research of new technologies for all players. Imperial allows easier scoring of victory points. As you can see, there's a lot going on in this game. Why would you like this game? It's epic. That's pretty much its major selling point. Very few games feel as grand and majestic as Twilight Imperium, and it creates some very memorable experiences. It also has a lot of scope in regards to how different the factions play, how you develop your technology, and how you go about scoring victory points. The single best thing about the game is that they included all 17 of the races from Twilight Imperium 3 and its expansions. However, the game can go on for a long, long time, and with some groups that can be a real issue. This is not an evening game. It can be a full day affair for some groups. It can also bog down with what people call turtling, where players sit in defensive positions and are not proactive in winning the game, allowing those players who are proactive to win. Nothing is quite like Twilight Imperium, but Eclipse and Exodus Proxima Centauri offer similar experiences. And if you like the ideas of Twilight Imperium, but the playtime is off-putting, I recommend Empires of the Void 2. Hello and welcome to Utopia in about three minutes. It is a game for two to five players. There is no official solo mode. Playing time is around 60 minutes. It's a relatively simple game. Well, the box says this game is about the wise king of Utopia summoning great minds and thinkers from human history and getting them to work together to create a great Utopian state. But the truth is something far different. None of these visitors ever leave. This Utopia and everything in it is built by consuming those visitors. The Utopia is nothing more than a sinister sacrifice factory where the idle powers that be steal people from history, work them into the ground to construct monuments and debate about which culture is so hot right now like they are fashion items. The winner of this game is the player who scores the most victory points. These are gained by building wonders, sacrificing people, and having monuments that are currently in fashion with the elite of the Utopia. The game ends the turn a player passes 50 points. Competitive. Only one player can win this game. Area control. Each player is trying to control as much of the Kingdom of Utopia as possible. Set collection. Groups of cards and groups of tokens are the key to victory. Player turn. Player orders determined by victory points, with the leader going first and so on. The first thing you will do is grab three visitors per player and assign them to the island matching their background. Each visitor represents one of the five cultures in this game. Starting with the first player, you will take one of these tokens and replace it with your own token of the same type. You then place it in any spot on the matching island. Repeat this until all visitors have been claimed. 
Then, each player draws five cards. The leader must discard two cards, and all other players, except the person in last place, must discard one. The first player does all their card actions, and so on, until the last player. If you ever have one of each token on an island, you can build that island's wonder, and claim six VPs. You also gain VPs equal to the value shown in the region each time anyone builds a monument there. If you have three of the same tokens in a region, you can build a monument. You can use one card to move up to two tokens via ships or via land. You can use one card to spawn a matching token at a monument, and one card to consume a token at its matching monument for victory points. You can use three identical cards to spawn a new token of that type. You can use one card to boost one culture's monument in the scoring track, or two cards to send one culture from the top of the track to the very bottom. Points are scored each round by how popular each culture is, so changing this track has a huge swing on points. When the last player has finished their turn, check to see if anyone has 50 points, otherwise it is a new turn. Why would you like this game? Utopia is a quick and fast paced game that has a fair bit of trickery and cleverness in it. It's similar to a lot of area control games, but has just enough going for it to make it stand out a little. Part of that is the monuments and wonders. It has a grander feel than most area control games. It's also much more of a race than other area control games, because once you have locked down an area, you cannot lose control of it. And this game has some of the strongest catch up mechanics I've seen. The single best thing about the game is playing a game about a utopia as though it is something more sinister, with sacrifices and the elite's fickle fashions being the drivers behind the game. However, the color palette, iconography, and visuals of this game are a bit of a mess and makes it far harder to scan information than it really should be. It's also far bigger and overproduced than it really needed to be. It's a simple yet clever area control game presented like it's something far grander than it really is. Many people consider El Grande to be the best area control game ever made, so I recommend checking that out. I also think Tammany Hall does most of what Utopia sets out to do, but in a far more consistent way. Hello and welcome to Witches of the Revolution in about three minutes. It is a game for one to four players. The game has a solo mode. Playtime is under an hour. It's a reasonably simple game. We all know the story of the American Revolution, Paul Revere riding out to warn of the coming of the English, Washington crossing the Delaware, and evil redcoats beaten back by plucky Minutemen. What's left out of the history books is the truth. All the critical events of the War of Independence were supported by secret cabals of American witches. This is their story. In order to win and safeguard the revolution, the witches must complete all four objectives before the event deck runs out or the tyranny level gets too high. Cooperative. Each player represents a different cabal of witches supporting the revolution. Deck building. Players start with a standard deck representing their cabal and improve it through play. Player turn. Each player takes a full turn before passing to the next player. First, draw a recruit card and add it to the recruit spaces, moving all recruits to the right. If a recruit ends up in the discard space, remove it from the board. Then draw an event card, sliding all event cards to the right. If it has a when played effect, resolve that now. If an event with a liberty bell moves into a space with a liberty bell, increase tyranny by one. If an event with a gun moves into a gun space, remove a recruit from the available pool. Now you can act and recruit. In order to recruit from the available pool, you remove cards from your hand equal to the pentacle cost of the card recruited. This card costs three pentacles, so you must remove cards equal to its cost to recruit. Some spaces provide discounts for recruitment. The recruit is placed on top of your deck for use next turn. Acting allows you to deal with one of the events on the event track. In order to remove the event, you must pay one of the costs shown by discarding cards with the appropriate symbols. In this case, four green symbols. You can then remove one trophy marker from an objective of either color shown on the event card. It need not be the color you played. Unaligned events and catastrophes can use any combination of card colors. You may then discard any cards and draw up to a full hand of five cards. If drawing causes you to reshuffle, advance the moon track one step. The higher the moon track, the harder actions are to take. It is now the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? It's quick fun and fast paced. It takes the traditional deck building formula and adds a few twists. The best of these is having to pay cards to get new cards and adding a penalty each time you reshuffle your deck. This means you can't just blast through your deck repeatedly to draw the good cards and dump the rest. The event deck can be customized to increase or decrease the game's difficulty. It's pretty easy to learn and teach and can be a good gateway game for new players. The single best thing about the game is the theme. 
exemplified by the objective cards, whether it's curing Paul Revere's lycanthropy or imbuing the Liberty Bell with power, the game playfully riffs on tropes from the War of Independence. However, if you are a history Puritan and find the American Revolution a very serious topic, this might annoy you. Ditto if the idea that the US owes its statehood to cabals of witches offends you. While we enjoy the game, some players might find it slightly disconnected from the deck-building, puzzle-based mechanics. For a serious game looking at American history, I recommend Freedom the Underground Railroad. And for another cooperative game about revolutions, this time in modern America, I recommend Block by Block the Insurrection Game. Hello and welcome to Zombicide in about three minutes. This video will focus on the Zombicide core set and there will be a second video breaking down the differences between the different Zombicide sets and expansions. It is a game for one to six players. It has a solo mode. The game takes anywhere up to three hours depending on your scenario. It is a moderately complex game. The dead walk the earth. Well, more like amble and limp around the earth. They are slow and stupid, and that's been working in your favor. But they are also endless in number and hunger, and that's a bit more of a problem. You and your crew are scavenging equipment and working quickly to complete objectives before the horde gets out of control. Time to crank up the chainsaw and start a zombicide. Before you set up the game, you will need to pick a scenario from the book, and they have different objectives. The players win the game if they complete those objectives without all getting eaten by zombies. Cooperative. The players work together and control a group of survivors. Dice. Zombicide frequently has you rolling a lot of dice for actions. Character development. Your survivors improve as the game goes on, but the game adjusts to that as well. Player turn. Play starts with the first player, who activates all their survivors, passing to the next player when they are done. Each survivor has three actions available to them each round. The most common ones are move, search, melee combat, range combat, and opening doors. Searching may only be done once per character per turn, and it must take place in either a car or an enclosed room. You turn over the top card of the search deck and either take it or discard it. You can find weapons, supplies, parts for a molotov, or even zombies this way. To open a door, you need the right piece of equipment. Some unlock doors quietly, and others loudly. Draw one zombie card for each room in the building you've unlocked, place zombies in those areas, and then show that the door is now unlocked. You can fight zombies in your space of a ranged weapon, if it has range 0 as an option. But more commonly, you will fight with a melee weapon. Roll dice as shown on the card, and remove zombies for each hit you make. Ranged combat works much the same way, except at range. Choose an area within the weapon's range and roll to hit, removing zombies for each hit you make. Range is also limited to line of sight, and you can only see into the next area within a building. For example, this area would be out of line of sight for the shooter. Movement allows you to move one area per move action. You can move out of areas with zombies, but it is very difficult. Some actions also cause noise, which impact on how the zombies move. Once all players have acted, Move the zombies towards a character they can see, or the loudest noise source if they cannot see a character. Draw zombie cards, and place zombies at each entry point. It is now the next turn. Why would you like this game? While some zombie games focus on tensional survival, Zombicide focuses on action. It's about piling up kills and rolling buckets of dice, and it makes it a much lighter and sillier experience. It can still be a brutally tough game and appeal to those people who like a cooperative or solo challenge. The miniatures are also top quality, as one has come to expect from Cool Mini or not. The single best thing about the game is the leveling up and rising difficulty mechanic in the game. As your characters increase in experience, the enemies get more numerous, meaning the end game is wall-to-wall -wall zombies. However, while skill can help you a lot in this game, some bad rolls or unlucky draws from the zombie deck can ruin it very quickly. There is nothing quite so rough as having an unkillable abomination turn up at the end of round one. There are also some issues around firing into melee and action order that annoy some players. If the gameplay sounds fun, but you hate the post-apocalypse, I recommend its sibling game, Zombicide Black Plague. For a similar looking game, but with less over-the-top action and more dramatic tension, I recommend The Walking Dead No Sanctuary.